Part 3. Keep Your Friends Close Chapter 32 The Arbiter Thankwell limped along as fast as he could, but his right leg was agony drowning in fire. Every step was a lance of pain that seemed to travel up through his spine. He clenched his teeth so hard he felt they might shatter, because it was better than crying out in pain every time his foot hit the floor. He looked down at the wound. The bandage was red with blood. Not a good sign. He'd need to change it soon. Need to clean the wound again. But he'd dare not stop while they were still so close to Chade. Not for the first time, he glanced at Jezid. She looked tired, but that was no surprise. At best, she'd managed a couple of hours of sleep. More than thankful, yet not enough after the night they'd had. She walked along beside him in silence. But she was alert. Tense. Her hand never straying far from the sword hilt. Jezit claimed to be a blade master, and from her skill with a sword, he could well believe it. She toyed with him when they sparred, and if it had been a real fight, would have killed him in moments. But blade masters were more like a myth these days. Most everyone seemed to agree they had died out centuries ago. He knew the history of the Blade Masters as well as anyone, and better than most. The libraries of the Inquisition were extensive, after all. The Order was created close to a thousand years ago by a man of unequaled skill, Elekin Flameborn. He had traveled the five great empires of man and had recruited other warriors of similar skill. Two hundred they had been when Elekin decided it was enough. They had created their own weapon styles, their own training methods, and their own laws of the Order. That was the first and last time all the Blade Masters had met. When they were finished, Elekin sent them all over the world. That was where the history of the Order started to get patchy. Some Blade Masters disappeared into obscurity, others rose to greatness. Old Blade Masters vanished and new Blade Masters appeared out of the ashes. One thing was certain, though. Over the thousand years since its creation, the Order was dwindling, not growing. Thankwell had believed it to be extinct, but now here he was, walking beside one. She didn't seem to be much of a legend. He glanced at Jezid again. She was thin. Not surprising after weeks in jail, but she had a wiry strength. Thankwell could testify to that. She was both graceful and fluid, her movements controlled and precise, and she was not displeasing to the eyes. Something you want, Arbiter? Jezit asked without looking at him. Thankwell grimaced as he limped along. The Inquisition caught a blade master once. Why? You're known for your unparalleled skill with swords. With any bladed weapon. He smiled at her. She didn't so much as glance in his direction. The Inquisition felt it needed to know whether such skill was natural or gained through heretical means. They decided the best way was to capture Blademaster and interrogate them. Three arbiters were killed, bringing the man in. It turned out he was strangely resilient to the... Thankwell had no wish to mention the compulsion. To the interrogation. No one can lie to an arbiter, Jezit said in a mocking tone. That is what people say, isn't it? They do. And for the most part, it's true. And, well... The man didn't lie. He didn't say anything, even after being interrogated. Tortured? They had tortured the man, it was true, but it was not something the Inquisition liked to admit to. Not many could hide the truth in the face of the compulsion, so the Inquisition had no need for torture, usually. You never thought to just ask him, did you? Jezit said with a chilling look. Instead of capturing him and torturing him, 
you never thought to just approach a blade master and ask, Are you a heretic? No. No, I suppose they didn't. And what did you decide after torturing the poor man? The results were... The Inquisition... They weren't sure. Jezit laughed, shook her head, and continued walking. So, ask me. You have a blade master right here beside you. No. Why not? Thankwell ground his teeth. This was not a topic he wanted to stray onto. Well, why not? He sighed. I don't like asking questions. Jezit looked at him then, a mocking smile on her lips, and she burst into laughter. An arbiter who doesn't like to ask questions. She grinned at him, still laughing. Thankwell found himself smiling back. You don't understand. The compulsion is... He paused, trying to find the right word. What's the compulsion? Thankwell limped along in silence for a while. Jezet walked beside him. She didn't ask again. It's how we force people to tell the truth, Thankwell said. It's magic, and it's the first thing an arbiter learns to do. It subverts a person's will, makes them unable to think about anything but the answer to the question, and compels them to speak. So, why don't you like to ask questions? Again, Thankwell fell silent, trying to think of the right words. The compulsion is addictive. We don't know why. Something to do with dominating a person's free will, I suspect. There are arbiters who use it all the time. It becomes a need for them. To ask questions. To feel the compulsion acting upon its target. It's... Were you one of them? Thankwell wasn't sure how to respond to that. Actually he was. The simple answer was yes, but it was something he didn't like to admit to himself, let alone someone else. After a long time, Jezet spoke again. Can't you just not use it? Ask questions normally without using it? Thankwell shook his head. I've tried. Believe me. The compulsion is the first thing an arbiter learns, and we're made to use it, until we can't not. It is a constant nagging need, but the only way to not use the compulsion is to not ask questions. So, I don't like asking questions. Sorry, Jezit said in a somber voice. I should look at your leg. It's fine, just a scratch. Thankful grimaced as he spoke, and kept limping all the same. It's slowing us down. You're moving no faster than a crawl. Thankwell looked back toward Chade. Jessit wasn't wrong. They had started out at a brisk pace, but the pain lancing through him with every step was slowing him down. They were staying away from the roads, but even so, if they didn't get well away from the free city soon, it was possible the guards would find them. I cleaned and bandaged it he protested. But you didn't close it. I can tell by the blood. She wasn't wrong about the blood. Closing a wound and bandaging it are two different things. Go and sit on that rock and drop your trousers. Thankwell did as he was told. He dropped his pack, then his trousers, and then sat with his legs stretched out on the smooth boulder. There were no rocky areas, no mountains for leagues around, and Thankwell had to wonder where this boulder had come from. It sat alone on the plains, a solitary, smooth rock in a sea of grass. Jezet made a disapproving noise and spat on the ground as she looked at the wound. The bandage Thankwell applied had been wrapped around his clothing and had soaked up most of the blood, yet the wound still looked red and angry. There are some ointments and the like in my pack, Thankwell said. Jezet snorted. I'll use my own. She sniffed at the wound. It was a thin cut, but deep and a good two inches long. The knife had hit him high up in the thigh, 
just a few more inches to the left, and it could have been much worse. The wound was very close to his cock, and now so was Jezid. She stared at the cut, and Thankwell forced himself to think of disturbing images, lest he get aroused by her closeness. The last thing he needed to do was poke Jezid in the face. All thoughts disappeared the moment she poked the wound. White, hot pain shot through his leg, and it was all Thankwell could do not to scream. Doesn't smell infected, Jezit said as she started rummaging around in her pack. Wonderful, Thankwell replied, his voice strained. This is going to hurt, I think. Yes. Badly? Very badly. Let me know when you're about to start. I have a curse that will work wonders on subduing the senses. She looked at him for a moment. You can do that? Curse yourself to lessen pain? As long as I don't forget the words. Huh. I'm going to clean it again, then sew it shut. That'll hurt like all the hells. Then I'll bandage it again, properly this time. Thankwell clenched his jaw and nodded. Jezit had her own ointments, some fire wine to wash the wound, a thin needle and some horsehair thread for the stitches, and some white linen for the bandaging. She laid them all out ready and then nodded at him. As he started up the chant, he felt the world recede around him. The light grew dimmer, the world seeming to be lit no more than on a clear night, despite the sun being high and bright. Sounds grew quieter and seemed farther away. Even the sound of his own heavy breathing and heart beating in his ears seemed distant, muffled. His skin felt numbed. Where before he had been able to feel Jezit's hand on his leg, warm and calloused, now he only felt a slight tingling. Brace yourself, she said, just before pouring fire wine into the wound. The burning sensation was there a deep pain that he could feel in the core of his leg, as if the very bone was on fire. But it was numbed by the curse. Still, it hurt, and Thankwell could feel sweat beating on his forehead, could feel his hands, his arms, his neck, his head, and his entire body shaking. Jezit was looking at him with something close to sympathy. She had already dried the skin around the wound, and the needle and horsehair thread had appeared in her hand. This is going to be the bad bit, she said with a sorry smile. Thankwell kept whispering his curse, determined to weather the pain. All that determination fled the moment the needle pricked his skin. He gasped in pain, and the curse was broken. The light of the sun, the noise of the wilds, the pain in his leg, it all flooded back in and he screamed. He had no doubt he would have passed out had he not still had the sleepless charm on his arm. Instead, he found himself lying flat on the boulder, panting through the pain and choking back a sob. I need to keep going, Thankwell. He took a couple of moments to collect himself, pushed back into a sitting position, recalled the words of the curse, and started chanting again. Once his senses had dulled, he gave a labored nod to Jezit, and again the needle pierced his skin. Five stitches she made, and each was more painful than the last. Twice more, Thankwell forgot the words to the curse and screamed in pain. By the time she was done, he found himself soaked with sweat and wanting nothing more than a strong drink and a bed. Jezit rubbed some ointment onto the angry skin and then bandaged the leg before setting herself down on the boulder next to Thankwell. She looked almost as shaken as he did. I've known men to faint from being stitched up, she said from beside him. She smelled of sweat and blood and a whiff of sewer. Thankwell found he didn't mind. Ha <laughs> ha, it wasn't that bad, he lied. She smiled. You should try having to stitch yourself up one time. That's hard. My master used to say, When you're a blade master, I won't be around to patch you up. You have to learn to do it yourself. So I did. 
every time. Jezet fell silent, and Thankwell joined her. Truth was, his head was still feeling slow and fuzzy, and he couldn't think of any words to say. Jezet pushed herself off the boulder. There's a few hours of sun left, but maybe we should find some shade and make camp for the night. You need to rest. Thankwell shook his head and pushed himself up. No time for resting. We still need to move. Get farther from Chade before they send people looking. You'll be all right? On that leg? Thankwell grinned. It's nothing, really. See? He took a couple of steps and grimaced, but managed to hide the majority of his pain. Jezet didn't look convinced, yet she nodded all the same. All right. You should probably put your trousers back on first, though. Chapter 33 The Blackthorn Betram was on watch when he heard the voices. Truth was, he was gnawing at a strip of dried salt beef that tasted a lot like a foot and was busy not paying attention to anyone that might have been trying to sneak up on them. An entire night and the following day, he'd been on the receiving end of dark looks, cruel insults, and even one or two threats. So right now, he couldn't say he was too bothered about looking out for the other's benefit. It wasn't like the Blackthorn was the only one who ever made a mistake. They all had from time to time, so it struck him as a little more than unfair that he was getting so much heat from it. All those thoughts fled when he heard the voices, though. He could bitch and moan about his lot as well as the rest of them, but when there was a threat about, they all had to stick together, assuming the threat wasn't one of them. The voices were a ways off for now, but could well be coming closer. Sound traveled a little too well over the plains at night. The laughing dogs were proof enough of that. Betram couldn't count the amount of times he'd been kept awake at night by the damn laughing, unable to decide whether it was a long way off or right over his bloody shoulder. Betram gave the boss a quick nudge with his foot. The big southerner slept light and woke easy. It took him a few seconds to figure out why Betram had woken him, and then he nodded. At least, Betram thought he did. The boss was kind of difficult to see in the dark. Henry was awake the moment the boss moved. Crazy bitch. Always had murder in her eyes when she woke. Frightened Betram to tell the truth. Not that he ever would. He crawled on hands and knees away from the small camp, toward the voices. The grass was long this time of year, came up to the knees on a standing man, and did a good job at hiding you when you got down low. Problem was, it hadn't rained for a while and the grass was dry, made it brittle and noisy, and gave it sharp edges. Seemed a strange thing to get cut by grass, but Betram supposed that was why they were called blades of grass. Every time Betram put his hand down onto the ground was a near heart-stopping moment for him. Snakes were not uncommon out in the plains and if one managed to bite you. Betram had seen a man bit by a snake once. They had killed the thing quick enough, and even that was too late. Jolly Garth, they used to call him, on account of him always laughing and joking. Not like Swift, Garth's laughing was always good-natured, never had a bad word to say about anyone. He didn't laugh after the snake bit him. Within an hour... His arm turned a withered brown color and hung off his body like a piece of dead wood. He screamed, too. Screamed himself raw in the throat, until he was coughing more than screaming. Then the brown rot started to spread to his body. It was then he pleaded for mercy. So, it was then they gave it to him. Harvey the bear took his head off with one good swing from his axe. Strange thing was, after Jolly Garth was dead, his blood didn't run. Just sort of seeped out a bit. It was thick and lumpy, instead of runny. Blood did that in a body after a while, became almost like jelly. But with Garth, it happened while he was still alive. 
Last thing Betram wanted was to get bit by a snake, or a spider, or one of those land lizards that lived on the rocks. Last thing Betram wanted was to get bit by anything. The voices were louder now, and Betram could just about make out the shapes in the distance. Seemed to be the chatter of two folk walking along, paying no mind to who might be listening or watching. The boss crawled up beside Betram on his right, and he felt Henry brush up against him on the left. One of the two was limping a little. Injured was good. Injured folk were easier to take. What do they mean? Or what do they do? Betram heard a woman's voice ask. The charms. The voice of the second was a man. Aye, the ones on your sword. What do they mean? The woman asked again. Betram couldn't tell which one of them was the injured one from this distance, still just shapes in the darkness. The boss waved his hand in front of Betram's face a few times and made a walking motion with his fingers. Betram got the idea. The two were going to pass them by if they kept on their current path. Probably meant they'd just leave them be. There are three. The first one is to keep it sharp as the day it was forged even if some fool forgets to use a whetstone, the male voice said. Do you even own a whetstone? The female voice sounded familiar. Betram forced himself to stifle a groan. The second is so the sword will never break, never chip, never bend. The third is a charm of purification, to help kill heretics who may survive normally fatal wounds. Betram knew the boss was staring at him. Knew Henry on the other side was stopping herself from laughing. He thought for sure the guards would have done for the Arbiter. After all, the bastard had killed two of their own. Yet now, here he was, tracking down the Blackthorn. He should have stayed back in the mansion. Should have made sure the witch hunter was good and dead before running. The boss nudged Betram and pointed. Betram didn't move, just shook his head. If it was only the Arbiter, they could take him. Six on one were good odds, no matter. But he had Jezet with him, and that changes things, and not for the better. Six on two odds didn't sound near so good when one of the two was an Arbiter and the other was Jezet Valern. Still, Betram knew what needed to be done. Swift was the best bet. If they waited until the two made some sort of camp, Waited until the Arbiter was sleeping, Swift could stick an arrow through him. The Witch Hunter would never wake. After that, they could either deal with Jezet or just leave her be. Maybe Swift could do for them both. He was damn accurate with that bow of his, and quick, too. The boss nudged Betram again and pointed back toward their little camp. Betram nodded and was just about to crawl back when he heard a belch. It was a low, rumbling noise that could have almost been mistaken for a peal of thunder, and it was not the first time Bones had been known to burp in his sleep. Jezet dropped into a ready stance, hand on her sword hilt. The Arbiter just stood, looking right toward them. For a moment, Betram wasn't sure if the Witch Hunter would see them. They were down low in the grass, only the tops of their heads would be visible, and it was dark. The three of them might even look like wild animals, watching them as they were. Some wild dogs would follow travelers across the plains, watching them for leagues in case someone was split off from the group. It's your friends, the Blackthorn, and his gang, the Arbiter said, drawing his sword and pointing it toward them. No doubt thought he cut a striking figure pointing a sword into the darkness like that. Truth was, he just looked like a fool. A fool who was about to get another knife in him. Betram started reaching for one of the little blades he liked to keep hidden on him, but the boss was having none of it. The big southerner stood and walked toward the Arbiter. Betram had no choice but to stand and follow, and Henry too. Reckon you should just keep on walking, Arbiter, said the boss in his deep, low, dangerous tones. The boss liked to fight with both sword and axe at the same time, and now he drew both. 
Betram felt he had no choice but to unhook his own axe. I don't think I can do that, Blackthorn, the Arbiter replied, ignoring the boss. You ain't talking to Thorn. You're talking to me. The Arbiter glanced at the boss and then back to Betram. Then he pointed his sword at the boss and drew his little stringless crossbow and pointed it at the Blackthorn. Betram did not much like that little thing being pointed at him. He'd seen what a mess it had made of the guard back in Sho's mansion. He took a slow step to the left. The Arbiter's aim followed him. He took a step to the right, and it followed him again. With a sigh, Betram resigned himself to getting shot. Six against two, Arbiter. Wouldn't much like my chances if I were you. Just keep on walking. The boss, usually, didn't like to talk with folk for long. Betram reckoned the big man might be near as scared as he was. Truth was, the only thing Betram liked about his situation so far was that Jezet Valern hadn't drawn her own sword yet. Seemed she was happy to stay out of the whole mess. Can't do it. Your Blackthorn killed Kulth. What? The boss asked with a disapproving look at Betram. No, I didn't. Betram was somewhat certain he'd remember killing a man as fat as Farron Kolth. You did. I saw him, ripped open, and then I saw you sauntering out the very next room. Betram shook his head. Right, but I didn't do it. Only one I killed was that guard. Swift, the boss said in his low rumble. Swift stood up from the grass not five paces from Betram. Quiet as a shadow he'd snuck up. Betram hadn't even known he was there. Yes, boss? Did you kill Farron Kolf? At Shaw's place? No, boss. Didn't kill no one. Was only there for a bit of honest thievery. Betram snorted. There was fuck all worth stealing. Swift grinned. Uh, depends on what you were looking to steal. I happened across Shaw's daughter and stole myself a ride. Turns out she was a maiden, but I soon cured her of that. Another of Swift's stories, Betram reckoned, although he was certain the bastard was capable of rape. Henry spat toward Swift. You were raping the daughter while we were killing the father? Swift was still grinning. Aye. Betram wasn't sure at that point who Henry wanted to stab more, but it was looking like Swift. She was a murderous imp, to be sure, and it seemed Henry did not look too kindly upon rapists. Something to do with being a woman, Betram reckoned. But he wasn't about to get into it. The Arbiter didn't look so certain anymore. You were there to kill Sho, not Kolf. Aye, the boss said with a nod. Host wanted Sho dead. He wouldn't want Kolf dead. Everyone knows Kolf was working for Host. Jezit's sword seemed to sing as it slipped from its scabbard. Her face was a dark scowl, and at that moment, she looked almost as murderous as Henry. You work for Host? The boss took a step back. Not really. We were working for the Dead Eye. Betram groaned. If the boss knew a thing about Jezet Valern, he'd have known that was the worst thing he could have said. You're working for Constance? Jezet asked, and Betram knew the question was directed at him. We're not working for Dead Eye, Jace. Just doing a couple of jobs for her. Right, boss? Aye. We just needed to do a couple of jobs so we can do the big job. After that, everyone seemed to start speaking at once. Henry started arguing with Swift. The boss and the Arbiter started growling words at each other. And Jezet rounded on Betram. Thankfully with words and not steel. How could you work for Constance, Thorn? You know what she is. Says the bitch working for the Inquisition. 
Betram shot back. Well, they pay well. So does Dead Eye. And at least she don't burn folk. Jezzet snorted. <laughs> I wouldn't be so sure about that. She killed Eirik, Thorn. Hawkeye. Aye. That gave Betram a reason to pause. He'd never gotten on too well with Hawkeye, and his death meant there was one less name in the wilds to fear. But it meant Deadeye was willing to kill just about anyone. Might be she'd even try for the Blackthorn. What job? The Arbiter's voice seemed to cut the air in two. We've been hired to kill Host, the boss said, and near bit his tongue off as he clamped his jaw down. The planes seemed to grow silent as a crypt then. Henry? Swift? Jesset? The Arbiter and even Betram himself just stared at the boss. Swift was the first to speak. You want us to kill Host? The boss fixed him with a stare. Aye. That gonna be a problem for you, Swift? Swift took a moment to think about it before shaking his head. All his usual smiles and humor seemed gone. Not a drop, boss. So, working for Constance, Jezzet started. Just needed her trust. Need a way to get close to Host. That's a pretty dangerous job, boss, Henry said, her argument with Swift all but forgotten now. Dangerous jobs mean big rewards, and this one's the biggest. Three hundred thousand gold bits. Split six ways is 50,000 bits each. That's more than a lifetime's worth of jobs right there, and no more dangerous. Betram didn't have a head for numbers. Never had. And he had no idea how big 50,000 was. But it sounded big. Might just be big enough to be worth going up against Deadeye. The Arbiter put away his sword. Boss, isn't it? I think we should talk. I? The Arbiter just nodded and started walking away into the gloom. After a moment, the boss turned to Betram and the others and pointed at Jezid. Watch her. And with that, he stalked off after the Arbiter. Betram relaxed a little, still kept hold of his axe, though, and Jezid still had her sword in hand and was standing ready for a fight. You good then, Jez? Been worse, Thorn. Been better, too. Ever had to crawl through a sewer? She asked. I, once. Puts me one up on you. At that, he had to smile. Weren't a pretty sight, but Jezit smiled back all the same. Girl had been close to a friend once. Didn't mean they wouldn't kill each other when time came. I don't like her, Henry hissed. She had a murderous glare locked tight on Jezid. Why ain't we killin' the whore? Cause the boss said to watch her, Swift replied with a sly grin. So I'm watching her. You want to call them off, Thorn? Jezid warned, giving Betram the impression she would like nothing more right then than to gut both Henry and Swift. Would like that I could, Jez. Henry, Swift. This here is Jezit Verlern. You might not have heard of her, but, well, she's the one that gave old Deadeye the name. Henry looked confused. Swift caught on as fast as his name. You're the one that took Deadeye's eye. Jezit grinned. Aye. She don't look like much, Henry said, sounding a little less confident than before. Betram nodded. I, but neither does a woman called Henry the Red. Folk in Shade know to fear her all the same. Swift whistled. He was still looking at Jezid with hungry eyes. <whistles> I think I'm in love. Sorry, Henry. My heart now belongs to another. 
You don't have a heart, Swift. One day, I'm going to cut you open to prove it. The boss came striding back out of the darkness like some great black bear, only with shiny metal teeth. His weapons were away. Whether that was a good sign or bad, Betram didn't know. The Arbiter limped behind, right up to Jezid. He put a hand on her shoulder and whispered something in her ear. A moment later, Jezid put her sword away. Didn't look too pleased about it, though. The Arbiter, and his woman, will be coming with us for a while, the boss said, wearing his heavy frown. Jezid didn't look too happy. Swift grinned from ear to ear. Henry started cursing. Thing was, Betram didn't give a shit what the others thought about it. Boss, that ain't good. The boss rounded on Betram like a bull about to charge. Did I ask if it were good? Don't think I did, cause I ain't asking, I'm telling. Just so happens, we're going the same way, so we're sharing a road. I really have no interest in you, Blackthorn, the Arbiter said. Betram ignored him. Boss, you can't trust these fuckers. They... The boss turned back to Betram, and for a moment, he thought the big southerner was going to hit him. Betram wasn't sure how he'd respond to that. No one ever hit the Blackthorn and got away with it. If he let anyone even someone like the boss, he'd have to hit back. And if it ever came to blows between the Blackthorn and the boss, there was only one way it could end. Lucky for them both, the boss didn't throw a punch, just stood real close and stared until Betram backed down with a dark glare of his own. Couldn't say he liked the way things were going these days. The boss was starting to act strange. And Betram had to admit, it might be time the Blackthorn moved on. It was a shame. He quite liked Bones, and even Henry had her charms. Still, 50,000 sounded like a real big number. Might be he could stick it out a while longer at least. They stay with us for a while at least, the boss growled. He's agreed. There'll be no witch hunting for the time being. Even you, Thorn. Now back to camp, all of ya. Chapter 34 The Blade Master There were a few times in Jezet Valern's life that she would have paid good money, and a lot of it, for a horse, and this was, without a doubt, one of those times. Thankwell didn't like the beasts other than to carry his own luggage. She had asked him why, and the Arbiter smiled and said, People have been known to fall off horses and die. I don't think I've ever heard of anyone who fell off their own feet and died. Somehow, it didn't feel like an honest answer, but then Jez had near given up on trying to get Thankwell to talk plainly. The man they called the boss was less cryptic and a lot more blunt. He was not tall, at least not compared to the giant, but he was wide, and by the looks of it, he was all muscle. Thick arms, thick neck, thick legs, and a walk that hinted at barely restrained violence. His black hair was braided and hung down past his shoulders, and silver flashed in his mouth every time he spoke. When Jezet looked a little closer, it seemed like all the man's teeth were made of metal. The very thought made her shudder. When Jezet asked whether they might pick up horses in order to cut down the travel time, the boss curled his lip at her and said, This crew don't use horses. After that, he quickened his pace to get away from her. It wasn't that Jez wasn't used to walking, or that she was a good horseman. The thing was that the wilds were too damn big. On horse, it could take weeks to get from Chade to Host's estates. On foot, it could take months, and while she liked the Blackthorn as much as the next murderous sellsword, she did not much like most of his companions. The Arbiter and Jezet traveled with and yet apart from the crew. 
Thanquil limped along and said little, brooding in silence and suffering dark looks from all the crew. Jezet walked beside him, and even in sullen silence, she much preferred his company to the sellswords. They slept close and apart from the others as well, setting their own watches to make sure they weren't murdered in their sleep. The boss seemed to have a firm grip on his crew, and he wanted the Arbiter alive for now. But Thankwell told her he didn't trust one of them, and Jezet agreed. There was one consolation, though. The plains of the wilds were a beautiful sight. Away from the roads, as they were, it was possible to walk where human feet rarely trod. Tall, dry grass of yellows and greens, and sometimes browns, rippled in the breeze. Here and there a corpse tree, with bark as white as bone, would spring from the earth to provide limited shelter and shade. The sky was a deep blue, and with only the occasional wisp of white cloud, and the hot sun beat down upon them mercilessly. Jez was not so sure of the route as the boss. She had traveled this way before by roads. They were headed north, and north would bring them to the Yellow Mountains. From there, they would have to turn west to reach Host's estates. To do that, they would need to cross the Ural, and the Ural was a river like no other. Fed by hundreds of smaller rivers and streams, it was said all the water in the world had passed through the Ural at one time or another. At its smallest, it was a mere half mile across. At its largest, it stretched near four times that. Below the surface, jagged rocks waited to turn the water into white foamy rapids. In places, it moved faster than a horse could gallop, faster than a bird could fly. It started up past the wilds in the God's Corpse Mountains and dipped into a cavern system below the Yellow Mountains only to re-emerge the other side and continue on its way to the sea. Hundreds of waterfalls could be found along the Ural, and the biggest of them, the God's Fall, could be heard thundering across the plains leagues away. There were few ways to cross the Ural. Only in one place this side of the Yellow Mountains were the waters calm enough to ford, but without a horse it was a dangerous crossing and Jezet was not convinced that all the crew could swim. There were the water lizards as well, great beasts that could grow to three or four times the size of a man, with huge mouths full of row upon row of sharp teeth. There were bridges across the Ural, to be sure, but they were near as dangerous as the water, swinging death traps of rope and wood that creaked and swayed in the wind. It was not unknown for planks of rotten wood to give away, dropping crossers to their deaths, or even for the rope to snap and drop a whole group into the churning waters below. The cliff sides on either side of the river were littered with the remains of such bridges. Jez had heard stories of folk who would rob those that walked the bridges. They would wait until people were halfway across and then appear at the end of the bridge and threaten to cut the ropes that held it unless they were paid a toll. Jezet didn't relish the idea of attempting a crossing, but it was either that or take a route that would lead them weeks out of the way, and without horses to speed their journey, it seemed unlikely the boss would choose such an option. We seem to be heading in the same direction, Thankwell said as he limped up beside Jezet. Still north, Jezet said with a nod. It'll get us there eventually. Not a short route, though. How's the leg? Stings a little. I can't help but shake the feeling that one of our companions stabbed me. Jezet snorted and grinned at him. He scratched you is all. Anyone would think he cut your leg off the way you complain. From the looks I get from the Blackthorn, I'd wager he'd like to. It could be worse. That Swift never stops staring at me, Jezet said, and Thankwell glanced behind them to where Swift was keeping pace. He's doing it now, isn't he? He's staring at a part of you. Jezet felt her lip curl, and her hand brushed the hilt of her sword. It would be easy just to turn and kill him. I'm sure none of the others would miss him too much. We could always walk behind them, Jezet suggested. Stop some of the staring. 
Don't think they'd like that too much. They all seem to think that if they take their eyes off me for a second, I'll light one of them on fire. Wouldn't you? Thankwell laughed. He did that a lot, she'd noticed. We burn heretics, not petty criminals. Oh. Jezid had always assumed witch hunters just burned whoever they pleased. Witches, practitioners of forbidden magics, demon worshippers, Druor. The Druor are real? Uh, I thought they were stories made up to scare children, like trolls or giants. The Druor are real, but just like Blade Masters, their numbers have dwindled. The Inquisition hunts them wherever possible. They hide in places where humans have never been, in places where humans fear to tread. My master always used to tell me fear is a tool. A blade master should know fear, but should never be ruled by it. A lesson you never learned, Jez. You never told me what happened to him. Your master. Jez it spat. I killed him. Oh, Thankwell said and then fell silent for a moment. I'm sure he deserved it. He did, she agreed. I'd have killed him a hundred times if I could have, but that ain't why I did it. When a blade master takes an apprentice, they know it can only end one of two ways. One of them has to die. It took fifteen years for my master to train me, and the final test an apprentice has to take is a duel with their master. If the apprentice dies, the master will know they weren't worthy. If the master dies, then the apprentice becomes a blade master. There were two hundred of us when the order was created, and there has never been more. Now, as far as I know, there are only two of us left. You two are always whispering, Thorn growled. He had been walking beside them, but now he kept paced just a few feet behind, glowering at the arbiter all the while. It's enough to make a man nervous. Jezet noticed Thorn always seemed to have a weapon in his hand these days, and the burnt side of his face twitched a little whenever he spoke to the Arbiter. And you always look like you want to stab me again, which tends to make me a little nervous. So, I'd say we're even, Thankwell replied with an easy smile. You got what you deserved for attacking me. I didn't attack you. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Why is it men always have to get into pissing contests? Jezet asked herself, then glanced at Henry and realized it wasn't just men. Jezet almost walked away and left Thankwell and Thorn arguing and growling at each other, but the idea that they might dispense with the insults and get around to killing each other and leave her here alone with the rest of the crew was a terrifying prospect. What does it matter which of you started it? She shouted at them. You continue this and I'll kill the both of you. Thankwell smiled and backed down. Thorn looked worried for a moment, or at least as worried as his broken and battered face could. After that, the two spent the rest of the day walking in silence, sending sullen looks at each other and making sure the entire crew was between them. That night, the boss allowed a fire in the camp. He decided they were far enough away from any of the beaten paths that the only folk likely to find them were others like themselves, and they were rare enough. Swift brought down a couple of birds with his bow during the day. The speed at which he could string the weapon and loose a shaft amazed Jezid. Do you remember I'll in quick draw? He'd asked when he spotted her watching. Not many do, but some said there weren't a man in the wilds could throw an axe half so fast or half so accurate. Well, the fool only went and challenged old Swift to a duel. Seemed he'd heard about me and my knives and didn't take too kind on me being faster than him. Had all my weapons laid out on the ground, and waited for the judge to say go. Had a string on me bow, and put an arrow through his hand for he'd even blinked. Put one through each eye, and all just to be sure. There's a reason they call me Swift, you know. He leered at Jez the entire time he was speaking. 
Henry had padded up out of nowhere and cackled in Swift's face. It's the whores that named you Swift. So fast, you don't even know what a wet cunt feels like. Swift turned his leer onto Henry. Wet? Willin? What the fuck does it matter? After that, Henry spat at the bastard and stalked off to talk to the boss. The fresh meat from the birds tasted more a luxury than Jez could have imagined. There wasn't a lot of meat on either, but Jezet got a whole leg to herself and counted herself lucky. The Arbiter got none. Swift brought down the birds, and so he decided who got to eat. Even Henry got a share, but Swift ignored Thankwell like he didn't exist. When Jezet had offered to share a leg with him, Thankwell just smiled and shook his head. A moody silence soon descended over the fire. The boss and Henry retreated into the darkness. The boy, Green, had the watch and had been expelled from the circle of light. Thankwell sat staring into the fire, the flames dancing in his eyes. Swift was asleep or pretending to be, and Bones was busy cleaning his bones. Seems he did that a lot. How'd you lose the other finger, Thorn? Jezzet asked, hoping to start some sort of conversation if just to lift some of the tension. There were times when silence could grate on Jezzet's nerves, so that she wanted to scream. The Blackthorn spat into the fire, and for a while, Jezzet thought he meant to ignore her. Last member of the crew took it. Boy was young, pretty much like Green, except he knew how to swing a sword. Fuck you, Blackthorn! The words drifted into the firelight but the boy stayed outside on his watch. Big lad, and still growing. Should have waited a few years before testing me, though. What was his name? Bowl, Bones replied, without looking up from his bones. Though, we took to calling him Bull. Seemed to fit somewhat. Aye, well, Bull decided to try for me at a whorehouse in Nari. I was naked as my name day, with a girl sat on top of me. Pretty little wench. Claimed to be just fifteen, and near enough a maiden as not to matter. Thorn let out a heavy sigh. <sighs> First swing of Bull's sword buried itself in her skull. Good job, too, cause he got it stuck and had to wrench it free. Gave me time to push the corpse off me and roll away. I swear. You never feel yourself with us so fast as when the girl you're in turns dead. Strange feeling to find yourself inside a corpse. Even a new one. They were all staring at Thorn then. Even Swift opened an eye and looked somewhere between disgusted and fascinated. Then Thankwell spoke. In some cultures, it's a man's right to take his wife to bed one last time after her death. Honors her memory and allows him to say goodbye to her. Again, the Blackthorn spat. Well, this ain't there, and she weren't nobody's wife. What about the finger? Jez asked. Got to my gear a little too late. Managed to block Ball's next swing, but he was a strong fucker. The swing knocked away my axe and took my finger by the by. He held up his hand and rubbed at his middle stump. Amazing how many situations come down to fucking and fighting. After that, I grabbed up my dagger and shoved it into his groin twice. As he fell away, he let go of his sword, so I snatched it up and started hacking. I remember the mess you made of the lad. Bones said, with a haunted look in his eyes. I remember the whore, Swift replied, his grin returning even as his eyes closed again. Really was a pretty one. I wanted her, but you got there first. <sighs> I... Shame, really. Thorne sighed again. I got the blame for her and all. Chapter 35 The Blackthorn Bitter Springs was a lonely town, but a prosperous one all the same. 
It didn't survive on trade, as many did. It didn't hold much of a strategic placement. The great herd never passed close by. Bitter Springs had two things, sulfur and the Bitter Springs. The little town sat at the foot of the first and greatest peak of the Yellow Mountains. Its walls were made from the same yellow rock that littered the mountainside, and the buildings were made from the rock too. There the town had existed for near 200 years, sitting at the edge of Host's province and catering to some of the richest and most powerful folk in all the wilds. The people came for the springs, or at least for the healing, soothing, calming powers that they claimed to boast. The masters of the springs knew the exact ingredients in each pool of bubbling, scalding water, and knew which pool would cure which ailments, which pool would soothe which ache, which pool would leach which toxins. They tended and guarded the springs, and, of course, allowed others to experience the waters for a modest fee. Nothing in the wilds came free, not even fancy water. Betram himself had never been to Bitter Springs before. It was one of the very few towns of the wilds he'd always managed to stay clear of. It was out of the way, and, apart from the springs, which to the likes of him would always be closed, there wasn't much worth marking the journey. In fact, he had to wonder why the boss had brought them this way at all. Seemed to be a fair distance out of the way, and unless the boss was feeling in the need of a deep soak in some foul-smelling water, the town had nothing they needed. The smell got everywhere, was everywhere. As soon as they set eyes on the yellow walls, Betram could smell it. Like egg left in the sun for too long. Betram himself may not have seen an egg in a good number of years, but he remembered them well enough. Back on the ranch, before his first killing, they had plenty of chickens and plenty of eggs. As they got closer, he could see the guards. Someone had once joked that there were more guards in the wilds than there were beasts in the great herd. These ones were near as yellow as the walls they guarded. Dusty yellow doublets with mail over the top and a lemon yellow cloak behind, all topped off with a high peaked half helm on their heads, and each one of them carrying an iron tipped spear. From such a distance, they looked like toy soldiers guarding toy walls. Up close was a different matter, they looked a touch more fierce. The toy guards watched them through wary eyes as they approached and the more fierce types watched them with a touch of hostility as they entered through the large wooden gates. It was possible that they went days or even weeks without seeing strangers, and Betram knew the boss's crew made for a strange set at the best of times. And now with an arbiter and a jesuit in tow, they must look a real mystery. But they were allowed through all the same. Inside, the town was small with squat, dirty yellow buildings, and a fair amount of dust that seemed to coat everything. It was busy enough despite that, with folk moving every which way. Fewer merchants than Betram was used to seeing, for a certainty, but then he'd spent a great deal of time in the free cities of late. Bitter Springs was one of Host's towns, and that meant they had to pay Host's taxes. Not far from the gate, they came across a small square whose main feature was the big well in the center. Folks crowded around the well in droves with buckets or pails and even the occasional barrel. The water from the springs may be special, but it was poisonous to drink. The Yorl was close, yet still a good few miles away, too far for the common folk to walk. They had to rely on the wells. The boss turned and gathered his strange crew around him. Relax, like we should have been doing in shade, but for these two. He pointed at Betram and the Arbiter. First things first. Bones, you and Henry, go find us a place to stay. Try not to ruffle any feathers. We're keeping a low profile. Jesuits and I will find a room in the inn, the Arbiter announced. We sometimes have to be leaving in a fair hurry, Arbiter. Easier when the crew's all together. We're not part of your crew, 
and I'm certain, no matter what hurry you're in, you'll find some time to send one of yours to find us. Betram had never seen the boss back down, and he had to admit he was looking forward to seeing him and the Arbiter go at it. I'll be staying at the bloody pedal, boss, Swift put in with a wink. That's so, the boss growled back. Swift stopped grinning and lowered his eyes. Aye, got family to see there. That seemed to make the boss stop and think. After a while, he nodded. Bones, take Henry and our two guests and find us an inn. Henry narrowed her eyes, but Bones grinned. How many rooms, boss? He boomed. One for me and Henry, and one for the rest of you. The Arbiter can pay his own way. Green, Thorn, Swift, you're with me. Lead the way to this bloody petal. Henry looked fit to burst, and for a moment, Betram thought she might stab the boss there and then. As Bones walked away chatting with Jezet, Henry spat and stalked off with them. Betram followed after Swift. Seemed the number of folk on the crew the boss was pissing off of late was growing rapidly. For him to shun Henry in favor of some whore, even Betram paled to think of the consequences, and a face like his didn't pale easily. Nothing quite said welcome to Betram like a big pair of tits in his face and the bloody pedal was pretty damn welcoming. The woman was plump, her breasts were huge and white and heavy, and she wore too much powder. Betram found himself stiffening all the same. He grabbed hold of the plump woman by the waist and drew her closer. She didn't even seem to mind his scars too much. Then the boss was there, tapping Betram on the shoulder. Not yet, Thorn. I'm back, Swift announced to the whorehouse with arms stretched out wide, as if he could hug all the women at once. A middle-aged woman squinted at him for a moment, then walked over. She put a hand to either side of Swift's face and kissed him on the lips. Ma, Swift said after she'd done kissing him. It's been too long, boy. It's on the house for my boy, Swift. She shouted to all the whores in the brothel. Are these friends of yours? Aye, near enough anyways. Swift grinned at all of them. Find yourself a woman, lads. Swift's mother approached Betram. She was pretty enough, still slim despite the years and the use, though the corners of her eyes were starting to wrinkle. She wore a dark blue dress that seemed to cover very little of her, and she wasn't overpowdered or overperfumed. Aging or no, she was still attractive enough to warrant a smile. Not that Betram would expose her to that. I'm Tanda, said Swift's mother. You're the Blackthorn. Betram nodded. He may have never been to Bitter Springs before, but everywhere he went, his reputation seemed to precede him. Rose! Tanda called over her shoulder. The woman who stepped up was slim as a reed, with long hair as black as midnight, small and perky breasts, and a beautiful face without so much as a mark on it. When she grinned, Betram could see her teeth. Two perfect sets of pearly whites. It took everything he had not to smile back at her. She didn't want to see that. Nobody did. This is Rose. Tanda was saying, though Betram was finding it hard to pay her any attention. She's my daughter. You'll have to pay double, and if you try to mess her up at all, she'll kill you. That caught his attention. He looked from Rose to Tanda to the grinning Swift. You daughter? Uh... That's right. She's just as good with a knife as her brother, too. Only as good? Swift laughed. She used to be better. Rose came closer, so close Betram was poking her in the leg with his cock. She trailed a hand up his chest and spoke in a husky voice that seemed to slip out of her full red lips. I'm sure it won't come to that, but if it does... A knife appeared in her hand, 
and she held it to his neck so close that she could have shaved him with it. If it does, I'll geld you first, then kill you. Fitting end for such a man as the Black Thorn. Some men, most men, would have wilted under those conditions. Betram was not one of those men. He found himself poking Rose in the leg even harder. Rose smiled at him. She did have perfect teeth. I think he gets the point, Mother. She glanced down. So will I, by the looks of things. I do hope you know how to use that thing. Betram let out a ragged breath. It was rare any whorehouse gave him one of the pretty ones, and he was so eager, the only thing stopping him was the knife still held to his throat. I need to borrow my lads and one of your tables for a few minutes, Tanda, the boss said in his deep growl. A bottle of something strong and three glasses wouldn't go amiss. Not you, Green. You go and find yourself some fun. Just need Swift and Thune. Green grumbled something Betram didn't hear, and Tanda said something about a bottle. Betram paid them no mind. His attention was fixed on Rose. Then a big hand grabbed hold of his arm and started dragging him away. The dagger disappeared from Rose's hand and she pouted at him as she ran a single hand down from her breasts, over her stomach, all the way down to her cunt. Don't be long. I get so very lonely. Damn, but the boss was strong. If it wasn't for his iron grip, Betram would have pulled free, and then... He bumped into something and looked down. A table with some chairs. Sit, the boss ordered. Betram did as he was told, but the last thing he was was happy about it. This best not take long, boss. It'll take as long as it fucking needs to. You'll get to put your cock in Swift's sister, don't you worry. The big southerner waited until Tanda had brought the bottle and the glasses. He poured a shot into each glass, knocked his back, and then poured another before looking around the room making sure no other folk were listening in. Betram emptied his own glass and waited for the boss to decide no one was listening. Wasn't mean in back on the plains to tell everyone about the job. Can't lie to an arbiter, though. And now I know what that means. Never felt so... He stopped and snapped his metal teeth together. Fact is, we all know what we're in for now. And I need to know if you got any sort of problem with that. Swift? Swift eyed the boss, and then he eyed Betram. Betram just stared back at him, a blank look on his face. Good thing about having a ruined face, Betram had long ago decided, that it made it easy to show no expression, no emotion. People never knew what he might do next, because his face never betrayed him. Swift downed his own drink, the boss refilled his glass, and Swift downed it again. Only thing Host ever gave Ma was a silver and a squirt in her cunt. As for me, I got some of his blood, but that's as far as his father ever went. He never wanted me, and I never wanted him. So, the way I see it, you just give me the word, and it'll be my knife between his eyes. The boss stared at Swift for a while, and for a while, Swift just stared right back. Then the boss nodded and downed his second glass. Good. I got a question, boss, Betram said before the talking ended. When are we ditching the Arbiter? Here seems as good a spot as any. This time, the boss took a swig straight from the bottle. He'd gone back to scowling. We ain't. He's coming with us all the way. Boss. Seems he's after the same man we are. And if that bitch of his is as good as you say, I'd rather have them with us than against. Might not be ideal, Thorn, but as long as the target gets dead, 
we get pain, no matter if it's us or some witch hunter who deals the blow. So, for now, you just shut up and deal with it. After, you two can kill each other as much as you like. Good? Aye, good. Betram didn't much like it, but didn't seem like he had much of a choice. Go have fun, then. I best get back to Henry before she starts thinking I'm out whoring. Last thing we need is her murdering folk for no reason. Betram looked around the room for Rose. He saw her leaning against the bar, watching him. That was the best thing about a good whore, Betram decided. They always made it seem they wanted you, even when you were as ugly as he was. Swift gave Betram a quick tap on the arm. Treat her good, Thorn. Aye. She likes it when you bite her nipples. Aye, what? Betram said, but Swift was already gone, halfway across the room and speaking with his mother. Betram poured himself another shot and necked it before standing and walking toward the whore. Rose met him halfway and pressed herself up close, her breasts against his leathers his cock poking her in the hip. Her skin was white, her hair was black, her eyes were blacker, and she smelled of sex. She slipped a deft hand down into his trousers and gave him two long, slow strokes. Betram shuddered and grabbed her around the waist, pulling her closer. He would have been more than happy to bend her over a table and take her right there in the middle of the room. I see you can pay double, she whispered close to his ear. Betram realized she was holding his cock in one hand and his purse in the other. I'll hold on to both of these for now. Don't worry, I'll only take what I'm worth. You best be worth it, he growled at her as she started leading him toward the stairs. Rose glanced back at him a wicked grin on her face that looked nothing like Swift's. Oh, I am. Chapter 36 The Arbiter Thankwell was trying to think of a situation where he'd felt more awkward, a situation that had been more tense. He was coming up blank. Sitting between two women who seemed to hate each other was somehow worse than being questioned by the Council of Inquisitors, worse than having a dozen swords pointed at him for a crime he was innocent of, worse than standing by and watching as the Arbiter passed judgment on his parents. For her part, Jezet wasn't making a show of it. She stared into her mug, but Thankwell could feel the anger radiating off of her, like a dark haze that spurned all attempts at conversation. Henry was far less subtle, staring poisonous daggers at Jezet and sneering with even more contempt than normal. To make matters worse, the rest of the common room in the inn was loud, jovial, and drunk. Their table was an island of moody silence among a sea of revelry, and that grated on Thankwell's nerves. The giant sighed, and Henry sent him a look that could have frozen the sea. Don't give me that, Henry. I'm bored. Bones wide. All the others are off having fun, and here I am, stuck here with three people, all look like they want to kill the others. I have no wish to kill any of you. Not even Thorn. Especially not Thorn. Trying to kill that one is dangerous work. Six arbiters he's killed. Henry spat onto the reed-covered floor. It landed close to a man's feet, but he took one look at the table and thought better of whatever insult had been on his lips. He's fond of telling us, too, Henry growled. Do you really burn folk? Bones asked. Not the sunniest of topics for a conversation, but Thankwell was willing to take just about anything at this point. I've been known to... Do a few burnings. Why? I mean, why burning? 
don't stab in work just as well? Or beheading? Or poisoning? Or crushing? Or drowning? Or... Thankwell decided to interrupt the big man before he ran out of ways to think of killing people. There's cleansing power in fire. I try not to burn people if possible. There are more humane ways of killing those deemed heretics. Huh. The giant was fumbling idly at one of the bone necklaces he kept around his neck. That's a grisly trophy you carry with you, Thankwell said. He had long ago discovered the best way to stop people asking questions about him was to make them talk about themselves. Bones smiled and pulled out all three of the necklaces he wore. Crude things made of string looped through bone. Two were complete. The third only had bones halfway around its length. Took one from every man or woman I ever killed. Why? Jezzet asked. To remind me. Count every night so I know just how many people I killed. Easy to forget in the game we play that everyone we kill is a person, just like us. Each one got bones and skin, just like us. Each one got friends and family, just like us. Some folk, like Thorn and Henry here, like to forget that. Not me. So, what is your count at? Forty-nine so far. Henry snorted, Jezet nodded, and Thankwell tried to remember how many people he'd killed. It was hard to say. He thought it would be well over fifty. Doesn't seem like that many, Jezet said. Weren't always a sellsword. Used to be a farmer. Or, at least, I used to work on a farm. The man who owned it didn't have enough bits to buy an ox. So, he used me and another lad, Jerry, from the nearby village. Used to spend all day pulling a plow. Now that were hard work. Mostly grew corn. But he had a small fruit orchard at the back of the house. We used to sneak back there and steal some sometimes, me and Jerry. This one's Jerry, here. Bones pointed at one of his bones. You killed him? This came from Henry. Didn't have much of a choice. One day, a group came around, armed and mounted. They killed the owner and then chucked a sword down between me and Jerry and said, We don't need two giants. Jerry got to the sword first, but... He weren't never as big or strong as me. So I took it and took my first bone. After that, I rode with them for a while, till the hangman caught them. Hangman Earl? Henry asked. Aye, chased us halfway across the wilds, the old bastard. How did you escape? Didn't. He never caught me. Was off taking a shit when he came on our camp. Heard the commotion and laid low. After, when I stole back into camp to see if my staff was still there, I found the whole gang swinging from ropes. He hung them all. Never been so glad of a man dying as when I heard the hangman had been done in by the rot. Bounty hunters is near as bad as witch hunters, Henry said. He weren't so bad, Bones said with a smile. Met him a year later, in Coral. Nea pissed myself, but he had no idea who I was. Bought me a drink. You could have gone back, though, Thankwell suggested. Back to your old village. Bones laughed. There's no going back, Arbiter. Not for folk like us. Not in the wilds. Once you're part of the game, the game's a part of you. With all those people you burned, never killed an innocent one, witch hunter? Henry asked. Thankwell remembered the body of a boy with a hole in his head, lying amongst rotted, splintered wood. He remembered the blood seeping into the soiled reeds on the floor. And he remembered Jezet Velern 
standing in front of him, naked as a babe. I... I've killed innocents before. Henry spat. There was something vicious and cruel about her. See? You know better than us. Never claimed to be. I'm just better spoken. Words? Words is just air. Don't matter how they're spoken. Thankwell smiled at Henry. She scowled back. Words have power with the proper application, and how they're spoken is the key. Would words save you if I leapt at you with a knife? With the right words, they might. If they didn't, I would, Jezet said, her voice as dark and dangerous as her eyes. And who are you, anyway? Henry returned the dark eyes. Blackthorn says you're good. All I see is a scared little girl in bed with a witch hunter. She was speaking loud enough to draw attention now, yet more eyes rested on Thankwell and his coat than the small woman with murder in her eyes. Henry, Bones started. Shut it, Bones. The boss said. Henry rocketed to her feet, her chair clattering to the floor and she spat at Jezid. The blade master made no attempt to move, and the spittle hit her on the face. She pushed herself to her feet, her hand resting on the hilt of her sword. For somewhere close to a lifetime, Henry and Jezid stared at each other across the table. Then Bones stood up, towering over all of them. The boss said, We're all together in this, her included. He ain't gonna be pleased if you two start killing each other. Boss is off sticking his cock in some poxy hall. What the fuck do I care if he's pleased? With that, Henry turned and stalked away. Men twice as large as her, parting before the storm. Jezit sat back down, wiping the spittle from her face. Bones collapsed into his chair. Thankwell was amazed the small wooden structure didn't collapse under the weight. The regular sounds of the common room resumed, and Thankwell leaned over and picked up the fallen chair. Bones swallowed the rest of his mug of beer and motioned for the serving girl to bring him another, and Jezid echoed the request. Thankwell could see her hand was shaking, just like his did when he hadn't stolen anything for a while. Sorry about Henry, Bones was saying. She's, well, Henry. She doesn't seem to like me much, Jezit said as she paid the serving girl for her beer. Oh, she just don't like not being the prettiest of the crew no more, Bones said with a smile, and Jez smiled back. Just... Don't go telling my wife I called you pretty. She'd have my stones cut off before I could say sorry. After that, Jezid and Bones traded a few stories. Each told the other of the big names they had met and the big names they had killed. Jezid seemed to come out on top of that contest. Bones always mentioned one crew or another he served with. Thankwell kept himself quiet for the most part more than content to listen. When the big southerner they called the boss arrived, he sank down into Henry's empty chair, took a large swig of beer, and commenced scowling. Where is she? Bones winced. She, um, left. Why? Well, the last thing she said had something to do with you and... Whores. Fuck. Well, we best just hope she don't go murdering anyone. The big southerner looked tired and more than a little angry. We are moving toward Host, I hope. I seem to remember someone saying something about North, and we seem to have moved somewhat east, Thankwell said. The boss nodded. Some roads are longer than others. This one happens to be safer, especially with the company we keep. 
Reckon it's about time Jezit Verlern told us what she knows about Host. Jezit's eyes flicked up to the boss and then across to Thankwell. The boss continued. Aye, seems there's some folk heard of you after all, and they reckon you might know a bit more than nothing. Some say you worked for Ost. Some say you crewed with Deadeye. Now, from the way you drew steel when I said we were working for her, I know you got some sort of involvement. Reckon it's about time you told us a tale. Afore the others get back, it'd probably be best for you. Can't lie to an arbiter, Bones pitched in. Jezit looked at Thankwell and then away. It was me who gave Constance her dead eye. Aye, the boss said after a mouthful of beer. That much I know already. Did in her sister too, the one they called the Bloody Angel. Were you working for Host or not? Aye, a few years ago when I'd just come to the wilds. I was in Solantis. A woman alone in Solantis is like to end up a woman raped and dead in Solantis. Maybe, but a woman who can use a sword in Solantis is like to end up very wealthy, for a time at least. Catherine, Constance's sister, saw me in the fighting pits. She was there gathering swords, wanted to raise a new merc company, and make a name for herself. She hired me on as a second bodyguard. She called us the Angel's Blades. You can imagine the talk, I'm sure. A merc company led by three women. Constance was as big as a bear and stronger than most men. Me, a blade master, and Catherine was as good with a map as she was with a sword. But not as good as you, the boss put in. Not with a sword, no. The other companies laughed, but those who worked for her were fiercely loyal. She soon made that name for herself in Faville. You were the ones that sacked Faville? Jezit nodded. Is it true what you did there? Bones asked. Again, Jezit nodded. We'd been paid to take the city. The contract was not specific as to how, and their walls were fairly high. We arrived during the day when many and more of the town's people were out farming and working and such. Catherine took them prisoner, all of them, including the magistrate's daughter, 208 townsfolk in all. When the rest of the company arrived, she set up the siege and met with the magistrate, told him that no one had to die, no one even need get hurt. All he needed to do was open the gates and give command of the town over to us. The magistrate told her to piss off, so Catherine had his daughter staked out in front of the town and gave the men free use of her. For three days and nights, all you could hear was that bloody girl screaming and crying. Eventually, one of the men took pity and slit the girl's throat. Catherine had him hanged for it. After that, she had three prisoners a day brought out in front of the town's walls and had two teams of horses pull them apart. Twelve people we killed like that before the gates came open and the magistrate was marched out in chains. Catherine ordered the town sacked, its garrison executed to a man. After that, they started calling her the Bloody Angel. Prettiest woman I've ever seen, but so much blood on her hands. You didn't do much to stop it yourself, the boss put in. No, I didn't, Jezit said her face and eyes as hard as stone. Host bought our contract soon after. He never was much one for military matters, so he gave full command of his forces to Catherine. Our company was absorbed by Host's larger force. That doesn't tell us much about Host, Thankwell said. I really don't know that much. Only met him a few times, and two of those he was in his cups. He's mad, though. 
all the blooded families dream of reclaiming the wilds into the empire it once was. But Host, he believes it, and he believes he's the man to do it. That's it? the boss asked. Nothing else. Well, he really doesn't like me, Jezzet added. Not since I cost him the lands around Longwater. Or not since I won them for Droan, more like. Well, that's good news at least, said Bones with an easy grin. All eyes turned to him. Well, I mean, you're less likely to betray us, given that he hates you. Chapter 37 The Blackthorn Rose was breathing heavy, her breasts rising and falling with each breath. Even though he'd only just had her, and even though that was the third time, Betram wanted her again already. He made a clumsy grab for one of her breasts with his five-fingered hand, and she swatted it away. Then she leaned over and plucked a bottle from the table beside the bed, uncorked it, and took a long, deep swallow of the sweet amber meat inside. Open, she said, with a smile on her lips and a brighter smile in her eyes. Betram opened his mouth, and she poured mead down his throat. Her aim was perfect. So, reckon I'm worth double? Rose asked, her voice playful but not mocking. Betram had never been too good with women, something to do with being ugly even before the scars and the burn. But here, with his cock still inside this one, he was feeling romantic. For you? I'd gladly pay triple. Rose gasped. <gasps> you do spoil me. She took another mouthful of mead and then poured more into his mouth. You'll run out of those lovely silver bits if you pay triple. Don't reckon it matters, Betram rasped. After this job, I'll either be rich or dead. Might as well spend the bits while I can. And there ain't nothing I'd rather spend them on right now than you. Rich or dead? Rose said, her voice all innocent. I do hope it's rich. Then you can come back here and pay me triple again. And I can do this again. She wriggled atop of him, then filled her mouth with mead and leaned down to kiss him. The honey liquid flowed into his mouth, flowed down his chin, flowed everywhere. But he didn't care a bit. The door to the room flung open with a bang. Thorn! A familiar voice. Betram couldn't be arsed figuring out who it belonged to. Rose? The voice continued with a smile. Betram wasn't sure how a voice could smile. Then he realized. It belonged to Swift. Rose sat up, still naked, still sat atop Betram, still with him inside her. Golden mead ran down her chin and dripped onto her breasts. Betram wanted her again right there, and he didn't care that Swift was watching. Brother, you know I'm not allowed to do you. Mother says it's wrong. Rose's voice was as honeyed as the mead, and ten times as sweet. A sulky pout played on her full red lips. If only, little sister, but I'm here for him. Swift sounded urgent. Rose looked at Swift all innocent and sweet, and then looked at Betram with wicked mischief in her eyes. By the feel of him, I think he prefers women, brother. Betram grunted and ran his hands up her legs toward her ass. Piss off, Swift. We're busy. Oh, fuck this, Swift said, and in three long strides he was beside the bed. He grabbed Rose by the shoulders and pulled her off Betram, off the bed. Then there was a knife at Swift's throat and another one at Rose's. Betram couldn't quite figure out where Rose's knife had come from, given that she was stark naked. Put it down, little sister. We don't have time for this. Swift glanced down at Betram's crotch as he sprawled naked on the bed. 
Huh. No wonder she likes you. We're busy, Swift, Betram said again, picking up the forgotten mead and taking a good long drink. Piss off. Your pretty little friend, Jezit, is downstairs, Thorn. Boss sent her. It's time to go. Fuck that. He said two days, and I ain't out of bits yet. Rose smiled a sweet smile. Reckon he's got at least another few rides in that purse. Swift removed his knife from her throat, and she did the same. Bounty hunters are here, looking for us. Four of them, and led by Big Mouth Cal. Bollocks, Betram said, and swung his legs off the bed, already looking for his leathers. They after us. Unless another group of murderous bastards have come into town, and they also happen to have killed one of the Chade Council. Yes. Two. What? Two, Betram repeated. We only killed the one, but two are dead. And you can bet they'll be blaming us. Blaming you, Swift said, scowling. You're the one made himself known. Now, get the fuck dressed and let's go. Rose? Swift kissed his sister. His sister kissed him back, and then he turned and left. As Betram finished dressing, Rose looked at his purse, still on the table, and then at him. She was still naked, and still the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. Keep it all, Betram heard himself say. But. If I survive and come back, next one's on the house. Not a chance, she said, grinning. He made to kiss her, but she stepped back out of his reach. Her eyes were flat, dark, emotionless pools. Betram turned and fled the room. Chapter 38 The Arbiter Thankwell ducked another slash and then threw himself to his left just in time to dodge the jab from behind. Without his constant chanting of the blessings of speed, making his reaction times that little bit quicker, making his muscles move just that little bit faster, he would have been dead ten times over already. Again, the swords came at him. The first he blocked with his own and then pushed into the man with his blessed strength. Blessings of speed and strength were easy to combine, but using two blessings at once was a quick way to tire. The man stepped aside, and Thankwell felt a sting on his right arm. He stumbled away a few steps and glanced at the pain. A new cut had appeared in his coat, and a shallow wound had been opened up below. Three small cuts now, and all of them hurt like hell. He couldn't help but feel the men were toying with him. Thankwell had to admit his already quite meager skill with a sword had gone to rust of late. Ignoring his small scuffle with the Blackthorn and Chade, it had been well over a year since Thankwell had last truly swung a sword in anger, and he wagered it showed. One of his assailants was stony-eyed and flat-mouthed, and the other was sporting a cruel grin. The stone face lurched toward him a step, raising his sword, and then stepped away. A feint. The grinner was there on Thankwell's right, and he rained down blow after blow with his longsword. Thankwell caught and turned each blow, but by then he had lost sight of Stoneface, and the man could be anywhere. The grinner's small round shield rushed forward and caught Thankwell in the chest, sending him rolling over and over in the dust in the road. About time you used some of that magic, Arbiter, the boss shouted. Thankwell coughed up some dust and looked around, searched for his opponents. Both Stoneface and the Grinner were standing together, watching him, waiting. Thank you for the advice, boss, Thankwell shouted back. The big black southerner had his own problems. A large youth with a heavy iron-bound staff seemed to be giving him no end of trouble. Thankwell wished they hadn't sent Jezet to warn the Blackthorn and Swift. He had no doubt she'd have more than even the odds, but there was one bounty hunter missing, 
and the boss decided he couldn't risk the man had gone after Thorn. Can't you turn them all into frogs or something? The boss shouted as he spun away from an attack. The youth with the staff had the range advantage, and one good crack from that heavy wooden weapon would break bones like they were twigs. The boss held a short sword and a hand axe, but was finding it hard to get close enough to use them. Of course. Well, go on then. Thankwell let out a groan and shook his head. He could run. With a blessing of speed, his assailants would never catch him. If only he could find the whorehouse. He'd find Jezzet and her sword. Of course, it would mean leaving the boss with three angry bounty hunters. And Thankwell was certain only the stern presence of the southerner was keeping his crew together. Besides, running to the nearest whorehouse while screaming for help from Jezzet did not seem like the manliest of tactics, and for some reason, Thankwell found that mattered. Stoneface smiled, his mouth stretching from ear to place where his ear should have been. His mouth was so large, it made his face seem queer given his tiny button nose. Blackthorn, he said with his giant mouth. Big mouth? The growl came from behind Thankwell, but he refused to turn and look. Been a while, Blackthorn. Not long enough. Been looking forward to killing you. Big Mouth and his companion seemed to have forgotten Thankwell for now, all their attention on the Blackthorn. As well, look forward to your own grave. Big mouth. Not that I'll be digging you one. Thorn, help the Arbiter! Ugh! The boss took a blow from the staff in his midsection and stumbled away, coughing. The youth gave him no respite, following up with more merciless blows. Thankwell heard the Blackthorn spit from somewhere behind him. Don't reckon that's like to happen. Reckon I'll let Big Mouth kill ya. Turning his head, Thankwell gave Blackthorn a withering look. The big, scarred man stared back impassively. One hand was resting on his axe, but he was making no move to use it. Jezzet was nowhere to be seen. Thankwell let out a sigh. Big Mouth laughed. We'll be taking you too, Blackthorn. Bounty on each of ya. Oh, the Blackthorn said, and took a couple of steps forward so he was standing next to Thankwell. Reckon that's wise. Three on three makes for even odds. Way I see it, your witch hunter is not worth one. What are you doing crewing with one of them anyways? The Blackthorn glanced at Thankwell and then back to Big Mouth. You know, I've been asking myself the same question. I don't see Jezzet, Thankwell said in a quiet voice, not much more than a whisper. Aye, the Blackthorn responded. Gone with Swift to fetch the Magistrate. Reckon someone's been paid off. Don't see any guards about. Where's Bones? Your boss sent him to find Henry. What about the youth that was with you? Green? Fuck. I thought he was with you. Weren't in the whorehouse. Any chance we can pay you off, Big Mouth? Sure. You're worth five thousand apiece. You and the witch hunter both. Reckon you can afford that? The Blackthorn glanced down at Thankwell again. Thankwell could only laugh in response. Don't suppose you're taking I owe you? The Blackthorn shouted back. Big Mouth laughed, and the grinner next to him just grinned some more. The sun was just beginning to poke over the top of the small stone houses that surrounded them. Thankwell could hear the boss fighting somewhere to his right, yet he dared not look away. He knew his own fight would continue any moment. All he really wanted was to finish his night's sleep. Thankwell had been sound asleep when the boss had burst into his room in the inn. Jezzet sprung from the bed with sword drawn before Thankwell had even opened his eyes. All the big southerner said was, Time to go. Hunters on us. 
Jezet cursed and started looking for her boots, while Thankwell rolled from the bed and pulled his coat on, not understanding what was happening. How'd you find us anyways, big mouth? The Blackthorn calls. It occurred to Thankwell he might be delaying the fighting, stalling for time, and giving the others a chance to arrive. Chance? Luck? Just got back from Eagle's Nest. My fixer told me about a bounty on yourself and the witch hunter. Just so happens, he also told me you was in town. News travels fast. I was hoping we might have beaten the bounty notices. Big Mouth laughed again. It was a loud, abrasive noise that a drowning cat would have taken offense at. Notices went out on birds, Blackthorn. Every hunter between here and World's End is looking for you. Lucky for me, I'm the one that found you. Lucky? The Blackthorn rasped out his own laugh. <laughs> Seems to me you used to travel with sturdier lads. Who's that one beside you? What's your name, boy? Chuckles? Fuck you. My name's... And where's the saint? The Blackthorn interrupted the grinner. Oh, he's around. Don't you worry. Went to look for you, as it happens. The Blackthorn spat. That'd make him the lucky one, I guess. He looked down at Thankwell again. I got Big Mouth. You take chuckles. Feel free to get yourself killed. Thankwell almost spat. The Blackthorn unhooked his axe from his belt with his right hand, and a dagger appeared in the left hand. He stole a quick glance at the boss, gestured to Big Mouth, and then stalked forward. A few moments later, the two met with the all too familiar sounds of metal clashing against metal. Then, the grinner was there in front of Thankwell with his wide grin filling his face. It was an unpleasant sight, given that the man had thick, moist lips, an ugly boil jutting out from his weak chin, and blonde whiskers that sprouted from the sides of his jaw. To call him ugly would have been an insult to ugly people everywhere. He bashed his sword twice against his shield. My name is Barry. Barry the... I really don't care. Thankwell darted forward with a burst of blessing augmented speed and jabbed at the grinner with his sword. The attack was deflected with the small wooden shield. By the time the grinner had recovered from the shock, his grin was long gone, and Thankwell danced to his right and aimed a low slash at the man's legs. The grinner parried with his own sword and turned to face Thankwell. Another jab at his face, and Thankwell danced right again. He remembered his old arms master telling him the best way to defeat a foe with a shield was to make the shield useless. Always attack from the sword arm side and don't give the enemy a chance to block. It didn't take long for the grinner to figure out the tactic, and with a roar, he charged. The shield hit Thankwell square in the chest, and the man's sword came in over the top. He just managed to parry the sword as he went over backwards. The ground slammed into Thankwell's ass with a loud grunt of pain. A moment later, he was scrambling to get away as the Grinner came at him again, shield up, sword attacking around its wooden edges. Thankwell had never been too good with a sword, but he had beaten people more skilled than him before. The trick, he found, was to cheat. As the Grinner came on again, Thankwell kicked at the ground beneath him, sending a screen of dust at his ugly assailant. Ugh! What the fuck? The grinner whined. Thankwell danced to his right and jabbed. The attack was blocked, but Thankwell could see the man trying to rub at his eyes. What's your name? Thankwell shouted at the grinner. He felt the compulsion lock onto the man's will, felt the rush of heady pleasure as it subverted his will and forced him to think of nothing but the answer. Barry, the... Thankwell danced right and jabbed again. How old are you? I, I don't know. 
Again, he danced right and jabbed. Where are you from? Coral. Dance right. Jab. What's your name? Barry. Dance right. Jab. How old are you? I don't. Dance right. Jab. This time, there was no block. No parry. Thankwell's sword point sunk deep into the grinner's chest, past his ribs, and into his lung. The scream of pain turned into a coughing foam of blood, and Thankwell wasted no time. He pulled his ball-shooting device from his belt, flipped it so he was holding the barrel end, and cracked the butt down onto the grinner's skull with a burst of blessed strength. He felt, heard, and saw the man's skull crack open like a rotten egg. The grinner went down with a heavy thud and moved no more. Thick red blood oozed from the cracked, caved-in skull. Heavy drops of red dripped from the butt of the ball shooter. Thankwell stared at it for a moment, then wiped it on the grinner's clothing. Looking up, he saw the blackthorn still trading blows with Big Mouth. Neither seemed to hold an advantage. Both were attacking, blocking, parrying, and dodging away. The Blackthorn wore an ugly grin on his face, horrifically mirrored and enlarged on Big Mouth's features. Thankwell took quick aim with his ball thrower. The merchant's words came back to him. Accurate up to ten paces. He judged the two men to be fifteen paces away at the very least. Bang! Big Mouth screamed and stumbled a step as the metal ball plunged into his arm. A moment later, the Blackthorn's axe took off the lower half of his jaw in a spray of blood. Big Mouth hit the ground heavy, and Thorn buried his axe deep in the man's chest. The body twitched once and was still. The Blackthorn put one foot on the corpse and pulled his axe free, and then buried it in the man's neck once and then a second time, severing the head from the body. Thankwell walked over to Thorn and the body of the bounty hunter. The Blackthorn was bent over, staring at the corpse. As Thankwell watched, he stood up straight, spat at the lifeless Big Mouth, and kicked some dust over him. More of a burial than the bastard deserves. Thankwell almost asked how the Blackthorn had known Big Mouth, but he caught himself. Using the compulsion so much on the Grinner had left him flushed, almost euphoric. He wanted to keep using it, needed to feel the rush again. He could feel his hands shaking and buried them in the pockets of his coat. The Blackthorn was staring at him with that blank, expressionless look on his face. Good shot, he growled as he walked off. Thankwell nodded once in reply. At fifteen paces, it was blind luck he hadn't hit the Blackthorn instead of Big Mouth but the sellsword didn't need to know that. The boss limped over toward them through the dust in the road. He still held his axe in his right hand, and his left was held across his chest. His breathing looked hard, labored, and painful. Good work, the southerner wheezed at them. The blackthorn nodded. You did it, little Harry. Boy was near as strong as bones, as I heard it. The boss nodded. You ain't wrong, Thorn. We missed all the fun, Swift's voice called out across the street. Jezit strode along beside him, her face as concerned as Swift's was unconcerned, though he carried his bow, already strung in his left hand. <coughs> Where the fuck were you? The boss asked with a cough. Oh, you know. Breakfast with the magistrate. Swift grinned. You all right? Jezzet asked Thankful. He nodded once in reply. He didn't trust himself to speak, lest questions start spewing forth. Right, the boss said and looked around. Where is he? Not coming, nor any of his guards. Swift sounded as cheerful as always. You got me ma to thank for that. Seems she's got the old man by his stones. Still, reckon it might be best to get gone quicker 
rather than not. The boss coughed and near doubled over, holding his chest. When he stood back up straight, a dark grimace made his face even darker. We get ourselves to the main gate. Bones, Henry and Green can meet us there. Swift, you're leading the way from here. We'll cross the Ural first chance we get. Good? Aye? Good. There was a dull thud, and the boss went to one knee and then collapsed on the ground, among the dust. A red feathered arrow sprouted out of his broad back, just below his right shoulder blade. Thankwell was still looking for the source of the arrow when he heard Swift's bowstring thrum. Chapter 39 The Blade Master They heard the Yorl long before they could see it. Its thunder echoed across the plains for miles. Always seemed odd to Jez that water could have a sound, and there was no denying the noise of the almighty river Yorl. Its voice was as loud and as angry as all the gods combined. Four days after Bitter Springs, they reached the river. It shouldn't have taken four days, but the boss was slowing them down. At the gates of Bitter Springs, the man collapsed for the third time, so Jez had unshouldered her pack and set to treating the wound. Two of his ribs were cracked, she was certain of that. Seemed he'd taken a staff hit to the chest. That wasn't so bad in itself. Given time, cracked ribs healed. Hurt like hell, but they healed all the same. The arrow wound in his back was a different matter altogether. It was in a dangerous position, too dangerous to push through. So Jezzet had to cut it out. It had gone deep, too. And, though it hadn't hit any vital spots, the boss was getting weaker. At first, he'd seemed all right, shaken and uninjured, in pain, and in need of rest, but able to go on. They waited an hour at the gates until Bones turned up with Henry and Green appeared. Henry seemed to be caught between part anger and part fear, though Jez couldn't decide whether the little woman was angrier with the man who'd shot the boss or Jezit for patching him up. The archer was one of the bounty hunters. Thorne identified him as the saint, little Harry's big brother. No doubt he had feathered the boss to take revenge for the southerner gutting his little brother. He'd paid dearly for that vengeance. Swift's first arrow took the saint in his gut. The second went straight through his face. Again, Swift had proved he was as fast as his name suggested. About ten paces from the bridge across the Ural, Bones put the boss down. The giant has been half-carrying, half-dragging him for two days now. Strong as he is, there's a limit even to that one's strength. As if to punctuate her thought, Bones sat down next to the boss, and his eyelids drooped closed. We need to rest, Jezet said as she approached the boss, intending to have a look at his wound. Might be the dressings could do with changing. What the fuck do you know? Henry spat at her, stepping between Jez and the boss. Jez stopped and stared at the smaller woman. Henry just stared on back. There's murder in that one's eyes, Jez, even more than usual. She backed away from Henry and moved to join the Arbiter. Thankwell stood a good two paces back from the edge of the cliffside that dropped into the Ural. He was leaning forward and craning his neck to try to see over the edge. Jezet moved up beside him and gave him a very slight nudge in the back. The Arbiter near jumped out of his skin and hurried back a few more paces. You all right? she asked him, grinning. He laughed. Not any more. That is a very big river. Only half a mile across here, I'd say. This is where the Yorl is slimmest. Scared of a little water, she teased with a smile. Can't say as I blame you, the Blackthorn put in. He edged only slightly closer to the cliffside than Thankwell had. There's things in that water. Ain't right. Drowning don't strike me as a good way to go, either. 
better than burning, I reckon. But still, I could think of better ways to die. In bed, drunk, and being fucked sounds good to me. How about it, Arbiter? How would you like to die? Jezzet asked. That sounds half a threat, Jez. Truth is, I'd rather not die at all. Given the choice, though, with a bottle of wine and a woman atop me. Jezzet grinned, but it was the Blackthorn who spoke first. You know what, Arbiter? I'm starting to like the way you think. Did I ever tell any of you about the time I swam the Yarl? Swift said. He was standing right at the edge of the cliffside, staring down at the waters. Liar. No one swims the Yarl. I've seen men try, seen those same men die. I was still a boy, Swift continued, heedless that no one seemed to care. No older than Green is now. Fuck you, Swift. Green had been brooding in sullen, hostile silence ever since Bitter Springs. When he did talk, he was always confrontational, always spoiling for a fight. Jezzet didn't know why, and didn't much care to know. Walked down the river, on this very cliffside, past this very bridge. Took me near a month, and I was set upon by bandits at least five times. I killed them all, of course, but that's another story. When I made to the very start of the Ural, when the Torn and the White Waves came together, I slipped out of all my clothes, saved my undergarments. Now I could go fishing with my cock, if truth be told. But I didn't feel much like having a fish nibbling away down there. They'd have to find it first, Swift, Thorn said. Wouldn't be too hard, Blackthorn. It's the big thing attached to the giant stones. Think yours, but, well, actually, yours might not be the best of examples. Think greens, but ten times the size. So, I stripped down and plunged into the Ural. Cold water's the Ural, despite the heat round here. Cold and fast, and dangerous, but not near so fast, nor so dangerous as swift. Took me near a week to swim the length. I dived off the waterfalls, dodged around the rocks that caused the water to turn white, even had to fight off one of those bloody water lizards. Longer than bones is tall, it was, with more teeth than he has bones, and it was easily twice as angry as Henry on one of her bad days. The beast dragged me down right to the bottom of the Ural, and there we fought and wrestled it with its teeth and claws, and me with nothing but my hands. And a bloody great rock I picked off the bottom. Crushed its skull with that rock, I did, and ate well that night, I don't mind saying. Finished my swim not ten miles from this spot, just down the river. He gave a vague wave in the direction the Ural was flowing. Then I had a good two hundred foot climb on solid cliff, just like this one, afore I made it out. Girls of Bitter Springs were so impressed, I had five of them in my bed that night. Swift winked at Jezzet as he said the last. You know, said Bones as he sat still beside the boss. I half expected that one to end up with you making off with a mermaid. A mermaid? Swift mused. I like that. Reckon I can work it in for my next telling. The boss started to push himself to his feet and almost collapsed until Bones caught him and helped him the rest of the way up. His eyes were sunken, his flesh clammy, and he swayed on his feet, even with Bones there. Check the bridge, Swift. We'll follow you across. Swift looked at the bridge, then turned to Jezzet. If I should fall and die, think of me when you're with the witch hunter. Jez saw Thankful flash red, and she gave Swift a blank stare. I'd rather think of Henry. Swift grinned. Now there's a thought. With that, 
he turned and started across the bridge. For all his boasting and bravado, he went slow, testing each wooden plank before putting his weight on it. It was a good hour before Swift made it all the way across the bridge. Jez could just about make him out, waving all clear from the other side. But then, the boss didn't even look strong enough to stand, let alone walk half a mile across a swaying collection of wooden planks held together by fraying rope. Neither did he look up for giving any more orders. Bones, take the boss across, Thorn said. We'll move across in twos. After you, me and the Arbiter will cross. Then Henry and Jez. Green, you watch the rear. Come across last. You ain't in charge, Green spat. Just do it, Green, Bones said as he hefted the boss to his feet. You can piss and whinge about it on the other side. With that, he put one cautious foot on the bridge, sighed, and started across supporting the boss with one arm while holding white-knuckled onto the bridge with the other. It took them even longer than it had taken Swift, and the sun was high and hot by the time it came to Thankwell and Thorn's turn to cross. The far side of the Ural sported a forest that crept all the way to the cliffside, and the shade the trees would provide was looking more than a little tempting. I'd happily swim the Ural myself for a nap under those trees. You first. Arbiter, the Blackthorn waved at the bridge. Can I trust you at my back, I wonder? I ain't gonna stab you, and the crossing will give us some time for a chat. The Arbiter nodded and started across the bridge. The Blackthorn followed close behind. Jezet watched them go for a while, then sat down to wait. She couldn't help but notice Henry staring at her. When it came time for Jezet to cross, she hesitated. Henry strutted up to the bridge, snorted out a laugh at her, and began her crossing. Jez gave the little woman a good twenty paces head start before stepping onto the bridge. The wooden planks beneath her feet felt anything but safe, and with every step, the swaying was worse. At least there's only a slight breeze, Jez. Trying to cross this thing in anything more would be suicide. She edged along, one step, one plank of wood at a time, her hand tight on the rope, never letting go. It wasn't a wide bridge, two meters at a stretch, and here and there a plank was missing. Jezet looked down. How many people have fallen to their deaths from here? It was not a comforting thought. She considered closing her eyes as she went, but that would just make things worse. If a plank did go, she wouldn't see it. She'd just drop, opening her eyes just in time to see air rushing past her before... Stop it, Jez. Don't think about it. Just keep walking. One foot after the other. Slow is fine. Slow is good. Don't look down. Trust your footing. Keep walking. She was about halfway across when Henry stopped and turned to face her. The first thing Jez noticed was the little woman's twin daggers were drawn. A grin and a sneer both mixed on her face. She was no more than five paces away. That's far enough, whore! Henry shouted over the roar of the Ural, hundreds of feet below. Her voice sounded strained, higher than normal. What are you doing, Henry? This isn't the place for this! Jezet shouted back. What's the matter? Scared of heights? Yes, as it happens. Though far more scared of the Ural, you crazy bitch. We fight here, we're both like to die. Henry laughed, though the sound barely carried as far as Jezet. It sounded like the rushing waters were right below them. Either that, or it was Jez's heart pounding in her ears. Well, that's your choice. Turn back or fight. Jezet held no illusions. If she turned back now, Henry would cut the bridge the moment she reached the far side. It might be better that way. She'd be free from the crazy bitch, free from the crew, free from the insane job they were all determined to pull. Free from the Arbiter? 
Her sword was in her left hand, her right still attached to the rope of the bridge. Jezet hadn't realized she'd drawn her steel, but she could see her hand shaking. Why do I always shake before a fight? Henry came at her with daggers and eyes flashing. First the left, then the right. Jez parried the first, blocked the second, and gave ground, edging backwards far faster than she'd move forward. If she gets inside my reach, I'm done. Jez parried another slash and answered with one of her own, followed by a jab and another slash, her strikes dangerously close to the rope that held them both aloft. This time Henry gave ground, and with the way the bridge was swaying, even she looked worried. A gust of wind slammed into the bridge, and Jezet found herself pushed up against the rope, her right hand gripping tight, knuckles as white as bleached bone. Henry yelped and almost went over. One of her daggers fell from her hand as she clutched to the rope. Jezet watched the short bit of metal disappear down below them into the churning waters. With a scream, Henry came at her again, her dagger thrust at Jezet's chest. Jez caught the smaller blade in her own, twisted her wrist, and shoved an elbow into Henry's face. The bitch cried in pain and stumbled backward, her hand grasping for the rope. Jezet let go of the life-saving hemp, jumped to Henry's left, and slammed the smaller woman with her shoulder. With a high-pitched scream that made her sound like a small girl, Henry went over the side, hitting the rope and tumbling over. The world lurched beneath Jez's feet as the bridge gave a violent shake. The rope snapped, Jezet thought, and clutched onto the left-hand side for all her worth. And the world went black. Then it passed. The bridge went back to swaying, and Jez tried to calm her breathing. She prized her eyelids open. She saw Thorn on the far side, waving his three-fingered hand and shouting something she couldn't hear. Opposite him, Green had started across the bridge and was moving at a snail's pace. The roar of the Yorl was still all around her, crushing in from all sides. How is it coming from above as well as below? There was something else, too. A high-pitched whine. It sounded almost like crying. Jezet braved looking down. There, attached to one of the wooden planks, was a hand. Four small pink fingers clinged onto the wood for dear life. She crossed to the right-hand side of the bridge and peered over. Henry hung by one hand, the rest of her small body swinging, swaying with the wind. Fat tears rolled down her cheeks and blew away to be swallowed up by the Yorl waiting below. She was sobbing as she clutched the wood with one hand. Her eyes were wide, fear and pleading in equal measures. Please? Henry squeaked. Jez's sword still weighed heavy in her own hand. It would be so easy. One quick stab at the bitch's hand, and she would plummet down into the oral, and Jez could sleep easier at night, knowing she was less likely to wake with a knife at her throat. Jezet looked at Thorn still waving, looked at Green edging his way along the bridge, and looked at Henry swinging from one hand in empty space between the bridge and the Ural. Then she put her sword back into its scabbard and started walking to the far side. One hand still clutched at the rope, but all her fear of falling was now gone. She was too tired to be scared. By the time Jezet reached the far side of the Ural, the adrenaline had worn off, and she was shaking so much it was all she could do to stay upright. She stumbled onto solid ground and would have collapsed had Thankwell not been there to grab her arm and steady her. Jezet would like to have shrugged clear of him and stood her ground, but she wasn't sure she could, and for that she was grateful, and more the grateful for the Arbiter's support. What the hell happens out there? The Blackthorn demanded. Your crazy bitch of a friend tried to murder me, and you should all be fucking grateful I didn't murder her right back. Ask her, Jezet said, waving toward the bridge. Green had reached Henry and pulled her up, and was now half-supporting, 
half carrying her across the bridge. Thankwell helped Jezit to a shaded spot underneath a giant tree and lowered her to the ground. Thank you, she said, smiling. She started to close her eyes to take that quick nap she wanted so bad when she realized there was a man sat atop a horse nearby. The boss was lying on the ground, unconscious by the looks of him. Bones was close, looking like he didn't even know what sleep was. Swift was gone. Betram stood at the cliffside by the bridge, and the man on the horse sat there, watching them all. Who's he? she asked Thankwell. A traitor, bringing spices to Bitter Springs. On his own? Seems that way. Jezit didn't trust that. Only fools travel the wilds on their own. That would make me a fool too, I guess. The man was gray-haired, with a long gray beard, and a back as straight as a pole. His face was hard and frowning, and he wore old, stained riding leathers. His horse looked as old as he did, well-fed but tired-looking, its hair the color of dried mud. I think I'm gonna have a nap, she heard herself mutter. Thankwell shook her awake. Jezit, I need you to do something, he whispered. I need you to check the boss's wound. I need you to tell me if he's going to live. He's lasted so far, she said with an empty smile. That's a good thing. Jez, the Black Thorn doesn't think the boss is going to make it and he knows he can't hold the crew together. If the boss dies, I need their help, Jezit. Can't hurt to take a look. Jezit nodded, but she felt her eyes closing as she leaned against the rough wooden tree trunk. Her eyelids snapped open. The dim sleep that was claiming her disappeared. Her vision cleared, and the fog in her head evaporated. The Arbiter held her left hand in his own her skin tingling at his touch. He had wrapped a small piece of paper around her wrist. What? It's a charm. It won't stop you from being tired, but it will keep you awake for as long as you wear it. Please, just long enough to check his wound. Then you can sleep as long as you want. I'll watch over you. Jezet held up her hand and looked at the slip of paper. He's not wrong about the still feeling tired. Thankwell pulled her to her feet, and she leaned against him for a moment, before stumbling toward the boss. The big southerner was lying on his back, his breathing shallow, his eyes closed. Jezet waved at Bones. Take off his shirt and roll him onto his back. Bones hesitated. I need to check his wound. The giant didn't even bother struggling to his feet, but did as she told him, crawling over to the boss, lifting his thin shirt over his head, and then rolling him. Jezit pulled her dagger from her belt and cut away the bandages. The smell was the first thing that struck her. It smelled of rot. Dead and dying flesh. The wound was angry and red, with yellow pus. Oh, shit. That don't look good, Bones said. Jezit looked toward Thankwell and gave a slight shake of her head. The Blackthorn walked over, took a good long look, then he moved away, and the Arbiter went with him. They stood together, out of earshot, whispering to each other. When did those two stop wanting to kill each other? When they were finished talking, Thankwell walked over to his pack, while Thorne took up his post by the bridge. Henry and Green were almost across, though the going was slow with him supporting her as he was. Cut away the rest of the bandages, Thankwell called as he pulled out a small inkwell and a strip of paper from his pack. Jezit did as she was told. You'll need to clean it as best you can and be prepared to bandage it again. Jez handed the dagger to Bones and struggled to her feet. Her own pack with her bandages was near Thankwell's. He was already drawing a symbol onto the paper. Beads of sweat sprung onto his forehead. Will that save him? she asked. Thankwell finished writing a second symbol on the paper. He was panting, she noticed. 
He put the ink pot down and looked up at her. It will stop him from dying, he whispered, just loud enough for her to hear over the ever-present roar of the Ural. Jezit set to cleaning the boss's wound as best she could, while Thankwell approached the old trader, sitting, watching them. We need your horse. Snot for sale, the old man said, his hand straying to a small dagger on his belt. No one ever said he was buying. Swift appeared from the trees, a grin on his face that disappeared when he spied the boss's wound. Shit. Thankwell tossed a small purse at the old trader. Twenty gold. That's twenty times what the mare is worth. How many purses of gold does he have? What about my goods? Can't carry them all. Take the gold. Leave the horse in saddle. Carry what you can and count yourself lucky, old man. The Blackthorn put an end to the haggling. I'd rather keep the gold, take the horse, and leave you bleeding. Jezet poured fire wine on the boss's wound. He groaned but didn't wake, didn't move. That's not a good sign. He's as good as dead, Jez. When she was done, Thankwell knelt beside her, the small slip of paper in his hand. He laid the paper across the wound. It almost seemed to seal itself to his skin. Jezit looked at the charm around her left wrist. They can be taken off at any time. Might sting a bit, though, the Arbiter said, guessing her mind. What are you doing to him? Henry said as she sunk down to her knees, just a few paces from the cliffside. Green stalked off among the trees. Saving his life, the Arbiter lied, though he could have said they were gutting him to look for gold, and Jezet doubted Henry could stop them in her condition. The little woman was barely conscious and shaking worse than Jez. Wouldn't be here come nightfall, the old trader said as he set his first foot on the bridge. Unsavory folk use this bridge at dark. They don't come much more unsavory than us, old man, Swift said. The old trader just snorted in reply and started away. Thankwell waited until Jezid had finished with the bandaging and then took the boss under one arm and heaved him to his feet. The arbiter was whispering something under his breath all the while. Bones, help me get him onto the horse. The giant did as he was bid, though it took them both a long time and a lot of struggling until they lashed the boss onto the beast with a length of rope. Now what? the giant asked. The Blackthorn took hold of the horse's reins. We head for Hosstown, just as the boss planned. He'll be better by the time we get there. Right? Sure, Thankwell said. They started moving again, swift in front with Green, Thorn leading the horse, Bones carrying the near-unconscious Henry, and Jezet came last, leaning on the Arbiter as she walked. You promised me sleep, she said after a while. A smile played on her lips, but she lacked the energy to sustain it. You can sleep, Thankwell replied, grinning. Hop on my back. I'll carry you. She laughed, but the mirth was short-lived. How long will it last? The Arbiter let out a sigh. Three weeks, maybe. A month at best. What will happen when it stops? It's a powerful charm, but it's not a cure. It's meant to stop a wound or a disease getting worse until the afflicted can be delivered to a proper healer. So, when it stops working, he'll die. Right then, Jezet knew the Arbiter would sacrifice them all for the sake of his mission. Even her. Chapter 40 The Arbiter Long before they could see the walls of Hosstown, they entered the leagues of farmland that surrounded the capital of the province. Some grew wheat, some grew corn, and some grew odd brown tubers that had to be dug from the ground for harvesting and tasted of nothing. 
Many and more grew various types of fruit, some green, some orange, some yellow and long, others red and round. The heart of Host province was rich in farmland. Long ago, they had burned the trees to make room for such crops, and the land was protected from the great herd by the Ural. Frequent storms kept the land well watered, and in times of drought, deep wells had been dug, which fed off the underground water of the Ural. Hostown was known all over the world for its vineyards, and it produced some of the wild's best exports. The wine produced here was renowned for being sweet and dark, and full of body and flavor. Thankwell had tasted Hostown red wine before, though. If truth be told, he found that cheap wine could get you drunk just as well as the expensive kind, and he was more than happy drinking sour vinegar if it was cheaper. Or at least after a few mugs of the stuff, he was more than happy. Hostown itself was a fair size smaller than Chade. Like all towns, cities, villages, and forts in the wilds, it sported high walls thick with soldiers. These were all wearing the green on red that were the colors of House Host. Just a half mile outside the walls, Thankwell could see the telltale signs of an army. A multitude of tents, all with colored peaks, littering the landscape. Smoke from cook fires rose into the air from a hundred different places. Scout patrols rode to and from the camp, keeping watch on everything and everyone. That's a lot of men, Bones said in a hushed tone. The entire crew had become more and more hushed the closer they got to Hostown. Not just men, women too, Jezid informed them. Veterans from a dozen different sellsort companies, the Angel's Blades, Catherine and Constance's company, the Gold Caps from the far south, the Red Men from north of the Red Forest, others too. Host brought them all here and turned them all from sellswords to soldiers. His own army. The Host province is well populated, and there are always men looking to earn more money by swinging a sword. How many men? The boss asked from atop his old horse. The southerner was alive, stronger than he had been, but still weak. He walked each day for as long as possible, but rode the rest of the way. His flesh seemed to have been burned from his bones, and even talking came hard for him. Thankwell could only hope he lasted a few more days. Jezit spat. When I left, was captured... The count stood at around 18,000. Seems there might be more now, though. A lot more. 18,000 sounds a big number, the Blackthorn put in. What's he want with all them swords? Jezit laughed. He wants the wilds. He wants the old empire back, like it was in Doro's reign, before his sons split the rule into the nine-blooded families. He wants to be a king. The wilds'll bleed before they accept Host as king, Swift said. Even he seemed to smile less these days. That's the point. You don't raise an army unless you intend to use it. The army doesn't concern us, just those inside the city, Thankwell interrupted. There'll be plenty of men in there too, Arbitzer, Swift spat and lapsed back into silence. Thankwell didn't care how many men were in the city. He was only concerned with one. Gregor Host, the head of the family. He had the answers the Arbiter needed. He had to have the answers. Thankwell had crossed the Forlorn Sea and half the wilds to question the man, to find out what he knew about the traitor in the Inquisition, and know something he must, or all of it had been for nothing. The question weighed heavy on Thankwell of late. What if Host knew nothing? What if the god emperor of Sarth had sent him here chasing phantoms and wild suspicions and false information? Thankwell had gained the service of the most murderous group of sellswords he'd ever met, with the promise that after he had asked his questions, he would kill Host. But what if the man was innocent? True. Thankwell was already wanted for the murder of two of the four members of the ruling council of Chade, 
Why not add the number of the head of the richest family in the wilds? Thankwell had already resigned himself to his fate. If he returned to the Inquisition without any proof of the traitor, the very best that could happen to him was he would have his position as a wandering arbiter removed. He would, no doubt, be sent to some backwater village to live out the remainder of his days telling ignorant villagers that the old lady with no teeth was not a witch and she hadn't cursed the harvest. The worst that could happen. Well, he knew just how unforgiving the Inquisitors could be. The God Emperor had chosen him for this task because he was expendable, and right now, Thankwell was feeling very expendable. He only hoped the crew hadn't realized just how expendable they were. A group of soldiers on horses trotted up to them from the town. There were ten, and to a man they were armed with long spears and long swords and heavy wooden shields. Each wore a rounded metal cuirass and a high helm, and underneath was boiled leather. Business, said the soldier with the bent nose, heavy brow, and thick beard. None of yours, replied Henry in a sullen voice. The little woman had been quieter and even angrier since Jezid had left her hanging from the bridge that crossed the Ural. You would do well to quiet your woman before I do so myself. The soldier seemed well able to match Henry's anger, scowl for scowl. Just looking for a place to rest a few days, the boss said in a weary voice. Pick up some more supplies, then we'll be on our way. The soldier peered at the boss. You don't look so good. You ill? The boss sat as straight as possible, which was to say his shoulders stooped and he swayed in the saddle. Let's see how good you look after taking an arrow in the back. Just wounded his all. Bandits around the Ural? As you say. The soldier grunted. Stay at the feathered fool and ask old Bernard for the name of a healer. He'll point you good. The boss nodded. Reckon I might do just that. With that, the soldiers turned their horses and trotted back toward the town. The crew followed at a slower pace. Guess they don't get too many visitors, Bones said. Many and more, and then some more on top, Jezit said. Host may be a madman and a sot, but he's no fool. Keeps himself and his town well defended. Host town has never been sacked, and he doesn't intend the first time to be on his watch. Make for the feathered fool then, boss, Thorne asked. Aye. The crew were silent for a moment. Should I find us a place closer to the gates, just in case? Bones asked. I. Good. I. The boss was sagging in his saddle, his eyes half closed. It was late in the day, and his walking in the morning had taken it out of him. Either that, or the charm was losing its effect. If that was the case, Thankwell would have to hope the Blackthorn could hold the crew together for long enough to get the job done. Inside the walls, Hostown was austere. Empty wagons were leaving, full wagons arriving. Slaves hurried to and fro, all under the watchful eyes of their taskmasters, and if any so much as missed a step, the whip cracked. People gathered round a pot shop, hoping for a bowl of brown stew and a heel of bread, before going back out to the fields. Harvest time, Jezit said. The whole town will be busy, preoccupied. They stopped once to ask one of the soldiers for directions to the feathered fool. There were more than enough soldiers to choose from. It seemed like half of Host's army must be inside the town, and all of them were watching Thankwell and the crew. The innkeep seemed happy enough to see them. A jolly-looking fat man, red of face and possessing of at least three chins. His eyes were small, beady, and close-set. His nose was large and bulbous and his hair was a shaggy brown ponytail that made him look ridiculous. But he smiled, 
and ushered them all to a table. You will all want food, yes? Aye, the boss said as he sunk into a chair with a wince. And rooms. Two of them. Our rooms only sleep two people. There are eight of you. The boss was silent, so Thorne answered for him. We'll make do. Bring food, water, and whatever you've got on in drinks. We have ale? That'll do. So, what's the plan, boss? Swift asked. The boss's eyelids fluttered open, and he glanced around the room. Thankwell noticed yellowing around his eyes. It didn't seem a good sign. We'll stay here tonight. Come morning, we'll go see Host. Arbiter has the plan. The entire crew and Jezet turned to look at Thankwell. He smiled and waited for the innkeep to bring the ales. The plan would go down better with alcohol. Host will be in his mansion. His fort, Jezet corrected. We're going to walk right up to the main gate, where I will demand an audience with Host. He's not likely to turn away an arbiter. Once inside, you will create a diversion amongst the garrison, while I question Host. The table was silent. All members of the crew stared at Thankwell, some with their mugs frozen halfway to their mouths. It was Swift who broke the silence. You've never done this sort of thing before, have you? The Blackthorn was shaking his head. Your plan is suicide. Even Jezet was no help. Might be we need to think about this for a couple of days. Come up with something a little better. A little less insane, Henry put in with a scowl. Green was grinning from ear to ear. I like it. Shut up, Green, Thorn hissed. Boss? The boss lifted weary eyes from the table. Reckon it needs some work. Be better going in at night, Swift said. Under cover of darkness, nip over the walls, break in, find his rooms and slit his throat. How high are the walls? Close to a hundred feet, as I remember, Jezet said. I can climb that easy, Swift greened. Did I ever tell you about without being spotted, with patrols above and below? Thorn shook his head. What about tunnels? A sewer, like in shade. Oh, gods, please, not another sewer. Jezet winced at the mere suggestion. Might be an option, at least, Thorn continued. Worth looking into. He must leave his little fort sometimes. Bones suggested. All eyes turned to Jezid. Back when Catherine was in charge of the army, he used to tour the camp once a week. But now Constance is in charge. I couldn't say. Thankwell sighed. I need to question the man. I and we need to kill him, Swift hissed. Get me alone with him, and I'll do both. What does the Inquisition want with him, anyway? The Blackthorn asked. Thankwell held his tongue. He wasn't about to tell the group of sellswords that the Inquisition might have a traitor in its midst. What about poison? Bones said. You said he likes to drink. The argument continued for near on an hour. Swift claimed he could put an arrow through Host's eye from a thousand yards. They all knew it for a lie, yet he claimed it anyway. Bones suggested they pass themselves as a group of entertainers to gain entrance to the fort. Henry championed calling the whole thing off and was shot down when Green reminded them of the substantial reward for the job. Thankwell contented himself with listening and praying that the boss would recover enough to put an end to the bickering and come up with some sort of plan. Back on the plains, when they'd talked alone, he claimed he was good with plans, claimed he could figure out a way inside and out again without raising suspicion. Now, the man seemed uninterested. Or, more to the point, he seemed incapable of following all the talk. 
The argument ended when a score of soldiers entered the inn. They filtered into the common room and made no move to sit. The Blackthorn hissed at all the others to stay quiet. Abbot Adakot, said the soldier with the captain's badge on his arm. The crew fell silent. Yes, Thankwell responded, his voice cracking a little. Lord Host wishes to see you. Twenty soldiers, or near as didn't matter, all well armed and veterans by the looks of them. Thankwell doubted he could fight his way free, even if the crew helped him. What about us? Green asked. Bones cuffed him into silence. You're all to come with us. The boss stirred from his chair, as if seeing all the soldiers for the first time. His voice was weak, strained. What's this about? Not my place to say. Do you need our weapons? Green asked. Again, the giant cuffed him. The captain smiled. That won't be necessary. The lordship just wants to talk. Thankwell stood first, Jezet following and then the rest of the crew. The boss struggled to his feet with Bones helping him. All of them made sure their hands did not stray too close to their weapons. None wanted to fight their way clear here. Outside, another score of soldiers waited for them, bringing their escort up to forty men. It would seem Lord Host was not taking any chances. The captain instructed them to follow him, and the rest of his men fell in around Thankwell, Jezet, and the boss's crew. They were penned in on all sides, and even if they wanted to cut their way free, they would have no hope against so many. The Blackthorn walked close to Thankwell and whispered as they went, They knew your name, Abita. Don't reckon that's a good thing. Just so long as it gets me face to face with Host, Thankwell whispered back. Aye. The sun was dipping below the walls of the town as they made their way through the streets. Even so, there were plenty of people about to stop and watch the strange procession. Children were out in force. Ever bolder than adults, some of the little ones even took to marching next to the soldiers mimicking the men. Others danced about, asking, What they done? Or, They for hanging? Can we watch? The only member of the crew who did not look nervous was the boss, though, Thankwell reflected, that was because the man looked to be a walking corpse, with one wasted arm over Bones' stooped shoulders for support. Captain? Jezet called out. Could you tell me, is Constance back in the city? The captain glanced back at her with a cruel smile. Dead I got back not three days ago. After that, Jezet fell silent, brooding. It didn't take long for them to reach Host's fort in the center of his town. Sheer gray walls rose out of the ground, and Thankwell decided Jezet might have been shy when she guessed at a hundred feet. He could see faces peering down at him from the battlements high above and the round towers either side of the gate had ten arrow slits apiece. The gate boasted an iron portcullis, currently raised to allow their entry, and an iron-bound wooden gate on the other side also open. Inside, they found themselves in a huge courtyard that looked as though it could accommodate a thousand soldiers. Their escort of just forty men seemed small by comparison. Host's mansion stood in front of them, once, it may have seemed grand, but after Lord Sho's estate in Chade and the Imperial Palace in Sarth, Thankwell thought it looked a stunted, drab building. He had expected more from the most powerful blooded family in the wilds. The captain turned to face Thankwell. If you'll come with me, please, Abita. His tone made it clear that he was to escort Thankwell alone from here on. Thankwell hesitated. Of course. Jezit, will you accompany me? The captain narrowed his eyes. The rest of your men will stay here. They are welcome to enjoy the hospitality of our barracks. We have food and ale. Two of my favorite words, Swift said with none of his usual grin. Got a whore or two in there and all, 
and I may have to kiss you. The captain eyed Swift for a moment, then grunted and turned to march toward the mansion. The Blackthorn caught Thankwell's arm before he could follow and pulled him close to whisper in his ear. Do your job, Abia. We'll do ours. Thankwell nodded once and followed the captain into the mansion, with Jezet just a step behind. Chapter 41 The Blackthorn An old grizzled sergeant with long gray hair that merged with his short gray beard led them to the barracks mess hall. Groups of soldiers were seated all around, eating and drinking, jesting and laughing, gaming and gambling. Some looked up and gave them a queer look as they entered, but most didn't even spare the crew a glance. It was a good sign as far as the Blackthorn was concerned. Drunk soldiers may be more rowdy, but they were also less useful if it boiled down to a fight. Though, looking at the odds, six against sixty did not fill him with confidence, no matter how drunk the sixty. The sergeant waved them to a free table and watched as they all took seats. The boss slumped into his, and his eyes sagged closed. "'Your southerner don't look so good,' the old sergeant said. He had good teeth, missing one of his canines, but all mostly white, and not too many gaps. Arrow wound. In back. The boss managed to say, though his voice was thick and slurred. Bandits? There are a lot of them around the Ural these days, despite your fancy army camped outside, Swift put in. How long you been working for us, old man? Near four years. Used to soldier for the Sun's Sun's Free Company out of Tauros. Weren't a lot of us, maybe three hundred in a good year. But Lord Horst bought us and said we could join him for good and all, and get paid and fed, and have a home in Hostown. Captain Bart said we'd rather be free men than soldiers. The captain didn't wake up next morning. Been Lord Host's ever since. Looks like you've seen your fair share of battle. The old veteran laughed. Reckon I've seen at least ten's fair share of battles. Somehow managed to come out of all of them unhurt. Bless the gods. Which gods? Betram asked. Any that care to listen, lad. There's plenty of food, and help yourselves to ale. It's coming up to Harvest Festival time, and Lord Host is always free with the ale round now. The sergeant walked off to talk with some other soldiers and was soon sat down, supping at a drink of his own. This would be about the time the boss would tell them all to be careful, not to get themselves good and drunk. But the boss didn't seem to be in much of a condition to tell them anything. Bedram decided he should shoulder that burden himself. One ale apiece. Ain't worth getting drunk. Might be we're needed for that distraction the Arbiter wanted. He whispered. Henry snorted. Seems to me this situation has gone from hopeless to shitstorm. Look around you, Thorn. She hissed. We're surrounded by host soldiers. The Arbiter and his whore are gone. And the boss... I say... We cut our losses and get the fuck out of here. Betram couldn't say he didn't agree, if truth be told. No, the boss growled through gritted teeth. We stick to the plan. What plan? That seemed to confuse the boss. The Arbiter's plan. He'll do his part and we'll all walk away. With a million bits. Betram didn't know what a million was. It sure sounded like a lot of bits, though. Worth a little risk to his life. Though this seemed like more than a little risk. Truth was, something was nagging at the back of Betram's mind. Something about the mess hall didn't seem right. He looked around, staring at each table in turn, watching the folk drinking, laughing. It all seemed... quiet. Betram had been a sellsword for the better half of his life, 
and if there was one thing he'd learned, it was that put a group of men together with ale, and things tended to turn loud and messy. Here, there were plenty of men, and the ale was free and plentiful, but the mood was somber. Soldiers supped at their cups, talking in hushed voices. Every one of them was still armed and armored. Then his eyes fell on the captain. He wasn't sure when the man had returned from escorting the arbiter, but he stood by the entrance to the mess hall and watched the crew with icy eyes. He was just about to warn the rest of the crew when a giant stopped by the table. The big man had short, black hair, a squashed, brutish face with a heavy brow, a bulbous nose and a ruddy glow to his cheeks. His arms and chest strained against his doublet. Well, stand up then. Let's have a proper look at you. The giant spluttered at Bones. Bones pushed the chair away from the table and stood up. He and the giant stood as tall as each other, but Bones was still stooped. Betram guessed the bone-loving giant had a good four inches on the ruddy-cheeked giant. Well, fuck me with a rusted spear. The boys were right. You are bigger than me, the ruddy-faced giant turned and shouted across the room. You were right, lads. He's a damn bit bigger than me. Bones looked right uncomfortable, yet the other giant took no notice. Never met another giant as big as me before, Ruddy Face continued. Let alone one bigger. Your father must have been a bear. <laughs> as Ruddy Face laughed, a few nearby tables joined in with him. Bones wasn't fooled. Big man though he may be, he was not so stupid as many folk took him for. My ma weren't no weird. She didn't lie with bears. The smile dropped from the ruddy-faced giant's mouth. Was only a joke, big man. How about a friendly contest of strength? An arm wrestle? Hell no. I mean a real test of strength. A good old-fashioned rope pull. Two men, ten foot of rope, and a line between them. First one to be pulled across the line loses. What's the point? Bones asked. To prove which of us is stronger. Bones shrugged. Can't say I care. The boss struggled to his feet, keeping both arms on the table to steady himself. Seems to me it might make for a welcome distraction. Bones nodded. Aye. All right, then. Good, Ruddy Face said. Your lads can come cheer you on. Your lady, too. Henry snorted and spat. It wouldn't have surprised Betram if that was the first time she'd ever been called a lady, and she didn't look too pleased about it. It didn't take long once they were outside for Betram to notice the change. Before, the yard had been mostly empty, save for a fair number of soldiers milling about doing very little. Now, the yard was mostly empty, save for the same fair number of soldiers, all pointing crossbows at the crew. It was a fairly obvious change, and a none too welcome one. Reckon we might have been sold out, said Swift, his voice as low and dangerous as a wolf's growl. The captain with the icy eyes walked out behind them. Take their weapons, he ordered his men. None of the crew made any move to resist, and they took everything. They even patted Betram down and took the hidden blades he kept in his coat. Most of them, anyways. Afterward, the captain stood facing them, his face a cold stone mask. The boss swayed on his feet to Betram's left. Henry seethed on hers to his right. Which one of you is the Blackthorn? The captain asked in his quiet voice. Before Betram could answer, Green stepped forward. That one, there! The lad pointed at Betram. Good. 
the captain continued. We'll send him back to Chade. The rest of you will be hanged once his lordship gives the order. When do I get my reward? Green asked. You sold us out? Bones asked. Sent word we was coming back in Bitter Springs. Cost all my coin for a bird. But it's like Thorn is always saying. Folk don't last long in this game. Actually, it's boys like you that don't last long in this game. Fuck you, Thorn. Looks like I'll be around long after you've gone, eh? So, when... The back of the captain's left hand took Green full in the face, and the boy went down spitting teeth and coughing blood. Betram always found it amazing how much damage a gauntlet could do to a face. A deep gash had torn the lad's cheek right open, and Green screamed. Silence him, the captain said in his quiet voice. His cold blue eyes swept over the rest of the crew as the ruddy-faced giant picked the screaming Green up and delivered a thunderous punch to the lad's gut that drove all the wind out of him and left him gasping. Don't reckon you should start screaming again, the giant said. For the best, if you just stay quiet. His lordship will decide just what kind of reward you deserve. Bind their hands, sergeant. The old, gray-haired, gray-bearded man moved to obey, apologizing even as he tied rope around their wrists. Then the captain smiled. His lordship will be done with your witch hunter soon enough. Then he will sentence you. Chapter 42 The Blade Master As far as halls went, it wasn't a bad one. Jezet was sure it could fit a small house inside. Wooden floors all polished and slippery, paintings on the walls, one of Host himself, if Jezet remembered what he looked like. More candles than was necessary to light a room three times the size, and all were lit, seemed to give the room a thick atmosphere. One large table dominated the center of the hall. It was long enough to seat thirty folk, yet at the moment it only had four chairs. One for me, one for Thankwill, one for Host, and one for Constance. Does he mean to feed us to death? There was, as of yet, no food on the table, but it was all set out with plates and cutlery for four people. Maybe he means to poison us. Jez thought Host was more than capable of such deception, but Constance... Constance would want to kill Jezet with her own hands. The captain escorted them to the room, instructed them to wait, and departed. Since then, Jezet and Thankwell had been alone in the room, and for all those five minutes, neither had spoken. The Arbiter took a seat at the table and seemed content just to wait. Jezet did not feel so relaxed. She paced, she muttered, she loosened her sword in its scabbard, she made an entire circuit of the room and glared at each painting in turn. She considered smashing a very old, very expensive-looking vase. She stopped and stared into the large empty fireplace, walked to each of the windows in turn, and looked out at the short drop to the ground below. Constance wouldn't balk at following her out of these windows. Jez, I need you to do something for me, Thankwell said from his seat at the table. He was looking at her with those pretty blue eyes of his. I, last time you asked me to do something for you, it ended with you turning the boss into a walking, talking corpse. Well, actually, he does very little of either these days, but he still looks very corpse-like. I need you to make Constance angry. My breathing makes her angry. Then breathe a lot. I want her to attack you. Why? Why don't I just attack her? Jezet asked. She fully expected Constance to try to kill her on sight. They're less likely to call for more guards if she attacks you. After that, 
Feel free to kill her. Thankful was sporting that thoughtful, far-away look he sometimes got. Strange, but it made Jessit want to smile. While you question Host? I. What about the guards? she asked. I'll deal with the guards. Jezit sighed and sank down into the chair next to him. Truth was, he looked tired and more than a little nervous. Reckon you look any better, Jez? Thankwell, what is this all about? I mean, why are we here? The Arbiter winced and ran a hand through his dark oak hair. It was getting long, almost down to his shoulders. He looks better with short hair. Not here, Jez. I promise you, if we both survive, I'll tell you everything. That seemed to be about all the answer he was willing to give at the moment. So, Jezit turned her attention to the table and decided to wait. There was a fork missing from the spot at the head of the table, she noticed. Some poor servant would receive a whipping for that. There were plenty of spoons, though. Ever killed anyone with a spoon, Arbiter? she asked. Thankwell only laughed in reply. The two big doors at the far end of the room swung open, and a man in servant's garb scuttled through. Lord Gregor Host, Lord of Hosttown, and head of the family Host, Victor of Sefley's Point, Short Hill, Mooson, and Baskville, Warden of the Yarl, and Rightful King of the Wilds. Rightful King of the Wilds? That one's new. The man who swept into the room was just as Jezet remembered. Tall, handsome, short-cropped auburn hair with a little more gray in it now. His face had sharp features that some would call hard and cold, but Jezet had seen the man laugh and smile, and she knew better. He wore a simple shirt of green on red, along with similar trousers. No sword hung from his belt, only a large purse. Still carrying around a small fortune of bits, Host. As if being moneyed makes you better than everyone else. Arbitra Thankful Darkheart, Host said in a merry tone. I've been expecting you. That made the Arbiter pause. For a moment, he looked lost. Jezit saw Thankwell glance around the room before finding his tongue. Lord Host, on behalf of the Inquisition, I am pleased to make your acquaintance. Of course, Host dismissed the Arbiter's comment with a wave of his hand. Jezit Verlern, it has been a long time. You look well, of sorts. Constance strode in just behind her master. As much a giant as ever, she stood at close to seven feet and was as muscled as the boss. Her face had long, awkward features that Jez compared to a donkey on more than one occasion, and her hair was the color of dirty straw, tied back on top of her head in a tight tail. She wore mail on top of boiled leather and a heavy longsword on her left hip, with an equally heavy short sword on her right. Constance's left eye, glazed and white, glared at Jezet unseeing. Her right eye held all the fury of a particularly violent storm. Whore! Constance spat. Why is everyone calling me a whore these days? I've only ever taken money for sex once and it was a long time ago. Even then, it was only because the bastard was so bad at it, I felt like I needed some compensation. Catherine? Jezit said with an easy smile. Oh, sorry, Constance. You two are so much alike these days, now that you're the one bending over for Host. Tell me, Constance, does he make you squeal like he did her? She never... Constance roared, her hand on her sword hilt. Host held up a hand. Constance, 
Jazet is our guest. No fighting over dinner, please. If we are ready, I'll have the first course brought out. He waved to the servant, and Constance backed away a step. Really? Jezet goaded. Catherine would have never backed down so easy. But then, she always did have a set of stones on her. Shame, she didn't have a cock to go with them, or you two could have. Fuck you! Constance? Host warned. We talked about this. Why the hell am I goading this giant with a thirst for vengeance into a fight? Jezet glanced at the Arbiter. For him? Constance saw the glance, and an ugly grin managed to make her ugly face somehow uglier. Didn't take long to find another man to fill your hole, Jezet. At least Eirik was a man, and not a witch hunter. Jezet almost laughed. Catherine had tried for years to correct Constance's speech, but whenever the big woman got angry, her accent slipped back into the common drawl of the wilds. It seemed Host had just as little luck. I am most sorry about this, Arbiter. Inevitably, if you put two women in a room, they either fight like cocks or cluck like hens. The Arbiter laughed, though Jezet could see his eyes remained cold and hard. So very true, Lord Host. Though, women do have their uses. Host laughed. Very true, very true. How are you finding our Jezit? Droan always said she was most pleasing. Jezit might have flushed red if she had any pride left. But it had all been beaten out of her long ago. Didn't seem to stop the burning anger from building up inside. Of course Droan talked about you, Jez. The blooded folk may all be at war, but at their fancy parties it's all civilized. Host continued. He used to say he'd never known a more wet or willing cat. Lord Host, Thankwell interrupted, and Jezet could have kissed him for that. I know how it is you knew I was coming. I'm afraid I had no time to send you a message. After the events in Chade, I don't doubt you would have been pressed for time. What with the escaping and all? Ah, yes, the first course, fried giraffe. Have you ever tried fried giraffe, Arbiter? I must confess, I do not know what a giraffe is. Ha! An Arbiter confessing! Brilliant! Big beast, long neck, spots, horns. Host sounded as if he were talking to some child ignorant of the world. Thankwell shook his head in reply. I suppose you don't have them over in your holy empire. Got yourself a walking, talking, living god, but not a single giraffe. I'd prefer the beast any day. The tongue is a delicacy, but I told the cook not to waste it. Never seen a giraffe. Ha <laughs> In all her life, Jezet had never met a man who loved the sound of his own voice quite like Host. So. You knew we were coming, Thankwell prompted. Of course I did. You may not have had time to let me know of your arrival, yet one of your hirelings did. I forget which one. Sent a bird from Bitter Springs. That wasn't good. If someone told Host they were coming, it was almost certain they had told him why as well. Jezet watched as Host plucked a strip of fried giraffe and popped it into his mouth. He even chews with that smug smile. Jezet noticed something was off. There were no guards in the room. Aside from the servant who announced the lord and brought the food, only Constance was there to guard Host. Somehow, she did not think that bode well. Still, it was time for Jezet to play her part. 
Catherine once told me you weren't really sisters. Constance's eye never left Jez, and she could see the woman's jaw clenching. Host looked intrigued. Can't say I was surprised. Catherine was shorter, slighter, and very pretty, while you... Well, that scar I gave you marks an improvement. Bitch! was Constance's only reply. She was as drunk as a fish when she told me, to be certain, but she said she found you in Salantis, rooting around with the rest of the garbage. She was with the bold men at the time, I think. Jezet looked at Host. Old Merc Company, used to operate out of Salantis. Catherine kept you as her pet. Bitch! I reckon you didn't know this bit, did you, Host? Jezet continued. Your mighty General Catherine used to be a slave. Shut up, whore! The captain of the bold men brought her in chade as a nubile girl, virgin and unflowered. For six years she followed him around in chains to fuck him whenever he wanted. When Catherine found Constance, she took her in. What was it they used to call you? Catherine told me once, but I forget. Shut up! Constance had gone bright red. You see, the feared dead eye used to just be some slave whore's freakish pet, begging for scraps off her master's table. I hope you get what you need from him, Arbiter. Only thing that's changed since is now the slave whore is dead. With a roar that was all fury and hatred, Constance pushed back her chair, sprang onto the table, and leapt at Jezet, her sword flashing from her scabbard into her hand. Jezet tipped her own chair back and rolled ass overhead as it hit the floor. She heard a crash and flowed to her feet, her own sword already in shaky hand. The chair she had been sat in was no more than splinters. Somewhere, Jez could hear Host shouting, but neither she nor the big woman paid it any mind. Constance came at her swinging. Jezet blocked, stumbled away, and blocked again. By all the gods, I've forgotten how freakishly strong she is! She parried a stab and sent one back. Constance spun away on nimble feet that belied her size, and she was attacking again. Jezet found herself giving ground, blocking and parrying, dodging and evading, but not attacking. The Arbiter wanted time alone with Host, and she was determined to give it to him. She was close to the wall now, Constance reining in blows from the front. The servant, standing just a few feet behind, cowered in terror. Jezet grabbed hold of one of the expensive-looking vases next to her and flung it at Constance's head. The big woman slashed it out of the air, and it shattered, shards raining down on her. All the time I need. Jez spun around and was running by the time she heard the first shard of vase hit the floor. She laid open the servant's throat with a single slash and barreled into the doorway he had brought the food from, slamming it open with her shoulder. She kept running, knowing full well Constance would be just a few feet behind, and all the fury of the hells came with her. Chapter 43 The Arbiter Women, Host said after Jezid and Constance had smashed their way out of the hall. Thankwell could still hear the clashing of metal on metal. Neither man moved, both still sitting at the table, though Thankwell had edged his chair away from the chaos. Host himself looked unperturbed by his giant of a general attacking Jezid. Honestly, I had a feeling it might end this way. Constance is useful, a seasoned military leader, but she has a fire in her where our lovely Jezet is concerned. You knew we were coming, Thankwell said, as Host popped his last strip of fried giraffe into his mouth and started chewing. You know why I'm here. It wasn't a question. Well, of course I do, Arbiter, though I must admit I'm curious as to how you managed to make her talk. 
I assumed she would be immune to your compulsion. Thankwell tried his best to hide his confusion. He had no idea what this man was talking about, and it did not bode well that Host knew about the compulsion. Nor do I understand how you knew the language. I thought it would be quite beyond an arbiter of your experience. But there you have it. We can't be right about everything, can we? Host leaned back in his chair and yawned. You can come in now, darling. The double doors swung open, and a woman walked through them. A woman Thankwell knew all too well. She was clad better now, tight riding leathers where before she had worn rags. She was cleaner also, her hair and skin washed. It was easy to see now that she resembled Host, though younger and more feminine. The lack of chains were a concern. Thankwell would far prefer her to still be in chains. He didn't hesitate. Thankwell pulled the ball thrower from his belt, aimed and pulled the trigger. Bang! The merchant had said accurate up to ten paces. This was more like twenty, and the shot went well wide, splintering the doorframe. The woman looked at where the small pellet had hit, saw the slight yellow glow of the blessed bullet fading away, and then turned to Thankwell with a cruel smile. He was already reloading. A pistol! Host said with a clap of his hands. Wonderful! Where did you get that? Chade, Thankwell answered, as he finished popping the ball back into the barrel, then shoved it back into his belt and stood, drawing his sword instead. The woman walked forward and stopped behind Host's chair. She carried no weapon, but he knew how dangerous she was. You've met my daughter, Arbiter. In a cell, where they had her chained to a wall, after they had already killed her twice and scooped out her eyes. Thankwell was tense. He had not planned for this. What did you do to her, Host? The head of the Host family laughed, while his daughter, standing behind him, stared on through cold, dead eyes. The compulsion! Very good! It's been a while since I've felt it. I must say... Yours is particularly weak. Thankwell backed away a step and tried again. What is she? Again, Host laughed. When he stopped, his voice was as hard and harsh as Thankwell's own. I am not a mindless simpleton. I am Gregor Host. Your pathetic compulsion will not work on me, Arbiter. He turned to his daughter standing behind him. Kill him! The woman came toward him, skipping from one foot to the other in a strange, jinking dance. Then she hissed something in an alien tongue, and the air rushed toward Thankwell with a scream. The blast knocked him off his feet, and he found himself rolling on the polished wooden floor. The woman was coming at him fast, her only weapons her hands each finger sporting a sharp-looking claw. Thankwell raised his sword to block the first attack. The noise as her claws connected with his sword sounded like metal screeching against metal. He spun out of reach, whispering blessings of strength and speed, and slashed with his sword at her head. She danced away from him, and then back in with another swipe with her right hand. He blocked again, and she stepped in close. As Thankwell fell away, she tore at him with her left hand. He could feel blood running down his arm, and the pain was agony. It felt as though the wound burned and froze at the same time. Thankwell clutched at his left arm around the wound and cried out. He scrambled backwards, pushing with his feet and glad that the floor was so well polished. The woman danced toward him again, more slowly this time, as if she were savoring the moment. Strong, isn't she? he heard Host say. And only the first of many. I intend to make an army of them. Thankwell realized he was no longer holding his sword. He'd dropped it when she clawed his arm, and now the woman was between him and the blade. He reached into his coat pocket 
and pulled out a small slip of paper. The good thing about an arbiter coat was many hidden pockets, and Thankwell knew what each one contained by heart. He flung the piece of paper at the woman and she clawed it away. Thankwell curled into a ball just in time as the air exploded. His ears were still ringing as he regained his feet. The air hung heavy with smoke, and there were scorch marks on the floor. The woman was a good ten feet away, whining and writhing in pain. Her face and arms were charred, blackened ruins. Her leathers were burned, and in places, still on fire. As Thankwell advanced on her, he had to say, she now looked like a pathetic figure, wriggling on the ground, struggling to breathe through scorched lungs. The teachers at the Inquisition always warned about using ruin explosions. There was always the chance you would breathe in the flames. Thankwell stopped by the pathetic creature on the floor, pulled his pistol from his belt once more, and pulled the trigger. Bang! The glowing bullet smashed through her skull. The body convulsed once, twice, and then stopped. A spreading pool of blood ran along the gleaming wooden floor. Thankwell hated the smell of burning flesh. I don't think she'll be coming back from the dead this time. I wrapped a purging rune around the bullet. Whatever she was, it's gone now. When Thankwell looked at Host, he fell off his chair and scrambled away. The Arbiter turned away to collect his fallen sword. I never was very good at swordplay, but the teachers at the Inquisition said I more than made up for it with my skill with magic. Runes, charms, blessing and curses are my spe- Host! Stop! Too late. Thankwell turned back to find the terrified lord pulling a number of wooden chips from his purse. He was snapping them and throwing them to the floor. Thankwell counted ten, and he recognized them right away. They were summoning runes. Already the room was starting to grow colder, darker. Already the first shade was beginning to form. Chapter 44 The Blackthorn The captain waited, his back straight and cold eyes watchful. The rest of his troops were not so diligent. Some drifted into groups and began to talk. Some slipped back into the mess hall, no doubt for some ale. Some stood around yawning and rubbing at their sleepy eyes. The old gray sergeant was chatting and laughing with bones before ten minutes had passed. The giant was well known for being an amiable bastard, even with his hands bound, it seemed. Betram glanced to his right. The boss was swaying, eyes half-closed. Boss! Betram hissed. No answer. Boss, on the off chance any of us get out of this, who hired us? The big southerner didn't give any acknowledgement of having heard. Boss! Betram hissed again. Mores. This came from the other side of Betram, from Henry. Captain Drake Morris. Betram wasn't sure why he asked. It wasn't like there was any other Morris it could have been. He just didn't want to believe it was true. I... Oh, boss. You made a deal with the damn devil. Captain Drake Morris was a dangerous name not to know, and an even more dangerous name to know. Betram had heard all the stories. Morass had drowned as a child and come back part demon. He was a pirate who had sailed on every sea in the world and tamed them all. He'd sailed through storms with waves thousands of feet high, and he charmed a kraken into working for him. Morass owned half of Chade. It was rumored he owned some city in Acanthia, and he was in the guild there to boot. He slipped his way into the dragon empress's bed, and that was no easy feat, given it was guarded by a bloody dragon. But those weren't even the bad stories. He raped boys and girls alike, and slit their throats after to bathe in their blood so as to keep himself young. Once, when one of his crew members made to mutiny, Morris had starved the man almost to death, 
then gelded him and served him his own cock and balls, told the man what it was and all, and watched him as he ate. After, he put in close to port, close enough to swim, chopped the man's arms and legs off, threw him into the sea, and told him to swim. There were rumors he once... Bang! The noise wasn't as loud as Betram had heard it before. Muffled, maybe, or far away. The captain didn't look nervous. If anything, he looked a little smug. That'll be the end of your witch hunter now. Won't be long before you all join him, the captain said in a tone as icy as his eyes. Betram spat and scratched at his cheek, the unburnt one. Seemed a bit of stubble was growing through. That would need shaving. I've been the end of a few arbiters myself. Six, Henry put in with her usual sneer. As she says, Betram continued. Been the end of six arbiters, and that did not sound like one ending. There was a flicker of doubt across the captain's face. He glanced away and then back again. Might as well have just come right out and said he was unsure. Betram decided to push. Thing about Arbiters is the magic. They got all sorts of spells and shit. Betram glanced at the boss and found himself a bit nervous his own self. The boss was as good as gone back at the Ural. It was only the Arbiter's charm keeping the black-skinned leader of the crew alive, and the witch hunter had said it could stop working at any time. I saw one turn someone into a frog once, Henry said with a nod. Her face so serious, Betram almost laughed. Would have laughed, given how ridiculous it was. But for the situation didn't call for laughter. I? The Blackthorn asked, trying to tell Henry to shut up with his eyes alone. I? I? Betram turned back to the captain and took a step forward. The captain took a step back. So, do you still reckon that sound was the end of our witch hunter? Boom! That was not the sound that the Arbiter's little stringless crossbow made. It was louder and different. Less like a thunderclap and more like a rock slide. The captain's eyes were far less icy now. There was fear there. Fear was good. Fear made folk stupid. Betram laughed his hard, rasping laugh right in the captain's face. <laughs> Reckon it might be time you started seeking alternative employment, Captain. Might want to think about letting us go and all, before our witch hunter finishes up in there. Sergeant, take four men and go check on his lordship. Sergeant, take four men and go check on his lordship, the captain commanded in a somewhat shaky voice. The old gray sergeant didn't much seem to like that idea. Bang! Bugger that, captain! You go check on him! I gave you an order, sergeant! The sergeant was backing away, shaking his head. Betram could hear sobbing and figured it was green. Dumb fuck had probably fallen on his ass and was scrambling away from the conflict while crying. Them obbies, they burn ya. Ain't no way to die burning, said the sergeant. Betram felt cold, and either he was going mad, or the lanterns were dimming, and he could hear a strange rattling noise. Sounded a bit like chains. What the fuck is that? Henry said her voice cracking just a little. A shadow began to form in the light of the yard. At first, it seemed just a floating patch of darkness, out of place in the flickering yellow light of the lanterns. But soon, it seemed as if the shadow had arms and legs. Horrible spiky limbs ended in savage claws and formed of darkness even blacker than the boss's skin. The air seemed to shimmer where it stood, and the ground froze beneath it. Then its head formed out of the darkness, near as big as its body. It sported two great horns of darkness from its crown, 
and its mouth was a jagged line in its face, a piercing white light showing between the gaps of its teeth, each one as big as a hand. Finally, its eyes opened. Two bright yellow flames amidst a sea of darkness. Hungry flames. The shade looked nothing human. It stood as tall as bones without the stoop. Its legs were squat things, too small for the long, thin body. Its arms were too long, reaching almost down to the ground. Its head was the worst, at least three or four feet long, Betram guessed. And that was before the horns. It stuck out from the body on a short, thin neck. All over, the creature seemed to be covered in spikes formed from shadow, impossible to look at. Each seemed to move and drift around the creature's body. The first man to die was the bravest of them all, or maybe the most stupid. A big soldier, heavy with muscle and with long hair flowing past his shoulder, thrust a spear at the shade. As the spear point connected, there was an awful screaming noise, like metal grating against metal, and the shaft of the spear exploded into splinters. The man died where he stood. With one casual backhand, the shade turned his shouting face into a mess of bone and torn flesh, and spurting blood with deep, three ridges ripped from his skull. The lifeless body dropped with a heavy thud, and chaos broke loose. Some men ran at the shade, others away. Some just stood there with slack-mouthed shock on their faces. Someone somewhere was screaming, the loudest scream Betram had ever heard, and so full of pain it set his teeth on edge. There were more shades forming out of the darkness. Betram didn't bother to count how many. He was finding it hard to think further than the steaming of his own breath in the air. Plan? Boss? Bones asked. The boss was no help. He dropped to his knees, his eyes closed. Betram couldn't even tell if the man was breathing. Might be time for some of that legendary strength of yours, Bones. Get those ropes off. Betram was rubbing his wrists raw, trying to slide a hand free from the ropes. So far, the crew had been left out of the chaos. A battle was raging around them. Soldiers teaming together to stab and slash at the shades, others running for the gate, trying to get away, and the crew stood in a sea of calm, watching it all happening and taking no part. Bones grunted, growled, and strained against the ropes holding his hands together, his face a bright red color from the effort. Then Swift was there with a tiny knife, cutting the bonds. Old Swift ain't never properly disarmed the lad said with a grin. Betram thought back to Bitter Springs, to Swift's sister producing a knife from somewhere, despite being naked as her name day. Then his hands were free. Betram gave his wrists a quick rub and walked over to the nearest weapon he could see, a discarded sword. Not an axe, but it'll do the job, I reckon. What do we do, boss? Henry asked, shaking the big man. Boss? Betram stalked past her. Someone, somewhere, was still screaming. He found Green on his knees in the dirt, staring all around him with the stink of fear coming off him. Either that, or he'd shit himself. The captain had done a real job on his face. Green's left cheek was laid open. Betram could see teeth through the wound. Farrell. Green gurgled. Eh? This is... Sans... What? This is... Thorn buried the sword in Green's neck. Didn't take the head off with one swing, though. The blade stuck about halfway through. Hit the bone, he reckoned. Still, Green was just as dead. Betram put a boot on the boy's chest and wrenched the steel free with a gush of red blood. I fucking hate swords. Betram spat at Green's corpse and finished the decapitation. By the time he turned back to the chaos, the crew had joined the fight. But on which side, Betram couldn't rightly say. 
Bones had found himself a bloody greatsword from somewhere and was laying about himself. Two soldiers were dead close by already, and four more surrounded him. Swift found his way up onto the wall somehow and was busy dueling with the captain while more soldiers tried to work their way behind him. Henry had a dirk in one hand and was shaking the boss's shoulder with the other, screaming in his ear. As Betram watched, the old gray sergeant who had fought in more battles than ten men walked up behind Henry and shouted something at her. Henry spun and buried her little blade in the man's chest once, twice, and then slit his throat for good measure. All around him, men were dying, fleeing, begging for their lives. The shades didn't even seem to feel the kiss of steel, almost like their skin was made of harder stuff. Betram watched as one shade, standing just five feet tall, caught hold of a sword and snapped the blade in two with just one clawed hand. The soldier who had been wielding it turned to run too late. The shade tore the man's back out, breastplate, cloth, flesh and all. One of the creatures was no more than two feet tall. It looked like some sort of manic, black imp. It dodged attacks, slashed at legs, and tore into soldiers who could no longer stand. Betram saw it leap at a man and cling to his face, tearing into the soldier with claw and tooth, until the body was a twitching mess. The first shade that had appeared was finished with its attackers. All the brave soldiers were either dead or fled, bodies on the ground, and so much blood. It began to lumber toward Henry and the boss. Betram guessed something like that didn't need to move too fast. Henry screamed something at it, but Betram didn't hear what. The Blackthorn was scared of no man, but right now, the Blackthorn couldn't seem to make his feet move. Henry flung her little dirk at the creature and screamed at it again. The shade just kept on walking. At ten feet away, Henry started to back off, trying to pull the boss with her. The big man just knelt there, staring at the shade. That's when Betram realized the boss's eyes were open again. At five feet, Henry let go of the leader of the crew and fell backwards, scrambling away on her ass. Betram watched it all from where he stood. Bones was backed into a corner by a group of soldiers with spears. He was roaring and swinging that big sword of his, but there were too many of them. Swift was still up on the wall. The captain was nowhere to be seen, but the half-blooded bastard was holding his sword and limping backward as one of the shades advanced on him. The shade in front of the boss, calmly, almost tenderly, reached out and took hold of the big man by the throat, its giant black hand wrapping all the way around the boss's thick neck. Slowly, the shade lifted the boss up so his feet were off the ground and his face was level with the creature's giant head. Then, it opened its mouth, wider and wider and wider, so wide the boss's head fit inside. Henry was silent, watching with wide-eyed horror as the shade bit down. The boss didn't scream. His whole body jerked, but he didn't make a sound as the creature's teeth cut through his flesh and bone from the bottom of his chin to the crown of his head, and blood gushed down to hit the ground below. When it was done, the shade just dropped the boss's limp, lifeless body. The big man who had led them for years looked almost whole, except the front half of his head was just missing. The Blackthorn had seen some nasty stuff in his time. He'd done a lot of it himself. But right now, he felt like he needed to throw up. Then the shade turned toward Henry. The crazy bitch was frozen on the floor, staring at the corpse of the boss. Betram put one foot in front of the other, and then another. Before he knew what he was doing, he found himself just a stone's throw from the shade and shouting, Fuck's sake, Henry! Run! He screamed at her. The shade turned to look at him, eyes blazing yellow in its huge, dark face. Betram could feel hot water trickling down his face. He spat. The Blackthorn wouldn't go crying to his own death. Henry! 
Get the fuck up and run! Now! The shade took a step toward Betram, then stopped and turned to look at Henry as she scrambled to her feet. The Blackthorn let out a heavy sigh. Shit. Then he charged the shade. Chapter 45 The Arbiter Go back to the void! Thankwell hissed. The demon seemed to smile. We obey. With that, it faded back into nothing. Thankwell turned his attention to Host. What? How did you? Scooping up one of the discarded runes from the floor, Thankwell advanced on the cowering lord. The creatures of the void are bound by ancient magic to serve the Inquisition. This! He threw the broken rune in Host's face, and the man let out a squeak of fear. Is an incomplete rune! Thankwell grabbed hold of Host, spun him around and shoved him down onto the fancy dining table, sending plates and goblets scattering. There he held him. A true transcription of summoning requires three runes. Your poor imitation was missing the rune of binding. Do you know what that means? Host shook his head. His eyes were as wide as the dinner plates now lying on the floor. It means the demons you summoned will not obey you. Do you hear the shouts? The sound of battle outside. They are killing your own men. Thankwell pulled Host off the table and slammed him back down again. She, she never told me. She said, tell me what you did to your daughter. What was she? Some clarity seemed to enter Host's eyes, and he shut his mouth, stared at Thankwell with defiance. The sounds of battle were loud outside. Host might have done the Arbiter a favor by summoning the demons. Thankwell just had to hope the chaos they caused would last long enough. Thing about the Inquisition is, Lord Host, we didn't always have the compulsion as a means of making people talk. Back in the old days, a thousand years ago, we had to rely on other methods. While we don't generally employ such methods anymore, we are required to learn them all the same. Just in case. Thankwell picked up a small silver knife, lying forgotten on the table, and stabbed it into Host's left thigh, just below the groin. The lord screamed. Blood began to well up around the small blade. The man struggled, trying to fight his way off the table and away from the Arbiter, but Thankwell was stronger and had a blessing of strength he could chant if need be. The wounded lord collapsed back onto the table, and a low whine escaped his lips. What did you do to your daughter, Lord Host? What was she? Thankwell repeated. Still, the Lord of Hosttown remained silent, refusing to answer. Thankwell reached into one of the hidden pockets in his coat and pulled out a slip of paper with a sleepless charm transcribed onto it. He slapped the charm on Host's arm. What are you? Thankwell held the man down with one hand and placed the other on his forehead. Then he began to whisper a blessing. Host screamed louder than Thankwell had ever heard anyone scream before. Even burning folk didn't scream so loud. He thrashed and he clawed. He even tried to punch at the Arbiter, but Thankwell held him fast. When he released the blessing, Host was sobbing. Blessings and curses can be used on others, Lord Host, even those unwilling. That was a blessing to augment your senses. Your leg must have felt like it was being ripped apart. Thankwell picked up another silver knife off the table and stabbed it hard into Host's right leg. Again the man screamed, but not near as loud as when Thankwell took hold of his head again and whispered the blessing. Tell me! Thankwell shouted at him when he released the blessing. The lord of the most powerful family in the wilds smelled of sweat and blood and piss, and lay there sobbing on his own dining table. I can do this for days, Host. Keep you alive and torture you. 
you'll not fall unconscious with that charm on you. You will feel everything a hundred times worse with the blessing. Thankwell reached for another knife, came up with a fork. No! Stop, please! What was she, host? Thankwell hissed, the fork in his hand hovering, ready to strike. A demon! He sobbed. A creature from the void! She told me how to do it! How to put a demon inside a person? Host nodded, another great sob escaping from his lips. Tears and sweat ran down his face in shivers. She said it would only work on those with potential. So I did it to her. Gave my daughter the gift. Gift? Of immortality. I made her strong, beautiful. Host laughed, a sad noise, and mixed with pain. And you killed her. Thankful spat. You killed her, Host. I just sent the demon wearing the body back to where it belongs. Who taught you how to do it? Who taught you how to put a demon inside a person? Host was shaking his head, his eyes wide and fearful. I... I don't... know. This time, the fork went through Host's left palm, straight through the flesh into the wood below, pinning his hand to the table. Again he screamed. Thankwell took hold of his head and whispered the blessing, then twisted the knife in Host's leg. The scream became a guttural, raw sound, almost inhuman. It filled Thankwell's ears, made him sick to the stomach, but he continued chanting, continued until Host no longer had the strength to resist. He no longer had the strength to scream. Who is it, Host? Who is the traitor to the Inquisition? Host sobbed and coughed, his throat no doubt raw from the screaming. From the way he smelled, Thankwell guessed the man had soiled himself, and blood was dripping down on the floor. If he didn't get the answers he needed soon, the man might die of blood loss before confessing. Who is it? Host! Thankwell screamed at the man. I don't know! The man shouted back. I never, never met her. She sent someone, someone else to me. A man, an arbiter. K Kessick, arbiter Kessick. Thankwell didn't know an arbiter Kessick, though that didn't mean much. He knew very few arbiters, if truth be told. It gave him a lead, at least. If the traitor was an inquisitor as the god emperor suspected, then she could only be one of two, Inquisitor Heron or Inquisitor Down. If this Arbiter Kessick was the traitor's creature, Thankwell would only have to find the man and follow him. It seemed an easy task when he thought of it that way. Somehow, Thankwell didn't think it would work out so easy a job. Host was still sobbing, lying slack on the table. Thankwell leaned in close to the man. Anything else? Lord Host. The man shook his head, still crying. Then his eyes flicked open, looked at Thankwell, and then away. Last chance, my lord, Thankwell said, donning a crew smile that he didn't feel. What aren't you telling me? The contract, Host said. What contract? I don't know. Not really. Something I overheard. Kessick, he... he was talking to one of the demons. Said something about her contract. That's it. It's all I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The man was growing weak. Pale. Too much blood loss, Thankwell guessed. He started alternating between sobbing and apologizing and coughing up blood. The Arbiter judged he had learned all he would from the man, and reached for another knife to finish the job. All he could find was a silver spoon. By the time Thankwell reached the yard, he felt like he needed to throw up. That and spend the next few days blind drunk. 
He'd passed two soldiers on his way from Host's dining hall, and both had backed away and stared at him in mute horror. It wasn't surprising, considering he was smeared with Lord Host's blood. Outside was the chaos he had predicted writ in full. The demons Lord Host had summoned had made easy work of the garrison by the looks of things. Dead men littered the floor, bodies and bits of bodies, blood and mud, weapons and armor, much of it broken. Of the living, the yard was almost deserted. Only one man and one demon remained. The rest, Thankwell presumed, had fled. The demons would be in the town by now, causing as much slaughter and chaos there as they had here. The Blackthorn was facing a demon a good foot taller than him, with eyes of flame, and a head as large as an elephant's. As Thankwell watched, Thorn ducked inside the demon's reach, clattered two sword slashes off the creature's impervious hide, and then danced backwards, blocking a swipe as he did. The force of the attack sent the Blackthorn stumbling, and as he came up, he grabbed a handful of mud and flung it at the creature. The demon laughed, a harsh, cold sound that reminded Thankwell of a peal of thunder. Of the rest of the crew, there was no sign. Although a near headless body on the ground close by could have been the boss. Thorn darted in toward the demon again, and his battered, notched sword bounced off the creature's head. Why won't you just fucking die? The Blackthorn shouted at the demon. Thankel strode forward. Just as the creature was about to attack, he called out to it. Demon! Go back to the void! It stopped mid-swing, glanced at Thankwell and started to fade. We obey. The Blackthorn stood, staring at where the demon had just been a moment before. Then he turned to Thankwell. It was hard to say what expression that burned face held, but he guessed it was confusion. Arbitza? Thorn said. How the fuck? I'm a witch hunter. Thankwell said with a forced smile. I banish evil. It's what we do. Huh. The crew? Thankwell prompted. Dead, I think. Green in the boss. Swift in bones, I think, too. Henry? Henry? The Blackthorn spun around, looking for the little woman. But she was nowhere to be seen. Might be she made it out with the rest. Jez? Damn, Abia. I thought she were with you. Thankwell looked around the yard, looked at the bodies, at the blood. Then he looked toward the mansion. We wait, he decided. She'll be here. The Blackthorn didn't look too happy about that. What about the rest of them shades? They'll fade. In time. They can't stay in our world for long. But ain't they out in the city? With all them town folk? Thankwell just nodded. The Blackthorn spat. Poor bastards. Thankwell heard a scared whinny. Thorn, can you ride? Chapter 46 the Blade Master. Jez ducked a high slash and danced away. Constance came on strong, hot on her heels and swinging her sword in wild arcs, not caring if it bit into the walls or paintings, windows or servants. Again, Jezit dodged away, and again Constance followed. Doesn't she ever tire? In truth, the giant woman didn't even look to be breathing hard. If I'm intending to wear her out, I may be here all night. Jez blocked, parried, dodged, then dodged, blocked, and parried, all on the defensive. She made no move to attack. The end of the corridor was close behind her. She blocked a high slash, then a low slash, and shouldered her way through the door. Constance's heavy sword bit into the doorframe, splintering wood and causing her to pause for a moment and wrench it free. She was exposed as she would ever be. Jezet backed further into the room. 
She was in a kitchen now. The heat was oppressive and the smells were strong. Fresh bread, roasting meat, pig by the smell of it, exotic spices, something smelled of vanilla. Most days, those smells would have had her mouth watering, but now they just made her want to spit. Frightened cooks scattered from the kitchen via alternate doors. One started sneaking up behind Jez with a cleaver. She saw his reflection in a pan of soup and was about to turn around and gut him when Constance shouted, Touch her and die! She roared. The cook startled, dropped the cleaver, and ran. Want me all for yourself, Constance? I always knew you loved me. Constance roared again and swung her sword. The soup pot flew toward Jez, spraying boiling hot broth everywhere. Jezit scrambled out of the way and then ducked another two-handed swing of the giant's sword. I could have stuck her in the gut right then. Jezit vaulted onto a wooden counter and then dropped off the other side just as the sword sliced down behind her, cutting both a loaf of warm bread and the wooden counter in two. As Constance cursed and struggled to pull her sword free of the wooden wreckage, Jezet grabbed an empty iron pan and flung it at the woman's head. The warlord swatted it out of the air with one giant paw, but the next one caught her in the face. She stumbled backwards, cursing and spitting blood. Jez backed away again, found another door and shouldered through it just as Constance recovered and came charging. Another slash blocked, another jab parried, and all the while, the Blade Master just kept giving ground, backing further and further away, staying out of the giant's reach. They were now in some sort of dining hall, with crude wood benches and tables and bodies. Lots of bodies. Servants and a few soldiers by the looks of things, some pretty cut up. All this Jez took in while keeping Constance from cutting her in half. The big woman didn't even seem to notice the carnage around them, until she stepped on a dismembered arm, glanced down, kicked the bloody limb aside, and came at Jezet again. Stop running away, whore! Constance shouted as Jez dodged backward yet again. Stop calling me a whore, you giant freakish cunt-eating bitch! Insults are wasted breath. Blades speak louder than words her old dead master's voice whispered in her ear. Why did you do it, Jez? Constance asked, her sword pausing in front of her, her chest rising and falling as she sucked in air. She was your friend! Jezet snorted. Here in the wilds, Constance, there's no such thing as friends. Just people ain't turned on you yet. Catherine knew that better than most. Better than you. Hells, she taught it to me. Liar! You really think she was a saint, don't you? Jez laughed. Catherine's the one that turned on me! Liar! And with that, the fight was on again. Jez blocked a slash to her right, ducked the next one, and then span away from the big woman's downward swipe. Up a bench, and Jez mounted a table, parried Constance's sword thrust, and jumped down the other side. The giant's sword bit a chunk out of the cheap wood, and she wrenched her sword free and followed Jezet over the table. Twenty feet behind and to my left, another door. Jezet turned her back to the door and started backing toward it, blocking as she went. How do you think Drowan's men found me, Constance? What? The giant roared. When they took me. I'd slipped out of the camp to find myself a tavern and get drunk. And you think Drowan's men just happened upon me and knew who I was? Liar! Catherine told them I was there. She wanted me gone. Drowan used to brag about it all the time when he fucked me. Used to love to tell me it was my own best friend who sold me out. She would never. Why would she? Constance's next swing near split a table in half, and the follow-up would have taken Jez's arm off if she had been but a drop slower. Because she didn't need me anymore. Once she was in charge of Host's armies, I was more of a threat than a friend, so she gave me to our enemies, hoping they would kill me. 
But they didn't kill ya. Jez reached the door, kicked it open, and backed through it. They appeared to be on a landing. To her left, the corridor seemed to stretch on forever. Jezet glimpsed a dark shadow that way but ignored it. To her right, there were some stairs down. She turned her back in the direction of the stairs and concentrated on the giant's sword. No, Constance, they didn't kill me. It suited Droan to keep me instead. Tied up for his amusement whenever he wanted to put his cock in something or beaten whenever he got angry. For three months! Jezet screamed at Constance. For three months I was beaten, raped, and humiliated every day. So tell me again how Catherine was my friend. Lying whore! Constance spat as she swung her sword. You killed her! They were at the stairs down now. Jez caught the giant's sword on her own and stepped sideways. The big woman turned with her. Constance's back was to the stairs. Jezet planted a foot in the woman's stomach, and then she was falling away. Constance hit the stairs with a solid crack and a cry of pain, and then rolled the rest of the way down to a series of grunts and groans. Jezet started walking down the stairs. Steep stairs, Jez. I wouldn't want to fall. I didn't have a choice, Constance. When Drouan got bored with me, he started threatening to give me to his men, to his whole fucking army. Then came Host's stupid bloody challenge, and Drouan had a better idea. Constance was struggling to her feet at the bottom of the stairs. Her left arm was hanging limp, looked broken. Her face was bloodied, and she was leaning on her sword. She should never... The giant spat out some blood. She should never have fought you. Jez laughed. She should never have fought. Catherine was good with a sword, no doubt. One of the best natural fighters I've ever seen. But she was never trained. Droan had at least ten men in his camp that could have cut her to pieces. But he deemed it would be best if I did it. Constance swung a clumsy one-handed slash at Jezid. She stepped aside and started circling the giant. He made a deal with me there and then said if I killed Catherine, if I cut her up and humiliated her in the challenge, he'd give me my freedom. Just let me go. If I refused, he'd give me to his army and make sure I died from it. You're lying! Again, the giant made a clumsy swing, and again, Jezit stepped out of the way. After you killed her! Constance looked to be crying from her good eye. You were still with Joan. That made Jezet pause. Yes, he gave me my freedom, and I stayed with him. And hated myself for it, I should have killed him. The big woman dropped to one knee, still leaning on her sword. She was panting, clearly in a lot of pain, and shaking like a leaf in a storm. So, why tell me? You know I won't stop. I will kill you, whore. Jezet nodded. I know you won't stop, Constance. Her sword flashed out and took the giant in the face. Constance fell to the floor, screaming, clutching at her right eye with her unbroken arm. Jezet's blade had given her a mirror of the scar she had from the day of the challenge, the day Catherine died the day Jezet made herself a lifelong enemy. The giant screamed as she writhed on the floor, blood welling up from between her fingers. I told you that, Constance, because I want it done with, Jezet said, her voice sounding quiet and sad to her ears. I want that part of my life over, done with, laid to rest. Goodbye, Constance. Jezet thrust her sword into Constance's chest, between the ribs, into the heart. The big woman gasped, twitched once, twice, and then relaxed into death. On her way back to the front of the building, Jezet found a number of bodies. Servants, maids, soldiers, 
even a couple of folk who looked blooded, all dead and torn to shreds. When she found the door they had entered through, she could see the yard was even worse than inside the mansion. Jez had seen fewer bodies on a battlefield. Corpses were strewn everywhere, and where there weren't any dead people, there was blood from one. She almost stepped on a head as she exited the body and after a moment realized it belonged to Green. Half of one of his cheeks was missing, but it was him, or at least it had been. Two men stood in the center of the yard with three horses. Thankwell and the Blackthorn were arguing by the sounds of it, but neither of them had weapons drawn, though Thorn was poking the Arbiter in the chest and pointing off toward the town. Thankwell was shaking his head in reply. Jezzet approached. Hell of a distraction, Thorn. Not to mention an impressive feat, slaughtering an entire garrison. Huh? Both men turned toward her at once. Thankwell smiled, and the Blackthorn's face twitched into what Jez figured was a grin. Oh, this. Thorn looked around the yard. Weren't me, it were Host. Though, I'll most likely get the blame for it. Are you? Thankwell asked. Jez smiled. I'm all right. Did you? I did. Thorn spat. Did what? Constance is dead. I? So is Host. Tell her, Arbiter. Thankwell winced. I killed him with a spoon. The Blackthorn rasped out a laugh, and Jezet couldn't help but join in. Couldn't have happened to a more deserving bastard. Horses? she asked. The big brown one was staring at her with dull eyes. It took a step toward her and started nuzzling at her hand. Witch hunter's idea, Thorn said. Reckons we need to make a quick getaway. Reckon he might be right. Jezet nodded. What about the others? I saw Green, or, well, his head, but... We're it. Ain't no others. Well, I'll miss Bones, at least. Truth was, she might even miss Swift. Full of shit the bastard might be, but Jez had come to like his stories. She swung herself onto the horse and settled down into the saddle. Thankwell looked comfortable enough, but the Blackthorn kept fidgeting, like someone had just tried to stick something up his ass. It was near full dark, and the moon was high and bright, and lanterns lit the town along the streets. They weren't the only people about. There were folk all over the roads, all looking like they were heading for the town gate. Jezet spied a few bodies here and there, not to mention she could hear screams off in the distance. What the hell happened here? Jezet asked as they rode. Thankwell sighed. It's not our concern. The Blackthorn growled. I reckon I might get blamed for that too, though. Chapter 47 The Arbiter It was two nights after Hostown when Jezet asked the question, by then, it had already felt like they'd been riding forever. Thankwell's rear alternated between numb and painful, and it looked as though the others were faring even worse. The Blackthorn grumbled and moaned with every bounce. Thankwell had tried to tell him to move with the horse, but more than once, the sellsword had complained of, Crushing my stones. Jez was more silent about the pain, but he could see her wincing. They stopped from time to time, to water the horses and let them graze for a while. Nobody had remarked on their leaving Hostown, so many of its residents were fleeing the chaos that the soldiers had been too hard-pressed and confused to pay attention to three riders among a thousand. None of the three knew the area as well as Swift, but making it to the forest that bordered the Yorl had been easy enough. From here, they needed to find a safe crossing and then ride south until they reached Chade. With such a diminished party, the watches were harder at night as well. Each of them had to take a turn watching over the others and making sure they were not ambushed. 
It felt queer to trust the Blackthorn to keep him safe as he slept, but Thankwell couldn't say he had much of a choice, and so far, Thorn had proved himself true. You said you'd explained it all if we both survived, Jezet said, just as Thankwell had been contemplating sleep. There was no fire. They would not risk it in the forest with tales of bandits what they were, but all three were sat in a circle among a copse of trees. Thankwell had his back to one, the Blackthorn leaned against another, standing watch and listening. Jezet was sitting cross-legged on the mossy green ground, staring at the Arbiter. I did. Thankwell glanced back at the Blackthorn, unsure of how much the truth he was willing to tell, with the sellsword listening in. There is a traitor in the Inquisition, Thankwell started. From there, he told them both almost everything. He explained about how he was sent to Chade to deal with a witch in jail, about how his true goal had been to find and question Host in connection with the traitor. He told them about what Host had said, that the traitor was an inquisitor, a woman, and that she had at least one accomplice. He told them about how Host had been trying to implant demons from the void into human bodies, and that he feared the traitor might be doing the same to Arbiters. He left out only that the demons were bound to the Inquisition, sworn to serve, and that the God Emperor had been the one to send him on this mission. By the end of the telling, Thankwell found his jaw ached from talking. Jezet refused to meet his eyes, and the Blackthorn were staring at him with a look that might have been respect. So, what's your plan now, Arbiter? Jezet asked. The way Thankwell saw it, he had only one option available to him. I'm headed for Chade. There, I'll take a boat back to Sarth. Find Arbiter Kessick. Follow him to the Inquisitor that has betrayed us, and kill them both. The Blackthorn snorted. You really gotta work on these plans of yours, Arbiter. Why not just tell the rest of your Inquisitors about Kessick? Have them torture the truth out of him. Thankwell winced. I don't know who I can trust. If Kessick gets word that they're coming for him, he'll either turn up dead or fled, and then I'm back to having nothing. I need him to lead me to the real traitor. Do that then, Thorne said. Find out who it is, and tell the Inquisitors which one of them is all bad and naughty. I can't just go accusing arbiters and inquisitors of heresy without proof, Blackthorn. Why not? Thankwell had to stop himself from sighing. I'm not exactly well-liked in the Inquisition. They'd probably just try me for heresy instead. Most of them already believe I'm guilty. Why? asked Jezzet. It doesn't matter. The last thing Thankwell wanted to talk about right now was his history or his family. Thankwell shrugged out of his arbiter coat and started rolling the brown leather into a tight ball, as it would go before shoving it into his pack. It's too dangerous for me to be walking around as an arbiter at the moment. Here, in Chade, in Sof. It was strange, but he felt naked without his coat. I need your help, Thankwell said. Both of you. I... You need my help to do what? Thorn asked. To do what you do best, Blackthorn. Kill Arbiters. The sellsword laughed. Thankwell was becoming almost used to the harsh rasping noise by now. <laughs> no. Um. Somehow that was not the answer Thankwell had expected. Jezid had yet to say anything. She just sat there in silence. Killing you bastards is a risky business, and I ain't got no reason to walk into your midst and risk my life like that. Strikes me i done far too much risk in my neck recently, and for fuck all in the way of reward. What if I offer you a pardon? Eh? If you help me do this, I'll make sure the Inquisition stop chasing you, Thorn. You'll never have to see an Arbiter again. Never have to worry when the next one might catch up with you. That seemed to pique his interest. 
You could do that. Thought you said they don't much like you. Thankwell grinned. Accusing the Inquisitor of heresy and convincing them the Blackthorn isn't the heretic they think he is are two different things. Help me, Thorn, and I'll get you your pardon. You'll never have to see me or another Arbiter again. I'll see you're paid as well. Two hundred gold coins in South Currency. More than enough for you to buy passage anywhere you might want to go and get set up there. Earn a pardon by killing Arbiters. Thorn laughed again. Ha <laughs> I'm in. As Thankwell opened his mouth to ask Jezet, she spoke first. I'm in. I want the same deal as Thorn. Two hundred gold bits, and no arbiters following me after we're done. Done. Might be. We need to come up with a real plan this time, the Blackthorn said with a grin. Jezet nodded. She was staring at Thankwell. You almost look like a normal person without that coat on. Part 4 Two's Company Chapter 48 The Blackthorn At least they were moving again. That was something, Betram reckoned, but not very fast. When they'd hopped on the boat from Chade, it seemed it might be a quick journey. Strong winds, the captain said. Wouldn't surprise me if we made the trip in three weeks. So far, they'd been at sea for six weeks, and two of those had been sitting becalmed. Fact was, Betram wasn't sure he liked the idea of arriving at Sarth any better than being stuck at sea. The seat of the Inquisition was no place for a man like him. All those witch hunters walking around looking for folk to burn, looking for the Blackthorn. For the first three weeks of his time at sea, Betram had become fast friends with the railings, leaning over and retching even when he had nothing in his stomach. He'd only been out on the open ocean twice before in his life. First, when he left his home and sailed to the Five Kingdoms to spend an entire winter freezing his stones off, and the second, when he'd sailed from the Five Kingdoms to the wilds, where he'd spent more than a decade murdering folk for money and avoiding witch hunters. Now he was sailing back to Sarth, back to the kingdom of his birth, and he was not well pleased. The crew seemed a likable enough sort. In between his retching, Betram had made friends with a few of them. One such sailor, a man the rest called Ollie the Nose, on account of his massive hawk-like bill, had taken him to the bow and shoved a bottle of rum into his hand. The sailors called the rum Widow's Bounty, and it was close to black in color and stronger than any spirit Betram had ever tasted. Soon after, his retching stopped, and Betram settled into a drunken stupor for the remainder of the voyage. He counted himself lucky that the ship carried a more than healthy supply of the fiery rum. The rest of the crew took to Betram as well. They would drink and gamble and tell tales of women from every port. It seemed not a one of them had made the connection with Thorn, the drunken seasick bastard with dark red hair and a burned face, and the Blackthorn, a murderous sellsword on the run from the Inquisition, with a reputation darker than the rum they were drinking. They'd been chased twice by ships that the captain reckoned were pirates, but neither had been able to keep pace with the Blue Gull, even with only a slight breeze. They hadn't run across a single monster from the deep either, though the Arbiter insisted they existed and roamed the waters. Betram was inclined to agree. He'd heard stories of giant creatures with eight arms, all with watery suckers that could pull a man's face off, hulking leviathans that could smash a ship to pieces with one flick of their tails. And the less said about the krakens, the better. At times, Betram could swear he'd seen giant fish swimming below the surface of the deep blue, keeping easy pace with the boat. He pointed out to the nose, the shapes sliding through the water. The man had laughed and said they were Sethwith, trained pets of merfolk that followed ships, waiting for any man who fell overboard so they could steal away the poor fellow to mate endlessly beneath the waves with mermaids. Betram wasn't sure he believed in merfolk, but he was damn sure 
He wasn't about to take a dip to find out. There was a thud from the deck behind Betram, and he turned to find the Arbiter sitting on the wood again, rubbing yet another bruise from his sword arm. The Blackthorn laughed, and a few of the sailors close by joined in. Ain't the point. You're supposed to be getting better. Uh, thank you. It wasn't the first time. Betram had almost slipped up and called him by his title, and he was certain it wouldn't be the last. Truth was, even without his coat, the man was a witch hunter through and through. With a sigh and a glare in Betram's direction, the Arbiter picked himself off the deck, collected his sword, and made ready for another beating. Jezit Velern stood on the balls of her feet, watching, waiting with sword in hand and eyes focused. They'd been practicing every day since they set foot on the ship. Blunted swords meant the Arbiter didn't sustain any mortal wounds, but Betram would have put money on him being black and blue under those leathers, though at least he never complained. At first, the sailors had jeered and mocked the Arbiter for losing to a woman. Some suggested they could show her how a real man uses a sword. One went so far as to make a grab for her breasts. Jez had broken the man's nose twisted his arm, and very nearly threw him overboard before the captain roared his interruption. After that, he decreed any man who tried to lay a hand on her would get five lashes, and, if she wanted, Jezet would be the one to swing the whip. The grin on her face said she'd be more than happy to do so. The swords clashed, filling the air with the sweet song of metal on metal. The Arbiter was pushing the attack, driving Jezet backwards. She blocked and parried, dodged, and sometimes lashed out with her own blade. When the witch hunter was doing well, she would call out encouragement, give him advice about movement and foot placement, when he should attack high or low, when to strike hard, and when to faint. When the witch hunter was making mistakes, she would beat him with her own sword, disarm him, and then tell him where he went wrong while giving him stern looks. All three of them shared a cabin, though Betram rarely set foot in the room, and only then to retrieve something from his pack. The rest of the time, he preferred to spend up on deck, staring out at the sea with rum in his hand and in his stomach. The few times it had rained, he went below deck and sat with the crew. He still had dreams about that night in Hostown. Some men might call them nightmares, but the Blackthorn weren't the type of person to be unmanned by memories. All the same, it still made his spine shiver when he thought about how the shade had bit through the boss's face, at how the boss hadn't even screamed or shouted. Betram had witnessed all sorts of carnage in his time, but at Hostown, what those shades had done to folk, and the way the Arbiter had just ordered the creature to vanish. Betram took another swig of Widow's Bounty and sat back against the railing with his head swimming. The sky was bright blue. The sun was baking hot. There was only a single cloud in the sky, and the wind was a nice, gentle breeze. Just enough to move the ship, but not enough to stir the sea into chaos. If he forgot about the endless blue water below him and all the hidden dangers it held, he was quite content. Not to mention, that he hadn't had to kill anyone for somewhere close to seven weeks. Betram wasn't sure how many days that was, numbers never being his strong point, but he reckoned it was some sort of record for him. The Arbiter hit the deck again, shaking his wrist. Jezid had twisted his sword from his grip with a simple flick of the wrist. It was a trick she liked to use, and one he fell for every time. Betram laughed and raised the bottle of rum to the Arbiter in salute, before taking another gulp. You laugh, Thorn, but I don't see you stepping up to give Jez a challenge, said the Arbiter from the deck. Jezit shot the witch under that stern look she used when he'd done wrong. Get up and collect your sword, Thankwill, else you won't be able to defend yourself when I attack. I ain't so stupid as to fight with Jezit Valerne. Doubt she'd go as easy on me as she does you. <laughs> Betram slurred with a raspy chuckle. You call this going easy? 
Well, you still ain't got your sword, and she hasn't started hitting you yet, so... <laughs> yeah. Truth was, the Arbiter was getting better, and that had something to do with Jezet having all the patience in the world. Problem was, all the time in the world wasn't about to turn the Witch Hunter into a swordsman. Some people just didn't have the feel for it, and he was one of those folk. The Nose swaggered over and sat down next to Betram, took the bottle from him, and gulped down a mouthful. By the sea! You go through this stuff faster than any man I've ever known. Aye, tastes like shit and burns like fire. Better that than go back to retching. Got the truth of it there, I reckon, Thorn. The song of metal clashing against metal started up again. Do those two do anything but fight and fuck? Jezet caught the Arbiter's sword on her own stepped into him and twisted herself so that he was flipped onto his back by her hip. Then she shot an acidic glare at Betram and the nose. I reckon she might have heard your nose. Aye, the nose said with a grin. I reckon so. Sorry, Miss Vern. Didn't mean nothing by it. Knew a lass like you in a port once. Land's End it was. In Five Kingdoms. Don't remember her name, but when she weren't fucking, she was practicing launching knives at folk. Used to be able to skewer a thrown apple at twenty paces. Cost a pretty penny, but she was worth it. The things she could do with... You're comparing me to a whore? Jesset asked. Thankwell was still lying on the deck, grinning like a fool. The nose was looking worried, and Betram couldn't care less. The talk of whores had reminded him of Rose. Might be the rum, but Betram was finding it hard to remember what she looked like, what she smelled like, what she felt like. He remembered she made his cock feel right good, and that she was the most beautiful woman he'd ever been inside. Not a hard boast, to be sure, but everything else was fading. Thinking of Swift's sister made his mind tumble onto thinking about Swift, how the two had kissed, and then she'd refused to kiss the Blackthorn after. She'd said something, too, something about their mother, but he couldn't remember it. Fact was, bastard though he was, Betram kind of missed Swift. The man always had a story to tell, lies for the most part, to be sure, but he made them fun all the same. Betram missed Bones as well. The big man had been as close to a friend as he'd ever had, and saved his life more than once. He didn't see the giant fall in Hosstown, too focused on saving Henry from the shade to pay attention to anything else. But by the time he was finished, Bones was gone. Swift too, and Henry all three of them dead or fled, and as Betram had seen no sign of them on the road, he was leaning toward thinking it was the former. He missed Henry most of all. Ever since the murderous crazy bitch had stabbed him, they'd been friends, though Betram couldn't say why. He even missed the boss. Betram could see the big black southerner standing there now, swaying from side to side with eyes open and full of sadness as the darkness reached for him, took him by the neck, and lifted him off the ground. Those great black jaws opened so wide, it seemed they would swallow him whole. Instead, they closed around his head, slicing through flesh and bone as though it were butter. Blood gushed and flowed, and the boss's lifeless, faceless body dropped to the floor like a sack of meat it was. Thorn? Betram's eyes flicked open and he glanced around. The nose was gone. Jezid and the Arbiter were still there, but neither were holding swords. The captain stood with them on the bow, pointing at something. He was a well-groomed man, was the captain, dressed in vivid finery with dark brown eyes and an impossibly square jaw beneath a trimmed beard. He held his back so straight it looked like it hurt, and his hand was never far from his sword hilt. 
Thorn. Thorn, said the Arbiter. If you're not too pickled, might you want to come and see this? Aye, Betram said as he pushed himself to his feet. Took him two attempts, but he made it. I'm coming, you bastard witch. Uh, which one of you said that? The witch hunter glared at him. Betram shrugged as he stepped up beside him. What? I can't help it if there's three of you. He went to put an arm on the arbiter's shoulder to steady himself and caught hold of nothing. He found himself on his knees, staring at the deck. Then there was a hand underneath his arm lifting him upward. You're too damn strong for such a scrawny bastard, Betram slurred into the arbiter's face. Good thing about being drunk, he decided, was that you could get away with almost anything. What am I looking at? What? the captain said in a thick accent. Betram squinted in the direction the man pointed. All he could see was blue. Blue sea, blue sky, some darker line on the horizon, maybe. The coast of Sarf. We make port in Sarf tomorrow. About damn time. Sober up, Thorn, the Arbiter said. Last thing I want to be, when I step foot in Sarf, is sober. Shame, that. The Arbiter took Betram by the arm and led him away, Jezet following close behind. Because the last thing we need is you drunk as a fish. They didn't take him to the cabin, but instead led him to the mess, a small room consisting of a couple tables, each with a couple of benches, and all nailed to the floor. The cook stood in the corner, stirring a pot of something that smelled at once delicious and disgusting. The witch hunter pushed the blackthorn onto a bench. Seemed he should be taking offense to a man being handled as such. But Betram couldn't quite work up the bother. We make port tomorrow if all is well, the arbiter said to the cook. We need him sober. No rum. Aye, the cook said with a scowl. No rum. Betram watched three arbiters and three jesuits leave, and turned to the three cooks, all of whom were eyeing him. Got any rum? Chapter 49 The Arbiter Never before, in all his fifty years, had Thankwell been so pleased to see Sarth, and yet, at the same time, he dreaded it. It felt like years since he'd set sail away from the White City, away from the Inquisition and the Dark Looks, away from the God Emperor and his suspicions. Hard to believe. It was just a little over five months. Now he was back, though. Back without the proof Emperor Francis had ordered him to find. He had the name of one traitor, but it wasn't the name he needed. He had the name of an underling. What he needed was the name of the Inquisitor behind Keswick. He would go to the God Emperor, tell what little he knew. That the traitor was an Inquisitor, and a woman narrowed the list down to two, Inquisitor Heron and Inquisitor Down. But with no idea which, and no proof, what could be done? The Emperor could not walk into the Inquisition and inform the Council that he has it on poor authority, one of them is a heretic, any more than Thankwell could do that himself. No, it would be better to leave him out of this. Thankwell would find the name of the traitor and deal with her himself, and face the consequences of his actions after. Somehow, he doubted whether he could rely on the God Emperor to bail him out. He was chosen because he was expendable, after all. That's your home, then? Looks a nice place. Which one is the Inquisition, the white one or the black one? Jezet said. She was close. She was always close these days. It took every bit of Thankwell's restraint not to reach out and touch her, but that wouldn't do. She was here to help him, not to... The black one, he said, pointing at it as if she couldn't see which was which. The white one is the Imperial Palace, home of the God Emperor. 
They were standing on the bow of the ship, leaning on the railing and waiting. Sarth was a cautious port. All ships requesting to dock were greeted by a small skiff with a port official on board. The official would board the ship, talk with the captain as to where he had come from and his next destination, and then tour the holds to inspect cargo. The man had already given the three passengers a brief look and decided they were no one of importance. It looks dreary, Jez said, looking at the black tower of the Inquisition. It looks like one of the hells, Thorn rasped from behind. Full of demons, ready to come pouring out at any moment, rising up all dark in the middle of a white city, all that spiky-looking rock. I know why it's black. Soot and ash from all the people burning is what that is. Thankwell might have laughed, but there was a kernel of truth in the Blackthorn's paranoid rambling. The Tower of the Inquisition had seen more burnings, hangings, dismemberments, massacres, beatings, mutilation, and torture than any other building the human race had ever erected. I completely agree, Thankwell said, with both of you. I've never thought of it as a home, just a place I have to report to now and then. Thorn spat over the side of the ship. He was nervous. That much was plain. You sure about this? Uh, Thankwell. I mean, my hair might be going back to the red side, but I got a fairly noticeable face. It'll be fine, Thorn. Believe it or not, most of us don't know what you look like. Besides, where's the least likely place anyone would ever think to find the Blackthorn? Sarth. Right under their noses. As you say. What about you? Taking off that coat don't exactly make you invisible. In a way, it does. There are few enough in the Inquisition who would recognize me on a normal day. Without my coats, even those who might, would not spare me a glance should I walk past them in the street. You can't, I don't know, sense each other? Thankwell laughed. <laughs> no, we can't. Bloody witch hunters, strutting around an entire fucking city. Bloody Sarth was never anything but a burden on my family, and you lot was the worst of it. I ever tell you why that Arbiter came calling on my folks back before I killed any of you? No. Cause they refused to pay the food tax to your fucking Inquisition. So, they sent a witch hunter to look in, find out why. No doubt, with the intent of burning my folk and putting someone more agreeable in charge, eh? Well, by the time he got there, my folks were already dead, and the Arbiter weren't long in following. And then you ran. And then I fucking ran. Didn't exactly leave me much choice, did ya? Barely more than a boy, and already on the run. Everywhere I went, I had witch hunters watching me like they knew. Like you could sense the presence of someone who killed one of your own. We can't. Well, I know that now, don't I? The Blackthorn's burnt face twisted into what looked like it could have been pain. A moment later, he was retching over the side of the ship. Jezet was still staring at the city arrayed in front of her. From here, Sarth almost looked like any port town, except that almost all visible buildings were white, built from marble that was so abundant in the kingdom and washed every day by slaves to keep the city gleaming. The imperial palace, with its tower and its spires, rose high above the rest of the city. From here, it almost looked like two great white hands, with fingers reaching toward the heavens. The Tower of the Inquisition rose in bleak counterpoint, a single black spiked spire thrusting out of the white around it like a sword driven through flesh. You've never been to Sarth before, Thankwell said, 
already knowing the answer. No. Never been many places, if truth be told. Spent most of my life in Acanthia, around True Ridge for the most part. Occasionally, my master would take me with him when he went on his short journeys. Once, I even visited the capital. More often than not, he'd leave me, though. After I killed him, after I became the Blade Master, I went east to see the desert. Thought about trying to cross it, but took a boat to the Five Kingdoms in the end. Wasn't long there. Spent some time working as a merc. I soon came to the attention of that bloody Sword of the North. After that, I made my way to Land's End, as fast as my feet would take me, and set sail to the wilds. Seemed someone like me could make some money over there, I thought. When all this is done, I might find a ship to take me to the Dragon Empire. Always wanted to see a dragon. You... you could come with me. It's a long journey, I hear. Might be less dull with some company. Thankwell laughed. <laughs> when all this is done, I won't be. When all this was done, he would either be dead or in an Inquisition prison cell, spending the rest of his days in darkness with only the company of rats and praying for an end to it all. I have duties. Jezet nodded and went back to staring at the city. After a while, the port official and the captain of the Blue Goal re-emerged onto the deck. There they shook hands, and the official climbed back down into his skiff, looking far happier than when he had climbed on. Bribes for the more prime docking spots were not uncommon, one of the first lessons an arbiter ever learned. Where there is power, there is corruption. It seemed as though the lesson was doubly true when it was petty power. As the ship lurched back into motion and began to float into port, all three passengers stood at the bow, not saying a word. The Blackthorn had quit his retching for now, but looked almost green, and showed no inclination toward talking, and Jesset had lapsed into a sullen silence. Even the captain seemed to sense something was amiss as he strode up behind them and hesitated before speaking. Got you here safe, as promised, I did. Sorry about the delay, but, well, no man can control the weather. Not very well, at least, Thankwell said, with a smile he didn't feel. The captain frowned. Quite. You're free to depart as soon as we dock. Thank you, Captain Hale. The well-dressed captain grunted, scratched once at his beard, and strutted away. They floated the rest of the way into the docks in silence. As the crew scrambled to tie off the ship and made ready to unload the cargo, Jezid asked the question. So, what's the plan? First, we get ourselves situated. There are plenty of cheap inns located far enough away from the Inquisition, so no arbiters will go to them. Thought you weren't in risk of being noticed, Thankwell the Blackthorn said with a smirk. No point in tempting fate, Thorn, for either of us. Tomorrow, we'll figure out the details of locating Arbiter Keswick. Got any notions of how we're going to manage that? As it happens, I do. Jezit is going to walk up to the Inquisition and ask for him. Chapter 50 The Blackthorn you know, up close, it looks even more like all the hells, Betram said, and took a deep swallow of beer. He was fast learning to enjoy the taste of beer in Sarth. It was a far cry from the piss-flavored brown water they served you in the wilds. You're not wrong, Jezid agreed in a hushed voice. The Arbiter said nothing. Thankwell had found them a cheap inn in what he called the poorer section of Sarth and paid for two rooms. Betram got one of the rooms to himself, a luxury he was not ungrateful for, while the Arbiter and Jezet stayed in the other. Betram quickly took to spending a good amount of time in the common room, drinking himself into a comfortable stupor. He paid for it in the morning, well and good, 
when he'd woke with his head pounding along to the pounding on his door. The Arbiter had taken one look at Thorn and sighed. Betram wanted nothing more than to punch the bastard at that point, but he refrained. A few minutes later, Thankwell handed him a necklace and told him to wear it always but keep it hidden beneath his clothing, lest another witch hunter recognize it as a charm. Betram had been skeptical at first, but just a few seconds after putting the thing around his neck, his hangover had vanished, freeing the Blackthorn up for some more drinking. Now they sat in a different inn, a fancy one not more than a few hundred paces from the Inquisition. Betram had never seen such an inn before. The floors were clean, no straw or reeds, just wood. The tables all had chairs, not just stools and benches. The man behind the bar was dressed as fancy as one of the blooded, and the serving maids were all fully clothed and had some of the best sets of teeth he'd ever seen. The place even had a balcony on the first floor for Volk to sit on and drink in the open air, and, just like all the other buildings in this part of town, save for the Inquisition, it was made out of some sort of white stone that took to shining in the sunlight. The White City of Sarth in the Holy Empire of Sarth, they called it, but Betram reckoned they'd get far more folk like himself making port if they added, City of good beer and clean women. Almost made up for the number of witch hunters he'd seen walking about. At least Thankwell had been right about them not even sparing him or the Blackthorn a second glance. Truth was, Jezid got more looks than the two men combined. You see the guards at the main gate, Thankwell was saying to Jezid. They'll stop you, but they won't talk to you. Don't say a word to them, just wait. There'll be an arbiter in the gatehouse who will come out to inquire about your business. Jezid nodded. She looked nervous, and Betram didn't blame her. Felt a lot like she was placing her head in the lion's jaws, no doubt. What should I say? The truth. You're there to speak to Arbiter Keswick. And the one at the gate will go fetch him? He'll send someone to fetch him and keep you under watch until Keswick arrives. Again, Jezet nodded. What if Keswick isn't there? Then we're out of luck and at loose end. What if there is no Keswick? Betram asked. What if... Your traitor just dressed someone up as a witch hunter and sent the man to host. What if this Keswick used a false name? Seems this plan of yours has a lot of what ifs. Thankwell had no reply to that. Betram took another swallow of beer. The witch hunter claimed his dwindling supply of coin wasn't enough to keep them all in alcohol for their time in Sarth, but Betram had looted the boss's corpse back in Hosstown and had ten gold bits to his name, a fortune if he'd ever had one, and enough to keep him drunk until they were done. So, if Keswick is real and is there, what do I tell him? said Jezid, frowning at Thankwell. Tell him Host is dead, convince him you're a messenger from Host Town, and that you were ordered, in the event of Host's death, to come to Sarth and inform Arbiter Keswick. Keep my name out of it, but try to tell the truth wherever possible. You can't lie to an arbiter, Betram put in. Exactly. I mean it, Thankwell. What if this Keswick asks Jez some questions? Seems he'll figure out the truth pretty quick. I should be able to make you a charm that will protect you from his compulsion. <laughs> Should? Betram snorted. What ifs, maybes, and shoulds? It's okay, Thorn. I'll be fine. Jezet looked at the Arbiter. Maybe you should ask me some questions so I know what this compulsion feels like. The Arbiter winced and shook his head. I... I don't... Feels like someone poking around inside your head. Like someone's reaching in, grabbing hold of what they want to know, and forcing it out of your mouth. You can't think of anything else. 
can't control yourself. Feels like being forced to do something against your will. Right, Thankwell? The Arbiter was staring into his beer, nodding, his hand shaking somewhat. Seems the man had never used his magic on Jezzet. Come to think of it, Betram couldn't remember him ever using it on the Blackthorn either. Betram waved a serving maid over to ask her for another beer. The girl stared at his face with part shock and part horror. Once, that might have made the Blackthorn angry, but instead he just laughed. <laughs> Feels worse than it looks. Trust me. Wanna touch it? He ran a three-fingered hand down the burned side of his face as he asked, and the maid turned and near ran away. Do you have that effect on all women, Thorn? Jessit asked with a pretty smile. You ain't run screaming yet. I'm being paid to put up with your face. I, story of my life, that. Betram grinned, knowing full well how the muscles pulling against his burnt skin would make him look even worse than normal. The Arbiter was staring out over the street that led up to the Inquisition. Stone streets, Betram noticed. A luxury rarely afforded in the wilds, but here in Sarth it seemed a standard. Everything seemed to be made of stone here. Would cut down on risk of fire, a useful precaution in a city full of witch hunters. He'll ask you about Host, Thankwell was saying. To make sure you are who you say you are, speak vaguely. You just worked for him. You didn't have access to the council. Frown when you answer his questions. Try to look like you're thinking of something else. Yet you can't. Jezet gave a practice frown, looked to be constipated to Betram's eyes. The maid returned with the beer, and the Blackthorn handed her a bit and grinned at her. Poor girl's face twisted in disgust, and she ran away from the table. They stayed at the inn for the rest of the afternoon, until the light of the sun started to dip below the buildings. The Arbiter watched the Inquisition with a worried expression and gave advice here and there. Jezit stayed silent for the most part, worried about her part in the plan, no doubt. Both the others drank sparingly. Betram, however, had no inhibition. He ordered his mug refilled whenever it ran dry, which was pretty regular if truth be told. He was merrily drunk by the time the Arbiter rose from the table and insisted it was time to leave. Halfway down the stairs, they passed the serving maid again. She lowered her eyes so as not to have to look at Betram's face again. The Blackthorn snorted, considered grabbing her face and making her look, but decided against it. Falcon Sarth seemed a civilized lot. He didn't reckon they'd take too well to some scarred man scaring the hell out of a girl. At the bottom of the stairs, a man in a familiar brown coat stopped Thankwell with a hand on his shoulder. Do I know you? Thankwell looked down and shook his head. I don't think so, sir. Betram shouldered his way past the two. So much for none of the Arbiters recognizing him without his coat. The inn was busy, three tables full of men drinking. Most seemed to be merchants or tradesmen, not a single sellsword in the entire joint. What's your name? the Arbiter asked Thankwell. Alfred Costa, sir. No, that's not. I'm sure I recognize you. Are you lying to me? Sometimes the situation called for a distraction, and the Blackthorn only knew one type. He walked up behind a group of folk drinking around a table, plucked a spare chair from close by, gripping hold of it in two hands. It was a heavy chair, looked to be well made. With a grin, he slammed the chair into the back of one of the patrons. He expected it to smash into kindling. Instead, it hit the man's back with a heavy thud, and the poor bastard slumped forward on the table. Another man, tall as Betram but skinny as a post, was up in a flash, swinging a bony fist. The Blackthorn caught the fist with his face and went stumbling backward into another table. One of the men from that table, a burly beast with one arm twice the size of the other and a lazy eye, 
stood and made to grab for Betram. The Blackthorn's five-fingered fist flashed out and punched the blacksmith in the throat. Then he grabbed hold of the choking fool and pushed him at the bony man. Chaos erupted a moment later as fists started flying, and folk who were just recently sitting quiet started hitting other folk who had been sitting just as quiet. A hoarse laugh burst forth from Betram's lips. Seemed even the fancy folk of Sarth were just as capable of a drunken brawl as folk from the wilds. The tall bony man crashed into Betram with fists flailing. The Blackthorn thrust his head into the man's face once, twice, and then picked him up and flung him across a table. Another victim grabbed hold of Betram by the shoulder. He turned, intending to punch the poor bastard, and found himself spun around with his arm twisted behind his back. Jezit's voice hissed in his ear. Time to go. Now! Betram took a glance at his handiwork. He spied at least ten men involved in the fight, and the arbiter who had stopped Thankwell in the midst of it, trying to calm the situation down. The unfortunate bastard who had taken the chair to his back was still slumped over the table, unconscious. Thankwell was standing by the door to the inn, waving some folk in. A few seconds later, a number of city guard clad in white uniforms bundled their way inside. Jezet pushed Betram out of the way, and they slipped around the guards and followed Thankwell outside. Chapter 51 The Blademaster A blademaster without a blade is a master of nothing. Could be worse, Jez, she told herself. Walk unarmed to the very gates of the Inquisition and ask for a traitor by name, or spend the rest of the day with Thankwell and Thorn. The two had been arguing almost non-stop since the Blackthorn started a brawl last night. Truth was, the brawl provided the distraction they needed to slip away from an arbiter who was close to recognizing Thankwell. Truth was also that the brawl brought a lot of attention their way. Attention they could well do without. Jez rubbed her thumb across the ring on her right index finger. A gift from Thankwell. Though gift was the wrong term. A small wooden trinket, plain, dark red wood on the outside, but on the underside were carved the symbols of an arbiter charm. It should make you immune to the effects of the compulsion, though you'll still feel it trying to slip inside your head. Hopefully, the Arbiter should feel it also, Thankwell said when he gave her the ring. Slip inside my head? Sounds wonderful. What happens if it doesn't work? Thankwell had winced then. It should work. Well, either way, reckon it's the first time a man's ever given me a ring before. Maybe you should ask me a question to see if it works. Jessit hadn't gotten around to asking Thankwell why he was so reluctant to ask her any questions, as Thorn had banged on the door, stinking of last night's beer and insisting it was time to go. A group of three slaves walked past Jessit, and she fell in a few paces behind them to hide her approach to the Inquisition gate. The slaves in Sarth were treated so differently to those in the wilds that Jez sometimes wasn't sure whether they were slaves. They wore serviceable, well-tended clothing and sandals to protect their feet, and were often seen out without a master to herd them. There were some very strict rules as to the treatment of slaves in Sarth, so Thankwell told her, one of which being that slaves could not be used as whores, though buying a female slave to be used as a mistress was a regular occurrence among the rich and the nobility. As such, beautiful slave girls were a rare and widely sought-after commodity in the White City and were often treated better than the owner's wives. Some of the richest and most powerful men in the city were even known to keep harems of slave girls, though not many could afford such a luxury. Problem is, they're still slaves, still got no freedom. Their master says, spread your legs, and all the slaves can do is reply, how wide? The slaves in front of her now were all men, and were all carrying boxes or barrels. 
the property of some merchant who used them as cheap labor, to move goods from here to there, no doubt. In the wilds, most male slaves wore nothing more than loincloths. Jesset began to wonder if the male slaves here in Sarth were gelded like they often were in the wilds. The slaves turned off to the left, and she found herself standing in front of the Inquisition compound. Up close, it looked even more dark and foreboding. Jez could feel her confidence wavering, but stepped up to the main gate all the same. A guardsman clad in the shiny white uniform of the city watch stepped in front of her. He shouted back to the guardhouse behind him, and then just stood there, blocking her from proceeding and saying nothing. Jezet treated him to stony silence right back. A tall man, with a gut as big as a barrel, and a bushy brown mustache that hid most of his red face, stepped out of the guardhouse and approached. He wore an arbiter coat, just like Thankful's, only much larger, to accommodate his girth. His manner seemed cheerful, but Jezet didn't trust it. How may we be of service, my lady? the fat arbiter said in a booming voice. Seemed everyone was calling Jezid a whore or a lady these days, and she wasn't sure which pissed her off more. Here to see Arbiter Kessick, she said, dropping into a heavy wild's drawl and staring the fat arbiter down. The arbiter looked her up and down, a jovial smile on his face the entire time, and then turned and nodded to one of his guards. Go fetch Arbiter Kessick. Tell him... What was your name, miss? Jezet felt... something. She couldn't quite explain it, but it felt like something clawing inside her mind. Almost she refused to answer and punched the fat Arbiter in his fat face, but to do so would have given the game away. Jezet Verlern, she said with a frown. The fat Arbiter turned back to the guard. Tell Arbiter Kessick he has a visitor, one Jezit Velern. After the guards scurried off, the fat man turned back to Jez. Would you care to come inside? I can offer you a cool drink. Again, Jezit felt the strange sensation in her mind. I would care to stick a knife into one of your chins for trying to get inside my head, you slimy fat bastard. Nah, reckon I'll wait just here. She could feel her thumb rubbing at the ring on her finger. It was taking all her restraint not to attack the Arbiter in front of her. Think I'm starting to understand why Thankwell didn't want to ask me any questions. I might have had to kill him. When the guard returned, he had another Arbiter in tow. This one was short, about of a height with Thankwell, and stocky. Everything about that man seemed hard as stone. His face looked to be carved from granite, all hard lines and tight, weather-beaten skin. His hair was black, dusted with gray, and cropped short, and his eyes were dark and dangerous. The man even walked like he was made of stone. Either that, or he has a particularly long stick up his ass. You Kessick? Jez asked the new arrival. I don't know you. The Arbiter's voice was as hard as the rest of him. Nah, you don't. But if you're Kessick, then I got a message for you. Jez hoped the man would pick up on the Wild's accent she was throwing in his face. The new Arbiter turned to the fat one. I'll take it from here. You. He pointed at Jez. Come with me. Jezet Velern would like to have said she wasn't the type of woman to scare easy, but when surrounded by witch hunters, she found it hard not to feel like running. She hadn't realized they'd be so many. Inside the compound, there were arbiters everywhere she looked. Some were standing around in groups, talking. Others were walking from one place to another. Some even seemed to be lazing about, doing very little in the afternoon sun. As Arbiter Kessick led her toward the giant black stone tower, Jezet hoped to all the gods she couldn't remember that she didn't look as guilty as she felt. 
The Arbiter turned right, before the main entrance to the tower, and walked another fifty paces before stopping. He opened a small door to the side of the tower and walked through. Inside was a small, black corridor, lit with a number of ensconced torches. The corridor led just twenty paces ahead, and to each side were two doors. The Arbiter picked the second door on the left-hand side, opened it, and looked in. Then he nodded at Jezid. Get in. The room looked almost like a cell, with only a table and two chairs instead of a bed. There didn't seem to be any sort of lock on the door. So, Jezit swallowed her fear and did as she was told. The Arbiter followed her in and pulled the door, too. Sit down. Reckon I'll stand. The Arbiter didn't look too pleased about that. Sit. Down. Again, Jezit did as she was told, and the Arbiter took the seat opposite her. There he sat for a while, staring at her with his cold, dark eyes. Jezit stared on back. You are Keswick, right? she asked. Yes, I'm Keswick. And you're from the wilds. I got a message. From Host. Well, Sota, a message. You weren't there last I was. I'd have noticed. So, either you're lying, or Host kept you hidden. Tread carefully, Jez. I ain't lying, and I weren't hiding. I work for Host. Worked for Host. But I worked in shade. My orders were simple and I'm being well paid for carrying them out. If Host dies, I'm to come to Sarth, find Arbit a Keswick, and tell him. Keswick didn't look convinced. Didn't look unconvinced, either. His face was as expressionless as the Blackthorns, only without the burns. How did he die? The Arbiter asked. There was no feeling, no clawing inside her head, no will trying to subvert her own. There was nothing. What the hell do I do? Do I pretend his compulsion is working, or just act like I didn't feel anything? One of yours did for him, she said, without dropping her stony face. Slaughtered half the town in the doing, as I heard it. What was his name? The arbiter that killed Host. Fuck if I know. I weren't there, and bloody glad of it. Keswick was silent for a moment. Jez could see his jaw clenched tight. What about Host's daughter? He asked. Jezit didn't have to feign confusion. I don't fucking know. I weren't there. Paid to tell you, Host is dead. Job done. Now, if you're done asking questions, I don't know the answer to. I intend to go get stinking drunk. Again, Keswick was silent for a while, staring at Jezit the entire time. It occurred to her that the Arbiter may be deciding whether or not to kill her. Of course, he said in a grave voice. I'll escort you back to the gate. By the time she got back to the main gate, Jezit was shaking so badly, she had to shove her hands into her pockets to hide it. It wasn't helped by the fact that Keswick had taken to walking a couple of steps behind her and was as silent as the grave. Her nerves were frayed to the point of snapping. I assume you'll be departing back to the wilds soon, Miss Velern, Arbiter Keswick said from the threshold. Jez turned and gave him a lopsided grin. Too right. Be on the first ship I can find, just as soon as I sober up on the morrow. Goodbye, then. The Arbiter's dark, dangerous eyes never left her, never blinked. Jezit nodded and backed away, before turning and doing her very best not to look like she was fleeing. For the rest of the day and most of the night, the three of them waited and watched. 
It was not easy to pretend to have reasons to be there for so long, and would have been a lot easier if they hadn't been involved in a bar fight at a certain inn just one night ago. Betram found himself a nice-looking spot of wall to sit by and lean on. He looked, for all the world, like a beggar down on his luck and in need of a few spare bits, and Jezet wasn't the only one to think so. A number of people, those who looked like they had bits to spare, tossed him the odd coin or two. Thankwill was not quite so subtle. The Arbiter wandered around some of the shops, spending a good deal of time in each, but never buying anything, and always keeping one eye on the main gate of the Inquisition, while trying to hide his face from the witch hunters who passed him. After the sun went down, he joined Jezet in the dirty little alley behind the bakery, and let her do the watching, while he paced and worried. Three times he muttered something about going to the God Emperor, and three times he shook his head, deciding against whatever plan he had laid out. Jessit was glad of that, at least. Last thing she needed was to come face to face with a god whose name she couldn't even be bothered to remember. Some nights, it seemed to Jessit, were darker than others, and this one seemed near pitch black, despite the lanterns lit above the streets. Moon and stars both were hidden behind a thick blanket of cloud that stretched from one horizon to the other, and even the white stone buildings seemed to do little to keep the world from the darkness. A fitting night for stalking someone, she thought, as Arbiter Keswick stepped out from the main gate, glanced left and right, then chose right and started walking. I could walk near enough beside him and he might not notice. Thorn was already up and following the man. He glanced once at Jezid, and then back to watching Keswick from thirty paces or so. Should be enough not to rouse suspicion, but not so far as to lose sight of the Arbiter. Jez hissed at Thankwell to follow, and then set off, keeping her distance from Thorn as he was keeping his from Keswick. Thankwell fell in beside her. You're sure it's him? I can't see him, Thankwell whispered. Thorn can. It's him. They followed in silence, as Thorn led them into and through the sleepless trade district. The sounds, smells, and light in the area never truly vanished, as forge fires were never allowed to go out. Merchants, even after a day of successful trading, labored to prepare the goods for the morrow, and some shops never closed, as there were always some folk needing supplies at all hours. At the center of the district was a market that did not sleep, even in the dead of night. Men worked to set up their stalls for the coming day, while children lurked around, always mindful and on the lookout for an easy steal. Jezet watched a young girl charge past, clutching something to her chest. A moment later, an old man ran limped after the young girl, screaming profanities as he went. More children flocked to the abandoned stall, to steal as much as they could before the old man returned. Her old master used to send her into town to steal things. One morning, every week, he would name an item. Sometimes it was something small and easy, like a red apple. Other times, something larger, like a roll of fabric. Sometimes specific, like the time he had sent her to steal Merchant Albert's favorite beagle. If Jessit didn't return by midday with the desired item, he would punish her and his punishments were never pleasant. And here I thought Sarth would be completely innocent of crime, what with you arbiters around, Jezit said with a smile. Thankwell never took his eyes from the Blackthorn's back. We deal with heresy, not petty theft. The Inquisition isn't a branch of law enforcement or peacekeeping. We root out and destroy evil, and not just here in Sarth, all over the world in every one of the kingdoms of man. Except the wilds. Even in the untamed wilds, he corrected. Only we're less welcome there than we are some other places. Is there some place arbiters are welcome? If there is, I've yet to find it. They lapsed back into silence and continued following Thorn. It almost felt like a pleasant late-night stroll, 
and for a moment, Jezet almost forgot they were following a man with the intention of murdering him and the woman he was working for. Before long, they found themselves in a very different part of the city. Wide streets, capable of moving three carriages, were surrounded by gargantuan buildings, all built of the same white stone and all shining in the lantern lights, despite the general gloom of the night. Some buildings had grounds that at least had doubled its size. Some sported fancy gardens with a wild variety of plants, trees, and flowers. Others were paved over with stone. All had high stone walls, many complete with iron spikes to ward off potential thieves. Most were patrolled as well, guardsmen in uniforms, differing from the standard white of the city watch. Some of the guards watched as Jezid and Thankwell strolled past, Others paid them no heed. The Arbiter caught Jezet staring. The Inquisitors are granted estates outside the Inquisition compound, as recognition for their long service, continued diligence, and as a reward for keeping the world safe from heresy. He sounded bitter as he spat out the last words. Some choose estates within the city's limits, some without. The only exception being the Grand Inquisitor, who resides at the top levels of the tower within the Inquisition itself. So, which of the Inquisitors live around here? I don't know. I come back to Sarth once every three years, and spend a couple of weeks here at most. I've never had the time, nor the inclination, to learn where the Inquisitors live. Up ahead, the Blackthorn stopped, glanced backward, and nodded for them to join him. He stood, fidgeting from foot to foot and rubbing at the burnt side of his face with his three-fingered hand. When they approached, he pointed at an estate, somewhat smaller than most, and surrounded by a black iron fence. In the distance to their right, Jez could see a gate with two white-clad guards loitering around. Inside the grounds stood a small building, only two floors, built from the same white stone as the rest of the city. Arbiter Keswick was nowhere to be seen. Thankwell pulled up the hood of his cloak and stepped up the bars of the fence. He was whispering something under his breath, but Jezet could not understand the words. So? Who is it? Thorn hissed, looking like there wasn't another place in the world he wouldn't rather be. I don't know, Thankwell whispered. All I saw was Keswick enter the building. Well, we know they're both here, Jez said. Why don't we just break in and do what we came here to do? Thankwell almost looked like he was about to agree when they heard voices. The guards from the gate were talking to someone. All three of them backed into the shadows and watched. Jez heard Thankwell mutter a curse. Wasn't often the Arbiter did that. The man at the gate was tall and handsome, with sharp features and a bit of a look of an eagle about him. He had the blonde hair that was so common in Sarth, and he carried a set of two scythes instead of swords. Nasty weapons, scythes. Hard to defend against and cause a lot of damage when they hit. Hurt like hell, too. Jez remembered a scar just below her left breast. Her old master had given her that one with a scythe when Jez had got a bit too cocky and thought she could disarm him. She remembered it felt like the entire left side of her chest was on fire, but she had fought on regardless of the blood and pain. Thankwell waited until the man with the scythes had passed through the gate. Then, without even so much as a word, he turned and stormed off the way they had come. Jezet sent a confused look in the Blackthorn's direction. Thorn sent a blank look right back, and as one, they hurried after the Arbiter. Back at the inn, Thankwell still refused to talk. He glared at both Jez and Thorn, and then was gone, up to their room. The Blackthorn let out a sigh, slumped into a chair, and called for a beer. Jezet sat down opposite him and called for a beer of her own. At times like this, alcohol always helps to numb the issue. Thorn smiled at her. He was the ugliest man she had ever met, and yet somehow, he just didn't seem to care. He waited until the beer arrived took a huge mouthful, and then wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Jezet sipped at her own beer, staring into the murky water. Jezet, 
Thorn began. Me and you, we've both been party to a bit of murder in our time. Some we done ourselves. Some just watched others. Got a point somewhere in there, Thorn? Aye, I do, as it happens. We both know what murder looks like. Real murder, born out of anger and hatred. We both seen it. In ourselves and in others. So, you tell me. What was in our witch hunter's eyes just now? He was right. Might be. You want to go up there and calm him down a drop. Stop him from doing something rash and stupid. Don't worry about your beer. I'll look after it. Jezet raised the mug to her lips and drained it off in one before standing and making for the stairs. Thorne's hoarse laughter rang in the common room behind her. She found Thankwell in their room, pacing the small length over and over again. His jaw was clenched hard, his hands curled into shaking fists, and his pretty eyes were two chips of ice. He didn't speak to her when she entered, just kept pacing, his shadow dancing a mad jig in the flickering lantern light. Jez closed the door and stood in front of it. He looks like Constance when she saw me. Jez thought she knew why he was so angry. Who was he? The Arbiter with the Scythes. Gosh. Thankwell glared at her when he spoke, then went back to staring at the floor, his hands opening and closing with each step he took. His name is Arbiter Fendin Kosh. Jezet waited, but Thankwell didn't seem to want to volunteer any more information. And who is he to you? Thankwell looked to be grinding his teeth so hard, Jezet thought it a wonder she couldn't hear them scraping against each other. He is, was, my friend. We trained together. Graduated together. Drank together. Jezet nodded. There's a saying in the wilds. There's no such thing as friends, just those who haven't turned on you yet. We're not in the wild, Jezet. We're in Soth. Thankwell shouted at her. It was the first time she'd ever heard him shout. I've known him for forty years. I forgot you're so much more civilized here in Sarth. I suppose you wanted him to let you know before he stabbed you in the back? Maybe a polite letter? Thankwell shot her an acidic warning glare, but Jez ignored it. Never was good at calming people down. So you've been betrayed. Now what? Thankwell stopped pacing and stalked toward her. He was taller, but only just. In the face of his rage, some people might have quailed. Jezet Valern was not such a person. Now I'm going to kill him. How? By walking into the Inquisition compound and shooting him. Another brilliant plan. Jez almost sighed. Then what? You kill an Arbiter, and then the rest of them kill you. Me and Thorn are out of a job, stuck here in Sarth, and your precious Inquisition still has a traitor in its midst. Thankwell's breathing was a short, shaky flaring of his nostrils. Get out of my way, Jesset! No! He reached out to move her, but she brushed his hand away and pushed him in the chest. The Arbiter stumbled backwards, a look one part shock, one part righteous indignation on his face. He came at her again, and again she pushed him back, this time following and grabbing him by the shirt. Her feet left the floor as Thankwell picked her up, twisted, and slammed her down onto the bed. Without thinking, Jezet leaned forward and kissed him. There was a moment of shock in his eyes, and then he was kissing her back, pushing her back down onto the bed. Fight or fuck, Jez. Why not both? She wriggled and squirmed underneath him, pushing herself further onto the bed as he started pulling at her clothing. She tore at his, ripping the shirt from his body. They both pushed and slapped, twisted and wrestled, grunted and growled. It seemed to take forever before they were both naked, 
and by the time they were, Jez was as wet as the sea, and the arbiter was as hard as a rock. As he rammed himself inside her with an angry grunt, Jez gasped. Whether from pleasure or pain, she wasn't sure. She scratched at his arms as he started fucking her, each thrust accompanied by a grunt and a soft wet slap. One at a time, he grabbed hold of her hands and pinned them back onto the bed, above her head. Jez wrapped one leg around the arbiter's ass and pushed on the bed with the other, squirming underneath him as he thrust hard into her, again and again. She twisted her wrists, pulling, pushing, trying to free her hands and let a low, ragged, growling moan as she stared into his pretty blue eyes. She snapped at him, trying to bite at his lip as his face moved above her own. Then a shiver of pleasure coursed through her, and she gasped again. Then his mouth was on her own, kissing her, his lips hard and bruising, so she returned in kind. Her hands pulled free just in time, and she grabbed hold of the bedpost with her right, while digging gouges into the arbiter's back with her left. The shuddering pleasure that started in her groin and spread outward and upward until her back was arched and a throaty squeal was slipping between her lips. The arbiter wasn't far behind. A few more hard, pounding thrusts, and then he stopped, his mouth open, his breath rushing in and out in short grunts. Then he rolled off of her and collapsed onto the bed with a weary sigh. For a both time, they both lay there in silence, heavy breathing, both soaked in sweat. Sorry, Thankwell said. He wasn't looking at her, instead staring up at the ceiling. Jez snorted out a laugh. What for? Didn't mean to be so rough. Rough? It ain't rough as long as I can still walk after. But you did mean to fuck me. He hesitated. Yes? Or no? I don't know what I meant. But I wanted to. Well, that's something, I guess, Jezit said with a grin. She rolled over and took Thankwell in hand. Short, slow strokes. Fact was, Jezit hadn't had a good night of sex since Irik's fort months and months ago, and she had no intention of leaving it at just the once. They went at it twice more that night. The first time, Thankwell kissed her cunt before sticking his cock in. Jessit was never sure she liked the feel of a tongue between her legs, but she didn't feel much like complaining. The second time, she rolled on top and rode him, her hips grinding against his until they were both satisfied. Afterward, they lay there, exhausted and covered in sticky sweat. She waited until his breathing became slow and rhythmic, waited until she was certain he was asleep, then closed her eyes and let the darkness take her. Chapter 52 The Blackthorn For two days, Betram found himself alone in Sarth, not a single sight of either Jezid or the Arbiter. He crawled out of bed every morning, itching from sleeping on the uncomfortable and scratchy mattress, and more grateful than he'd ever known it was possible to be, that the Arbiter had given him the charm that extinguished hangovers. Betram discovered, if he never took the charm off, he needn't ever feel the effects of a good night come the morning, though that didn't stop him from waking up still drunk. After a breakfast, complete with a morning beer to wash down the food, Betram waited around in the common room until midday. When neither of his two companions showed themselves, he left in search of a more hospitable tavern with better beer and women who weren't afraid of a few scars. The latter proved to be elusive at best, but at night, whether he found one or not, he would pay for a woman, and if they looked at his face in disgust, he'd just turn them over and take them from behind instead. Made little difference to Betram. None of them reminded him of Rose. When he stumbled back into his own room at night, he would only be able to keep his eyes focused long enough to collapse into his bed. When he slept, Betram found himself dreaming of the dead southerner and the murderous little imp, of that half-blooded bastard Swift and his friend Bones. 
They weren't pleasant dreams. Sometimes he saw them dead, sometimes alive, but they were never pleasant dreams. Always woke him sweating and shivering. The beer helped him forget, though. Forget about the dreams. Forget about his friends. On the third day, after they had followed Keswick, Betram's companions left their room. Jezet was the first to appear. Betram half expected her to be grinning, like a thief in a safe. But she looked dour, striding down the stairs to the common room, with purpose in her step. She sat down opposite Thorn and waved for something to eat and drink. Betram grinned at her. Well, I don't reckon you two were murdering no one, he teased. Not unless the noises have changed since last I did it. Jezet stared at Betram, so he met her eyes with his usual impassive glare. You stink of beer, Thorn. Aye, he agreed. And you stink of sex. But I ain't gonna make a deal out of it. Jezet Valern snorted out a laugh and shook her head. A short while later, the Arbiter made his appearance. He looked somewhat changed. The lines of his face seemed harder, more severe. His manner seemed less casual, more purposeful. Seemed a couple of days of rutting had done them both a bit of good. Thorn, the Arbiter said as he sat down. It still worried Betram how normal the witch hunter looked without his coat. Made him think arbiters could be anywhere. There could be another in the room with him right now, and he wouldn't even know it. I reckon I'm gonna need a few coins. Seems I've gone through them faster than I'd hoped, while you two have been occupied. You got some expensive whorehouses here in South. I seem to remember. We already had that conversation, and it ended with a no. The Arbiter's voice was severe, angry. Not enough to scare the Blackthorn. Aye. Well, what have you two been bloody doing for the last two days? Thorn waited for the Arbiter to look up before continuing. Cause I happen to know who your traitor is. A strained hush fell over the table as the serving girl brought over a plate of food and a mug of dark brown beer. Jezet took a swig out of the mug, and a moment later the Arbiter had himself a mouthful. Once the serving girl was good and gone, Jezet asked the question, How? Well, I ain't got no magical powers of question asking, but you might be surprised at what you can get from a bit of listening and a well-placed comment or two. You're going to make me ask you who it is. Inquisitor Harren is the only one that lives round there. The other one... Down. Aye, her. She's got a place outside of the city, but she never leaves that big black fort of yours. Inquisitor Selice Harren. The Arbiter said more to himself than to the others. Good-looking woman if the drunkards at the Sleeping Sickle are to believed, and I don't see no reason why they'd lie about it. Though, one of them claimed she used to suck his cock. I reckon that one was lying. So, how about it? Reckon I can get a few of those gold bits. Call it a loan, if you want. The Arbiter looked up from Jezet's beer. Sure. On one... Condition. You stay sober until this thing is done. Well, ain't that a hell of a condition. Betram picked up and drained his mug. Done. The Arbiter nodded once, reached into his purse, and slid five gold bits across the table. Betram snatched them up. Staying sober didn't mean no beer at all, and it didn't mean no whores. The next two weeks, Betram counted as some of the dullest of his life. He spent a good portion of them baking in the hot, indomitable sun upon the streets of Sarth, while watching the Inquisition main gate with fruitless vigilance. Arbiters came and went, messengers ran to and fro, and servants hurried about everywhere, but rarely did their three targets leave the fortress. 
They took it in shifts, watching, waiting, the occasional dabble into following. Thankful was the worst of the two companions. Each day, the Arbiter seemed a little angrier, and the times when he saw the Arbiter known as Kosh, he was worse. Betram recognized the signs of barely restrained violence when he saw them. Jezet was a far more sociable watch partner, and a damp sight easier on the eyes, but even she seemed taut and high-strung. During the few times he was not on watch, Betram found himself alone and missing the company. Fact was, the whole situation stank of indecision. They discovered that the Inquisitor made for her own estate most nights just after sundown. She went in a fancy white carriage drawn by four white horses, big stallions and all of them gelded. And she was guarded by six of the city watch, also clad in white. Made for a pretty sight, watching all that white come from the black of the Inquisition compound. Something about contrast, Jezet said. Not that Betram knew what that meant. The tall arbiter with the pretty face and the scythes only left the compound one day in every three. Seemed even witch hunters got the odd day off, and Kosh was partial to a bit of beer and cunt. When he did leave the compound, he stopped off at a couple of inns, the Golden Giant and the Merry Harpist. Always he'd have a couple of drinks in each, while folk came around and slid him the odd coin or two. Betram had seen the like before, more times than he cared to count. The Arbiter no doubt extorted money with the threats of righteous burning or the like. After collecting his ill-gotten bits, the corrupt witch hunter would always visit the same place, a whorehouse called the Pink Purse. Seemed far too flowery a name, considering what went on inside, but it was a fancy place all the same, the type of place a man like Betram Thorne couldn't even get into. Kessick, on the other hand, was not so free with his time. The man only ever seemed to leave the Inquisition compound to report to his heretical Inquisitor, and he did that once every two days, always taking the same route and always careful to check for people following him with regular stops and the occasional waiting in alleys. Kessick would be the easiest to kill, Betram reckoned. The man was too predictable. They could wait, ambush him three on one, and Betram could add a seventh to his list. Still, Thankwell hesitated. The Arbiter himself was not one for sharing his plans with the Blackthorn, and while Jezet might be on the inside, she wasn't giving much away either, counseling to be patient and wait while the Arbiter came up with a plan. It came as a surprise when the Arbiter made a decision. Betram was sitting downstairs in the common room, enjoying some bacon and a morning beer, when Jezet appeared and asked him to follow. The Arbiter was standing at the window of their room when they entered, leaning against the wall. Looked like a nice spot, with lots of light. No way for people to get behind or beside you, and a commanding view of the entire room. A real nice leaning spot, and no mistake. Shut the door, the Arbiter said. His eyes still seemed cold and hard, and his voice was flat. Betram did as he was asked, and proceeded to lean against it. Truth was, it weren't as good a spot as the Arbiter's. Doors always had their problems, especially if someone was trying to break it with an axe. But it weren't far off. Tomorrow, the Arbiter said. Aye, about fucking time, the way I see it, Betram replied. Too much doing nothing, and not enough killing makes a man edgy. So... Which one we doing for first? All of them. That gave Betram a fair-sized portion of pause. The three targets were never seen together, which could only mean they were splitting up. You reckon that's a good plan? I ain't never been too good with numbers. But at last count, only one of us here ever killed an Arbiter before. If we kill just one and the other two find out before we get to them, we won't get another chance. It has to be all three at the same time. He paused. Tomorrow, Inquisitor Harren will be at her estate. 
Keswick will be making his way there to report, and Kosh will be doing his rounds. We take one each and kill them before they know what's happening. Pfft, that easy? Betram snorted. That easy. Betram grinned. Reckon you want me killing Keswick? The Arbiter nodded. He already knows what Jez looks like, and I... I'll be taking Inquisitor Harren. On your own. On my own. Betram sucked at his teeth. Always annoyed him he had two missing, but he wasn't crazy enough to have metal ones put in their place. Now would be the time to voice any concerns, Thorn, the Arbiter said, still staring at Betram. Aye. You reckon you can do it? I don't reckon she got to be an Inquisitor on looks alone, though she's sure pretty enough. Way I hear it told, there's a big difference between you Arbiters and them Inquisitors. So, she's no Inquisitor. No more than if you wore a dress would you be a woman. Celise Heron may wear the title, but she is nothing more than a heretic. So, yes, I reckon I can do it. Betram held his tongue. He couldn't say he was confident, and if truth be told, the Arbiter didn't look like he was either. Tomorrow, said the Arbiter. Two hours past nightfall. Thorn, you take Keswick on his way to meet with Inquisitor Harren. Jez, you'll meet up with Kosh at the brothel. I'll find the Inquisitor at her estate. After they're dead, if all goes well, we'll meet back here. What if all don't go well? Betram asked. Then some of us won't meet back here with the others, Jezet said with a half-smile. Aye, and... What if he's one of the ones that don't come back? Betram asked, pointing at the Arbiter. I ain't doing this out of the goodness of my own heart. If you die, Arbiter, how do I get paid? Thankwell paused for a moment, frowning, then walked over to his pack and started rifling through it. He tossed a small dagger, its blade no longer than a hand, to Betram. Thorn caught it and drew the blade to get a better look at it. Seemed well made, good steel. Not worth two hundred gold bits, though. There was some sort of writing on the blade. That dagger has the same charms as my sword. Take it to any reputable weapons dealer in the city, and you'll get more than enough gold to cover my debt to you. I? I. And what about the pardons? Seems I remember something about you stopping the Inquisition from chasing me. No more Arbiters coming after me. You don't need to worry about that. The Arbiter turned and looked out the window. I reckon I do. You don't. The Arbiter's voice sounded tense. No? No. The Blackthorn might have sighed if he was the type of man to sigh. Instead, he growled. And why the hell not? The Arbiter turned and took two steps toward Betram. His hands were clenched into fists, and his voice was coarse and angry. Because they've never been after you, Thorn. Not once has the Inquisition ever sent an Arbiter after you. Betram felt his jaw clench and his teeth grind together. That ain't true. I've been attacked by you witch hunters plenty of times. Have you really, Thorn? Think back, if you can. Was there a single time the Arbiter attacked you, I wonder? Betram tried to remember back. Six Arbiters he'd killed, and only one of them did he give a chance to fight back. Back in Shade? You... No, Thorn. You attacked me. The Inquisition has never been after you. The Arbiter snorted out a laugh. <laughs> There's actually a standing order to leave you be. Betram shook his head. No. 
Yes. You're not a heretic, Thorn. Just a petty criminal with a habit of murdering arbiters. To the Inquisition, you're just a madman, not worth taking the risk to hunt down. The Blackthorn took a menacing step toward the arbiter. For the first time, he realized just how much taller he was. He towered over the witch hunter by almost a foot. You said, back in the wilds, you would get me a pardon. He hissed through clenched teeth. I lied, Thorn, to get you here, to get you to help me. There's no pardon needed, but I knew. The Blackthorn's right fist connected with the Arbiter's face, and he went sprawling across the floor. Jezet was on her feet with her sword drawn before Betram could take another step. Don't do it, Thorn, she warned, her voice as sharp and dangerous as her blade. The Arbiter coughed and spat out some blood, and then struggled to his feet and spat again. This time a tooth hit the floor with the red spittle. He walked over to Betram and stood there again, within striking distance. A big red mark lit the left side of his face, and the Blackthorn knew it would be black and blue in a couple of hours. I still need your help, Thorn. Betram had to admire the Arbiter's stones. Not many men would take a punch from the Blackthorn and then ask for his help. Tomorrow, Keswick. Two hours after nightfall. Betram turned and stalked toward the door, near ripping it from its hinges as he opened it. Don't reckon I'll be coming back here after. The Arbiter said something, but Betram didn't hear it over the slamming of the door behind him. By midday, Betram found himself in a tavern drinking away his dwindling coin supply. By sundown, he was stinking drunk and bleary-eyed. Seemed the whole world was determined to sway around him. Drinking on your own held its perks, but, if truth be told, Betram would have preferred a drinking partner or two. Bones or Swift both liked their drink and knew how to put it away. Henry and the boss... Neither drank much around the other, but if you got them alone, they would empty a few mugs. Jezet, back when Betram first knew her, was well known for getting so drunk, she often forgot which way was up. Even the Arbiter, lying bastard though he may be, would do for a drinking partner. But the Blackthorn had none of those folks with him. He had no company but himself and the beer. And truth was, right now he far preferred the beer's company to his own. I came here, he told his beer, pointing an unstable finger at the dark brown liquid. I came here to help. I thought, I don't know, maybe I reckoned I could do some good. A man beside Betram glanced at him, shook his head, and then said something funny to his three friends. They all laughed. Betram ignored the drunkards. And they... they lied... to me. He slurred at the mug of beer. They... they lied. And I never once attacked him. Apart from that first time, but I thought... I reckoned it was him. It was all of them. I, I just... And they... He sighed. Both the best and worst thing about drinking was the fog. And right now, it was very foggy in the Blackthorn's head. The first one. The first, I... Well, he was looking for me because... Because of what I did. So I killed him first. Damned if that weren't the right thing to do. He said to the man on the other table, who appeared to be looking at him again. First time was... Well, it, it were messy. But first times always are. Gotta get him out of the way. The second... I didn't mean that one. I don't think. Just sort of bumped into him on the street. I was... 
Where was I? Land's End. Five Kingdoms, I reckon. Just bumped into him. Can't remember his face, but we stared at each other for a bit. Then he just started walking. So I... I put my axe in his neck. Funny thing, some folk actually cheered me. What are you talking about? All four of the men on the other table were looking at him now. The third. I remember that one. He was following me for sure. So I waited for him that time and... Betram stared at his beer for a few moments. The fourth. That was the bad one. The one gave me this. He tapped the scarred side of his face with his hand. My own fault, I guess. I missed, you see. Never was too good a shot with those fucking crossbow things. When he came after me, uh, he liked fire, did that one. Set the whole fucking town on fire to get me. Hundreds dead. And they said it was me. I didn't light no fires, though. Drowned that one in the end. They can't whisper their spells underwater. Reckon that's worth knowing. The fifth. Quick and clean, that one. In shade it were. Quick and clean. Never saw me coming. One stab and it were done. Quick and clean. I think he's talking about killing Arbutus, said a man with a pinched face and too much forehead. The six. The six. Hey, you talking about killing Arbutus? said the first man, the one with the bulbous nose and fat lips. There weren't many other folk in the common room, just Betram, the four on the table next to his, just about within arm's reach. Two men in a corner of the room, looking like the last thing they wanted was to draw attention to themselves. The barkeep, and a fat brown dog that couldn't seem to stop scratching at its ear. It was a dark little shithole of a tavern, if truth be told. Betram had found it in the poorer district, where he judged his last silver bits would go further. Sad thing was... He was down to his last bit. You still awake there, old man? Betram looked at the man, looked at all four of them. Fat lips, pinched face, pig nose, and the pretty one. They were all younger than him, to be sure, but not by enough to call him old man. I am still fucking awake. What the fuck do you want? Are you talking to yourself about killing Arbiters? Fat Lips said, each word loud and slow, as if Betram were deaf. The Blackthorn grinned his most horrific stretching of scarred face. The best thing about drinking in a place like this. The best thing is how sturdy the mugs are. Betram swung his mug at Fatlip's face as hard as possible. He was rewarded by an unhealthy crunch, a scream, and a spray of blood. Pinched Face was up and on his feet first and before Betram. As Thorn stumbled to a standing position, the man caught him with a meaty punch that sent Betram reeling. Pinched Face followed up with a second punch, which Betram swayed away from, then answered with a fist of his own. He felt something crack though whether it was one of his own fingers or a bone in Pinched Face's pinched face, he couldn't tell. Pignose was fumbling at something on his belt, but the pretty one charged and took Betram in the stomach, pushing him back and slamming him onto a table. Big, strong hands closed around his throat. The Blackthorn knew this was the point where he should have been choking, but he found himself laughing. Not an easy thing to do with someone's hands around your throat. but. Betram knew something. When people were trying to strangle you, they tended to leave their stones wide open. 
He brought his knee up into the man's groin just as the table collapsed underneath him. Betram heard something rip, sounded close. He rolled and found himself on top of the pretty one. The blackthorn grinned and rammed his head into the man's face. Once, twice, three times, four times, and fifth for good luck. By the time he was done, he could feel blood dripping down his face, and the mess that had once been the pretty one was considerably less pretty. A flash of shadow warned the blackthorn something was coming, and he lurched away from the broken man on the floor. Something hard caught him on his left shoulder, a flare of pain followed by a spreading numbness. Never a good sign, he knew, even in his drunken state. Pignose was swinging something heavy and metallic at him, a mace by the looks of things, though a damn blurry one. Betram dodged to his left, and a chair turned into kindling in his place. Then he ducked, and a section of the wall behind him splintered above his head. The blackthorn rushed forward and shoved an elbow into Pignose's neck. The man dropped his mace and fell backward, coughing, spluttering, and gasping. Nothing like hitting a man in the neck to disable him. Works better than the stones. Pignose tried to stumble away. Betram stepped up behind him and slid a big right arm around the man's neck. Pignose struggled. He was big and strong, but the blackthorn was bigger, stronger. After a while, the body went lip in Betram's arms, and he let it drop to the floor. Staggering, Betram looked around at the tavern. Pignose was down, unconscious. Pinched Face was in a corner, crying. The pretty one was a silent mess of blood and bone, yet still alive. That lips was gone, no doubt run off. The two shady men looked on in shady silence. The barkeep stood in open-mouthed shock, and the brown dog had stopped scratching to lap at a pool of blood on the floor. You all saw him? Betram stumbled onto a table and went down on top of it. A moment later, he was hauling himself back onto his feet, using a chair for support. They attacked me, he told everyone. With that, he staggered toward the door to the tavern and out into the warm night air. Sarth was always so damn humid at night. With a drunken stumble, Betram set off to his left. There's gotta be a brothel round here somewhere. He looked at his last silver bit. A cheap one. Chapter 53 The Blade Master The Pink Purse was not a subtle building. Built out of the same white stone as the most of the buildings in Sarth, it may be. But from every window hung a gaudy-colored cloth, each with its own crest. Inside each window hung just as gaudy draperies, no doubt designed to obscure any view of what might be going on inside the room. Even from across the street where Jezzet hid, out of sight, she could smell the perfume from the place. Thankwell suggested the plan just after Thorne's dramatic exit, and Jez had almost knocked out a few more of the Arbiter's teeth. It's not an ordinary whorehouse, he told her. The... The women there are all noble-born. It's a place where those of high birth can send their daughters to... to get them some experience in fucking. Jezzet finished for him in angry tones. So as better to seduce a man above their station. Much better to have a woman who already knows how to fuck and suck than have to teach one, right? Thankwell nodded. I... Suppose so. Some of the nobility also send their daughters there if they have too many. Uh, of course. I forgot here in Sarth you're so damn civilized. Women are married off with dowries, aren't they? So, if you can't afford to pay for someone to marry her, you just send her to a whorehouse to get fucked for the rest of her life. The Arbiter winced. It's. More like renting them to the whorehouse. The family is given half of whatever is charged for the woman. It wasn't his fault. She knew that. 
Thankwell didn't make the laws. Didn't even live in Sarth most of the time. But she'd felt like hitting someone, and he was the only one there at the time. Somehow, she managed to restrain herself. The woman who runs the place calls herself Lady Frerry, Thankwell continued. She's well known among the... among the thieves of Sarth. How do you know the thieves? Thankwell grinned, the new gap in his teeth showing. The Inquisition didn't teach me everything I know. Lady Frerry is known because she can be bribed. It won't be the first time they've dealt with a body. He tossed Jezzet a purse, felt heavy at the time, and later, when she checked it, she counted just over a hundred gold bits, a small fortune by most folks' count. Give her that. Jezzet was already shaking her head as Thankwell continued. Tell her you want a room and you want Kosh. You want me to be his whore? She almost hit him again. No. How about I just ambush him in the street and kill him, like Thorn and Keswick? You're good, Jezzet, with your sword. Probably the best I've ever seen, but Kosh. Our old master at arms used to say, Kosh was the best warrior the Inquisition had ever produced, and he's an arbiter on top of that. I don't want you to do anything but pretend you're there to... until... to fuck him. Until he puts aside his weapons. Then, Thankwell stood and handed Jezzet her sword. You're going to need this. The rest of the day had been awkward. They'd had awkward conversation, awkward sex, and awkward silence. It was like neither of them could think of anything to say to the other. Eventually, Jezzet fled with sword and golden hand. That was yesterday. She hadn't seen Thankwell for a full day. Might be, he thought she'd just gone. Took the gold and left him. Could you blame him for thinking that? You just got dressed, took the gold and ran, Jez. Not exactly a fond farewell. At least he wasn't dead, though. You have a habit of leaving men dead. It was a discomforting thought, considering what she was about to do. Two guards stood at the entrance to the pink purse, both armed and armored. One was thick of neck, and the other looked thick of head, and both looked ready for a fight. Places like this always have their own guards, and both look like they've seen a few fights. The stupid one, maybe a few too many. Jez sauntered up to the entrance, with a look on her face she hoped made her look official. It wouldn't do for them to guess that she was here to murder one of their patrons. She stopped in front of the two guards and let them look at her. They were both big men, both towered over her, and both weighed twice as much as her. Still, Jezet held her ground and didn't flinch as they leered and grinned. The thick-necked one pointed at Jezet's sword, it would look little more than a toy in one of their beefy hands, and laughed. It's not the size that matters, it's where you stick them. Jez said with a sneer. The one with the thick neck laughed and waved her in. Jezet nodded and walked inside. It was unlikely they got many female visitors. No doubt they weren't certain whether they should let her in or turn her away. Inside, the smell was a cloying stench of stale sex and sweet perfume. Think I preferred the smell of the sewer. Both of them. The room was dimly lit, with covered lanterns lending a seedy feel to the disgusting smell. Jezet hated whorehouses almost as much as she hated being called a whore. Cushioned couches and sofas scattered the floor. Some had women lounging on and others were vacant. Each woman wore a light-colored dress to contrast to the dark-colored cushions, and each dress looked like it could slip from their shoulders at a moment's notice. Some of the women looked Jez up and down, the way a predator might stare at its prey. Others just watched her with dull, vacant eyes. Should I pity them or despise them? 
Or should I just put them all out of their misery? Problem was, not all of them looked miserable. How could any woman enjoy this lifestyle? There were two more guards just inside the door, both as big and weighty as those outside, but these two looked like they had some intelligence about them. Jezet wagered she could kill them both before they even touched their weapons. Um, we don't service women. Oh, well, Alexis does, but she doesn't take payment. Jez turned to find a petite girl with big brown eyes and long, blonde hair that flowed down to her ass. She didn't even look old enough to bleed, and the green dress she wore was more or less transparent. Jez could clearly see her tiny, budding breasts beneath. Presumptuous little whore. Jezit wondered how hard she had to stare at someone before they exploded. The little whore did not explode, but she did wilt and back off a few steps. Jezit became aware of the guards closing in behind her. No, 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 Ferren, came a voice to Jez's right, spiced with an accent she had only heard once before back in the Five Kingdoms. This one is not here for that. I am right. I am. The woman was older than Jez, but not by a lot. Her skin was the color of a dark olive, and her hair was black as midnight. She had full red lips, fine features barely touched with powder, and lively dark eyes. She wore a light red dress of silk, which hugged the curves of her body while remaining as transparent as the little whore's green shift. You're a desert dweller, Jez said with narrowed eyes. The woman crossed her arms underneath her heavy breasts. Jez had never seen such large nipples before. Everything about the woman screamed, Whore! A westerner from the Five Kingdoms I am, yes. Her voice was as sweet and choking as the perfume in the air. And you have something for me. You do. After we set terms. No, no, no. I will have the payment now, whether we agree or not. Her voice became less sweet and more dangerous. Jezet gritted her teeth and sighed. Ah, <sighs> perhaps we should continue this conversation in private. The whore mistress grinned and stepped up to take hold of Jezet's arm. Mmm, she purred. I thought you'd never ask, I did. If you try to touch me, I will stab you. Jezet thought as she allowed the whore to lead her away by the arm. They passed a number of other women who stared at Jez in mute fascination as they reclined on sofas. She fought the urge to spit. You were almost sold to a whorehouse, Jez. She reminded herself and thanked all the gods she couldn't remember that her old master had saved her from that, even if he had made her pay for it every day she was with him. It appeared there were no private rooms on the bottom floor of the pink purse. So, the whore mistress led Jez to a secluded alcove. As the whore leaned forward, Jez pushed herself back into the cushioned seat. Do I scare you? The whore mistress asked. No. Ah. The woman's voice was husky. No doubt men go wild for that when she moans in their ears. Then it is something else it is. You do not agree with what we do here? Jez stared at the woman in silence. I'm going to knock out another of Thankful's teeth after this. He could have sent Thorn. That bastard would have loved it here. Well, maybe a little too much. Your purse. The whore mistress hinted. Jezet plucked it from her belt and almost threw it at the woman. Instead, she placed it on the cushion between the two of them. The whore picked it up, opened it, and made throaty moans as she looked through the contents. So, 
You come to me in men's armor with men's weapons, and you ask of me. I'd ask you to go fuck yourself, but you'd probably just enjoy it. You have a regular, Jezet said, her voice as hard as stone. An arbiter. Ah, yes. Arbiter Kosh. The things he does with some of my women. Hmm. You wish to experience them? I wish to kill him. Oh. That would explain the small fortune I have between my legs. Jezet hadn't failed to notice the whore had placed the gold purse between her thighs. What could he have done to you, I wonder, to make you want him dead so bad? Again, Jezet stared at the woman in harsh silence. It matters not, I suppose. You want to use one of my rooms? To draw him in? To strip him of his faith's armor? And then... You know how to kill, you do? Yes. Jez bit off the word. Mmm. The whore mistress purred. Murder and sex so often go hand in hand. We haven't much time. You will need to bathe and be dressed appropriately if you wish for him to pick you. Come, come. We shall have you ready in time. We shall. Jezet had never been bathed before. No sooner had she settled into the hot water than the little girl with the big brown eyes took a sponge to her. Jez snapped. She grabbed the sponge, twisted the girl's wrist, and was on the verge of drowning her when the whore mistress entered the room. The woman took one look at all the scars over Jez's body, and her expression changed into one of sympathy. That made Jezet angry all over again. Ferrin, out. The whore mistress walked over to the bed and laid out a slim blue dress. Some women. You will want to bathe alone. You will. Be quick. Your arbiter will be here soon. He will. My arbiter may already be dead, Jez thought as she watched the whore mistress retreat from the room and shut the door. She bathed, surprised as always by the amount of dirt that came off her, and patted herself dry with the toweling cloth they left her. There was a full-sized mirror in the room, but Jezet had no time for such things. She slipped the blue dress on over her head. It was so light, it almost felt like she was wearing nothing, and it hugged her figure, much like the whore mistress's red counterpart. She caught a glimpse of herself in the mirror as she turned and her expression soured. You look like a fucking whore, Jez. If only Constance could see you now. Might be then she'd rather fuck you instead of kill you. Through the dress, Jezet could see her small breasts and her soft pink nipples. She could see the hair between her legs, and she could even make out the faint outlines of some of her scars. If only breaking mirrors wasn't bad luck. Jez hid her dagger and her sword. She couldn't be seen with them, but she'd have need them soon enough. She placed her normal clothing under the bed as well. Then she walked over to the door, took in a deep breath, and made her way downstairs. As soon as she stepped out onto the landing, eyes all over the greeting room turned to her. Half a dozen different whores stared at her, some with harsh eyes, and some with dull, vacant expressions. A man, a customer by the looks of things, watched her with a hungry smile on his face as he stared at her breasts. The guards looked on as well, one giving her a gap-toothed smile, while the other winked, stuck out his tongue, and gave it a waggle. The worst bit was the whore mistress's stare, though. The olive-skinned woman stared at Jezet with frank appraisal, as a merchant might stare at a barrel of fish, and gave an approving nod at the result. Jez felt heat rising into her face as she descended the stairs. Jezet Velern is not the type of woman to blush at a few stairs. 
Such a wonderful color on your cheeks. You should show it more often, you should. The whore mistress sang as she met Jez on the last of the stairs. The whore reached out a hand to cup her cheek, but stopped short, thinking better of it. A stare that has frightened many a man, I'm sure. But we are not hoping to frighten today, we aren't. You would do better to soften the eyes, pout the lips, open just a little, like so. The man wants to imagine the lips around him, not barred to him. A whore does not. I am not a whore. Jezet forced out between her barred lips. The mistress smiled in reply. Her hands waved in front of Jezet, tracing the lines of her body beneath the dress without touching her. But such a pretty one you would make. She waved a hand at Jez's head. Though the hair will do, I suppose. Then she waved a hand at Jez's crotch. Perhaps we should trim you a little. Jez focused her angriest glare at the woman. You take a blade anywhere near my cunt, and I'll gut you with it. The whore mistress sighed. Such anger. When your man arrives, I shall do the talking, I think. Direct him to you. You can smile, I hope. Jez took a moment to calm herself, let out a sigh, and then smiled. Oh, yes, the whore mistress said with a smile of her own. He will pick you. How could he not? Why, I am tempted to pick you myself. Over here, come. She led Jez to one of the sofas, a gigantic green-cushioned monstrosity that looked like it could swallow Jez whole if she relaxed on it. Here, lounge. Hmm, try one knee cocked. Keep your legs open. Crossed legs never let any man in. Take your arms away from your chest. Many men like small breasts, but they need to be seen. Yes, that is good, it is. Jezet felt like a fool, lying in the position the mistress had cajoled her into. But she lay there all the same, hoping it wouldn't take too long. I will greet your arbiter, direct him to you. He will pick you, he will. Take him to the room. After, we will deal with the... The body. Jezet finished for the mistress. The woman nodded in reply. You do this a lot, don't you? The whore mistress smiled and lowered her voice to a whisper. I did not come here all the way from my desert to be a whore. There is money in what we women have between our legs. But... There is more money in using it to kill men. After that, the mistress moved away. She greeted two men as they entered. The first, a huge, fat man with more chins than hairs on his head. He focused his beady little eyes on Jezet, and a wet grin spread across his face. But the mistress turned him away, directed him to a girl even smaller than Jez. He'll likely crush her beneath that weight. At least it won't last very long. Fat men, in Jezet's experience, rarely lasted very long. The second man to enter the brothel looked as plain as plain could be, with nervous, jittery hands that he constantly squeezed together. He greeted the mistress before angling straight for a black-skinned beauty lounging at the back of the room. The woman greeted the man as if they were old friends. Jezet recognized the third man to enter. Kosh was tall, handsome in a clean way, with sharp features. He had the blonde hair and blue eyes, so prevalent in Sarth. Dark, dangerous eyes, but not near as pretty as Thankwell's. He wore the coat as well, the brown leather coat that marked him as an arbiter. It was clean, and looked well after, 
whereas Thankwool's was ragged and stained. Jezet noticed the scythes as well, two of them, one hanging either side of his hip. The whore mistress greeted him with a beaming smile and a kiss on the lips that allowed her to press her breasts against him. He was red-faced and grinning by the time she released him. Mistress Frary, Kosh said, his voice as handsome as his face. Am I finally to experience you instead of one of your girls? She giggled back at him. Why, Arbiter Kosh, you dare too much, you do. You know I saved myself for your emperor. You may be saving yourself for a very long time. What is a woman to do? He will come to his senses eventually, he will. I have a new one for you to enjoy today. She is rare and well-trained. Jezet fought the urge to gag, and instead put on the same smile she used to give to Drowan. Huh, Kosh grunted with a grin. She is... Beautiful, no? I bought her from Acanthia. Expensive, but worth every coin, I am assured. Though, if truth be told, no one has had the chance to experience her yet. Only arrived today, she has. Acanthia, Kosh mused. A slave? The whore mistress tooted at the arbiter. No, no, no. Slavery is outlawed in Acanthia. I merely purchased her contract. Arbiter Kosh licked at his lips. We'll settle accounts after. Does she speak? Yes, I do. I'll say, fuck you, as I slit your throat. Only when commanded to. She will say whatever you wish her to. Good. Lead the way, then, Acanthia. Jezet caught the whore mistress's anxious stare and ignored it. She took hold of Arbiter Kosh's hand and began leading him up the stairs. Once he puts aside his weapons, Thankwell had said. Until then, Jezet would continue the act though she could feel her anger bubbling up inside. Kosh couldn't even wait till they were inside the room. As Jezet went to open the door, she felt him press himself up against her. She felt his cock, hard through his trousers, poking at her backside. With a grunt, she pushed open the door and stepped through. Kosh followed her in, slamming the door in his haste. Once inside, his dark eyes moved over every inch of her body. Jezet kept her own eyes down and fought the urge to scream. Take off your dress, he commanded. Jezet shrugged out of the piece of cloth and let it puddle on the floor at her feet. Scars? Do they cut all the holes like that in Acanthia? Jezet found her hands shaking. She wanted to cover herself. Wanted to scream. Wanted to stab someone. Wanted to fuck someone. Instead, she lowered her voice to a whisper and said, Only the disobedient ones. The glint she saw in Arbiter Kosh's eyes told Jez she had guessed right about him. He liked the idea that she had been beaten for being disobedient to her masters. Some men liked women who had been hurt. Come here, he ordered. Just a little longer, Jess. She did as she was told. Kosh grabbed her, squeezed at her breasts, pressed his wet lips against her own, and started fondling at his belt buckle. Jesset suffered his clumsy attentions and then helped him with his buckle. His scythes hit the floor with a metallic thump. Then she pushed the coat off his shoulders, and that too hit the floor. His trousers were next, and then his undergarments. Jezet ripped at his shirt and flung it aside. Her target, Arbiter Kosh, stood there, naked and weaponless in front of her. 
Now! Jezet pushed him backwards onto the bed. He lay there staring at her, a curious grin on his face. Jez climbed on top of him, took hold of his cock, and guided it inside of her as she lowered herself down. He's smaller than Thankwell. At first, she began to move her hips, up and back, forward and down, faster and faster. She knew she should be smiling. Men liked it when she smiled. Instead, she found herself staring at Kosh in disgust. Either the arbiter inside of her didn't notice, or he didn't care, staring back at her with a hungry face, red and panting, grunting and groaning. Jezet continued to grind her hips. Jez had fucked many men in her life. Some were fat, some were thin, some smelled of stale alcohol and sweat, others of flowery perfume. Some had worn armor, some had worn silk, some were rich, some didn't have a single bit to their name. Some of them had names, others had been nameless drunken fucks. Most times it had been willing, but sometimes it had been rape. Never before had she felt truly disgusted in herself, though. Fight or fuck, Jez. You always choose fuck. She remembered what the Sword of the North had told her. Whores fuck their way out of fights, not blade masters. Kosh was panting now, his breath coming out as grunts of pleasure. His hands squeezed painfully at her small breasts and then ran down her body, and they gripped hold of her ass. Still, she moved her hips, up and down. She could feel him inside of her but took no pleasure of it. A blade master without a blade. Jezet leaned down to kiss the arbiter and slid her hand underneath the pillow at the head of the bed. Her fingers closed around the hilt of the dagger she had hidden there. Oh God, yes! Kosh wheezed out. Jezet sat up and drove her dagger through the arbiter's heart. Chapter 54 The Blackthorn Betram sat at the campfire, staring into the flames, as they danced and fought, to see which one could reach furthest into the darkness. He chewed on a strip of charred horse flesh, tasted like shoe, but meat was meat. He took a swig of the bottle in his hand, cheap spirit, tasted like fire and vomit. That seemed a little odd. Alcohol tended to taste like vomit, coming up, not going down. Bones sat cross-legged on the bare earth, cleaning his bones with yellow spit and brown rag. The giant grinned as he went about his grisly business, and bled from a hundred small cuts. Swift lay on the ground, one leg twisted at a horrific angle, snoring. Petrum didn't reckon the bastard was really asleep. Swift liked to play stupid games like that. The boss tore a strip of seared horse flesh from the spit and shoved it into the bloody mess of jagged bone and raw flesh that had once been his face. Betram could see muscles twitching, but there was no face, no nose, no eyes, no mouth, just spurting blood and a horrible, squelching noise. How'd you do it? came Green's voice. Betram found the boy's body sitting across from him. He could see it through the flames. Green's head was lying on the floor just a couple of feet away. Do what? Betram asked the head. How'd you kill him? The Arbors? How a decapitated head could speak should have been a matter for concern. Betram knew. Instead, he just ignored it and looked for Henry. The little imp was nowhere to be seen. Fled or dead, he didn't know. But she wasn't here amongst this gruesome company. Somewhere, Betram heard the laughing dogs of the wilds laughing at him. Seemed they were laughing at him, at least. They'd be here soon enough to feast upon the corpses of his dead friends. 
and green. Get up, the bloody mess of the boss's head said in a voice that wasn't his. Get up! Betram felt something tapping his foot. He looked down to find Green's head had rolled closer and was bumping against his boot, pushing itself with his tongue. Get up! The boss's faceless face insisted. Betram tried to open his eyes. Felt like the weight of the world was pulling his eyelids back shut. He started to drift off again. Get up! By Volmar, if you don't get up, I'll call the guard! Again, Betram tore his eyelids open and let out a groan. It felt like someone was stamping on his head from inside his skull. Every bit of him felt heavy, sluggish, and painful. He was lying on something hard and wooden, felt a lot like a floor, and Betram had slept on enough floors to know what one felt like. There was something wet and foul-smelling under his mouth, up by his nose. Vomit, Betram said to himself. Yes, vomit, vomit, which I will have to clean before the next person wants to stay here. Here? Betram asked as he scrabbled at the wood floor with his hands and pushed himself up. It felt like trying to lift a small house. Yes, here. Get up and go. Now! You've already stayed here too long. I should have called the guard. Too long, Betram said. Fragments of memory were coming back to him. He had stumbled into this inn, slapped his last bits on the counter, and demanded a room. He glanced at the window. It was still dark. Yes, too long. Now go. Betram looked at the tall, skinny, ugly man. It's still night. I paid for... You paid for a night? You've been here a night and a day! What? Betram's head screamed in pain with each pounding thump. His hands went to the Arbiter's charm around his neck, the one that should keep away the hangover. It was gone. You're saying it's tomorrow? Already? Tomorrow, tonight, get out! Oh, fuck. I gotta go. Betram lurched to his feet and stumbled as the world spun around him. He hit the wall and caught himself on it, then fumbled his way to the door. Blah! He doubled over and retched. Vile, burning acid spattered the floor, and Betram caught a whiff of urine. Seems he'd pissed himself at some point. Get out! Betram stumbled his way to the stairs and started down them, his head pounding all the way down. He tripped on the last two steps and hit the ground face first. Only at the last moment did he think to turn his head to stop the fall from breaking his nose. He pushed himself back to his feet, stumbled into a table, and staggered toward the door. Outside, the night was cool and crisp. Something seemed wrong about that. Sarth was never cool. It's night. Betram spun. The world spun the other way, and he crashed into someone. A woman hit the stone with a gasp of pain. Betram fought the urge to vomit again, swallowed it down. By all the gods, he wished he still had that charm. Someone grabbed Betram by his leathers, a man, tall and broad. How dare you? What time is it? Betram asked. What? Betram shrugged the man's hands off and grabbed him by his fancy cloth shirt and shook him. What fucking time is? Um, uh, about two hours after dusk. Fuck! Betram shouted blasting the man with sour breath. Which way to the Inquisition? I... uh... Which fucking way? The man pointed. Betram shoved him to the floor next to the woman and turned in the direction he had pointed and started running. 
His feet pounded on the stone ground in a steady rhythm with the beating inside of his head. Despite the darkness, the world felt so bright, Betram found himself squinting as Sarth spun past him in a drunken blur. Buildings loomed over him in towering white silence. People stared at him, or ignored him, it made no matter. Some even shouted after him, but their words were lost, drowned out by the deafening drum inside his skull. He was looking for something he recognized. Anything. A landmark, a tavern, a shop, a brothel, a church. The second time he stopped to retch up what little was left in his stomach, Betram had the idea to look up. The Black Tower of the Inquisition loomed above the city of Sarth, swaying and bending over the white buildings below it, like some great drunken tower about to vomit over the pristine. Betram shook himself. There was no time. He had to find Kessick. Had to kill the Arbiter before he reached the Inquisitor's estate. Too many of Betram's friends had died of late. Bones, the boss, Swift, Henry, all gone, dead, or fled. All gone. He wasn't about to let that happen again. He had few enough friends left in this world. He wasn't about to let the last two die because he was too drunk to hold up his end of the bargain. The Blackthorn tried to figure out where he was and where he needed to be. The Inquisition Tower was close, crowding the sky above him like a dark monolith. Kessick went right, out of the gates, so Betram could cut him off by going left. It seemed to make sense, so he stumbled into another run and cut left through alleyways and byways, hoping he didn't come across one of the Sarth canals. Not that a dip in some water wouldn't do his smell the world of good. Betram stumbled out into a large street. In front of him was a bakery he recognized. He'd been this way before many times, always following Kessick. He turned to his right and ran, sprinted. The world focused in around him until the Blackthorn was watching through a muted, painful blur of a tunnel. Up ahead, he saw a coat. The coat. Betram unhooked his axe from his belt and gritted his teeth. Fifteen paces from Kessick, the Blackthorn slid to a halt and launched his hand axe. Kessick! Betram roared. The Arbiter just started to turn as the axe head bit into his back with a solid thump. The body hit the stone floor face first. Chapter 55 The Arbiter Thankwell stood outside Inquisitor Heron's estate and waited in the shadows, hidden from view by the trunk of a large ancient oak. He waited, and he watched. She was there. He had seen her enter an hour ago, no doubt sitting down to an evening meal by now. He twisted a small pewter necklace around his fingers. Necklaces were one of the hardest things to steal from a person. To take something from around a woman's neck without her noticing, was a skill not many possessed. It had taken Thankwell years to learn, but learn it he did, much to the shock of some of the other thieves. It was nerves, he decided then. He was nervous, and it was scaring him into inaction. By now, Jez should have killed Kosh, and the Blackthorn, assuming he hadn't just fled, should have taken care of Kessick. Only Inquisitor Heron remained and she needed to be dealt with before she heard of the other's deaths. He slipped his arms through the sleeves of his coat and tugged the leather garment straight. If he was going to do this, he was going to do it as an arbiter of the Inquisition. He stashed the necklace in one pocket and checked the others, making sure he remembered where each of his runes were hidden, where the charms were secreted away. It had been months since he'd last worn his Arbiter's coat. Now he was, it felt right, almost as if a part of him had been missing, but was now restored. Thankwell made one final check of his preparations. A sleepless charm wrapped around his left arm. It wouldn't do to be knocked unconscious. His sword loosened in its scabbard, his pistol loaded and tucked away in his belt. The guards blocked him at the gate. Two big men in white, 
and both looked more than a little nervous. Thankwell stared at each of them in turn. Arbiter Thankwell Darkheart, here to see the Inquisitor. Stand aside. Uh... The bigger of the two guards bit his lip. A brown lip, Thankwell noticed. The man chewed too much cashier weed. Do you have an appointment? Thankwell spat, a nasty habit he'd picked up from somewhere. Wasn't aware I needed one. Move aside, or I will move you. The guard looked pained. Yes, sir. He stepped away, and Thankwell strode past them both, through the open gate, and into the Inquisitor's grounds. It was a beautiful estate, Thankwell couldn't deny. Flower beds in every color he could imagine, all lit by the ruddy orange glow of hanging lanterns. Short grass, a gardener's worst nightmare. An eight-tiered fountain with crushed white marble in each bowl to allow the water to filter and drain. Thankwell approached the main door, took a deep, steadying breath, and knocked. It took only a few moments before the door was opened. A thin, balding man stood on the threshold, bathed in the warm light that spilled out from behind him. Arbiter Thankwell Darkheart, here to see the Inquisitor, Thankwell said in his most officious tone. Regarding... Thankwell stared at the man in silence. Of course. If you'll follow me, Arbiter. No, I'll wait out here. Go fetch your master. You want me to... Uh, of course. The servant turned and hurried away. Thankwell walked back down the path a short way. If he was going to fight an Inquisitor, he'd rather not do it in a confined space. It didn't take long for the Inquisitor to respond to his summons. She walked out of the doorway to her mansion with an easy grace and a warm smile that lit up her already beautiful face even in the dim lantern light. Inquisitor Celise Harron looked to be only a little older than Thankwell himself, but the truth, he knew, was that she had lived for close to eighty years. The slightest hint of crow's feet was beginning to show at the corners of her eyes. But, other than that, she looked no older than the first time he had seen her forty years previous. Her face was soft and caring, beautiful in a kind way that belied her position as an inquisitor. Her hair was long and blonde, tied into a braid that reached down to the small of her back. Her eyes shone with a blue light, even in the darkness. She wore a light set of cotton trousers and a matching shirt underneath her inquisitor's coat, identical to an arbiter's except for being white instead of brown. Somehow, it all made her seem pure and holy, and for a moment, Thankwell was unsure. Arbiter Thankwell. Her voice was soft and fluid. We have been worried. It has been months since you last contacted the Inquisition. We feared the worst. His hands were shaking a little, just like when he needed to steal something. Inquisitor Heron was standing right there in front of him. He knew he should attack, not give her chance to defend herself. The Blackthorn had said, The way to kill an arbiter is to not let him know you're coming. And that went doubly true for an Inquisitor. But she was Inquisitor Heron, the kindest of the Inquisitors, the only one who had ever had a good word to say about him. The only one who didn't look at him like he was a heretic. Abita? Are you all right? She asked in a sweet voice. There was no compulsion there. No will trying to subvert his own. In training, the Inquisition forced an arbiter to use the compulsion until they were unable to ask questions without using it. There was no way around it. Even the Grand Inquisitor was bound by it. But the compulsion was a power given to them by their belief in Volmar. 
if an arbiter or an inquisitor turned away from the faith. Thankwell noticed Inquisitor Harren was armed. A cruel-looking black steel sword hung from her belt, its jagged blade unsheathed and waiting. Why? Thankwell asked, his own compulsion crashing against the Inquisitor's will like a wave hitting a cliff. The question was too broad, too unfocused. Even if she hadn't been protected, it would not have worked. Why what, Arbiter? Why betray the Inquisition? What are you talking about, Thankwell? I, I would never. I know about you and Host. I know about Keswick. I know about the contract, Inquisitor. Thankwell interrupted her plea of innocence. Inquisitor Harren sighed. Ah, <sighs> did Host at least put up a fight? He shouldn't even have known about the contract. That must have been Keswick's fault. The Inquisitor took a step forward off the porch of her mansion and toward Thankwell. She smiled at him, a predator's smile. But how much do you know? Thankwell backed away. I know you're putting creatures from the void into people's bodies. Is that how you turned Kosh? She giggled. <laughs> Kosh? He came to me on his own. He saw the truth. All I did was confirm it for him. You, of all people, should see it too, Thankful Darkheart. What truth? Do you remember when Arbiter Yellen brought you in, Thankful? She asked him. He was a very pretty man, that one, but such a vicious streak. I was a newly graduated Arbiter myself, and I saw him walk you in, one hand on your shoulder. He stopped in the middle of the compound and said, This boy's name is Thankful Darkheart. Do you remember? The day he gave you that name. I do. All around you, Arbiters and servants alike, stared at you in disgust, or laughed at you. Yet you met all of their stares head-on and didn't flinch. All they saw in you was a child of two heretics burned for their evil. But not me. I saw something else in you. Potential. Thankwell barely remembered that day. He had been somewhere close to eight years old, half-starved, and he'd just watched his own parents burning screaming. He remembered very little of that day, or of the weeks that followed, but he remembered the scorn, the derision. He was the first dark heart in the Inquisition for near a thousand years. After all, a child born of heresy was more like to turn to the darkness. Do you have a reason for bringing that up, Inquisitor? The Inquisition has grown stagnant, too bogged down in tradition and prejudice, unable to see power, even when it is in front of them. She looked up at the sky and took a deep breath, then exhaled slowly. A thousand years ago, all the Inquisitors were as powerful as our Grand Inquisitor Vance. Now? Now? He is a dying remnant of the past, too stubborn like the rest to realize that their time is at an end. The Inquisition isn't strong enough to stand up to the darkness that's coming, Thankwell. Kosh saw it as I do. How could he not? One as powerful as him could easily see the others around him were not his match. He came to me for guidance seeking answers that he already knew, but asking the wrong questions. I showed him the truth. By putting a demon from the void in his body. Again, Thankwell's compulsion crashed against her will, impotent and powerless. I can show you the truth as well, Thankwell. I can show you what's coming. 
It's time to choose a side. I already have. She laughed. <laughs> they don't even realize what they have in you, do they? They mock you, scorn you, fear you. And yet, you are the one that's here, fighting for their survival, like some sort of paragon of misguided justice. Thankwell drew his sword and held it out in front of him, edging forward a step. Kosh and Kessick are both dead, Inquisitor. What? For the first time, uncertainty crossed her beautiful face. You couldn't have. I didn't come back to Sarth alone. Tell me, Arbiter Darkheart, once you are dead, do you think even a single one of them will believe you were anything more than a heretic? Even if you should succeed in killing me, the Inquisition will execute you for it. Once you're dead, they'll find the proof. They'll find the contract. Thankwell pressed for information. Inquisitor Heron laughed. Do you believe I'd leave such a dangerous artifact lying around, Arbiter? No. The contract is safe. I am the only person who could ever retrieve it. The Void, Thankwell said. She smiled. Yes. The demons of the Void are sworn to obey the Inquisition, and I ordered them to take the contract and never speak of it to anyone but myself. If that was true, then there was no proof. The Inquisitor was right. Thankwell would be killed by the Inquisition on suspicion of heresy, even if he should win. Then, Inquisitor Harren's sword was in her hand, and with a silent grin, she came at him. Chapter 56 The Blade Master She watched the blood well up around the blade of the dagger. A thin red line ran down the Arbiter's skin and soaked into the silk bed linen. She needed to get dressed, put on some real clothing, and fetch the whore mistress to deal with the body. Then I need to go check on Thankwell. He might need my help. Jez pushed herself up onto her knees and wiped between her legs with a corner of the bedsheet. Arbiter Kosh's eyes flicked open. What? The Arbiter's knee crashed into Jez's crotch, and she realized the scream of pain was her own. Then there was a foot on her belly. Kosh grunted as he pushed, and Jez found herself crashing against the far wall and dropping to the floor, winded and whimpering in pain. Never been through that before? Jez looked up at his words still gasping for air. Kosh rolled from the bed and stretched, the dagger still lodged in his chest. It should be right through his heart! It told me death might hurt, but I never thought. Who are you? Kosh took hold of the dagger and pulled. The blade slipped out of his skin with a small squirt of blood, and the wound sealed itself closed. After just a moment, only a thin red line remained to prove there had been any wound at all. Jez didn't answer. She gathered her legs beneath her and made ready to move. A blade master without a blade. Kosh dropped the dagger and moved toward his discarded clothing. So? Who are you? Why did you kill me? As the Arbiter knelt down to take hold of one of his scythes, Jez made her move. She leapt toward the small dresser, shoved her hand behind it, and pulled out her sword. Your dagger couldn't kill me. What makes you think you're... As Jez drew her sword from its scabbard, two small slips of paper floated to the floor. Ah! <sighs> Kosh grunted. He was staring at her sword. It took Jez a moment to realize why. The steel blade was glowing. It wasn't much of a glow, just a slight sparkle along the metal, but it was unmistakable. 
Kosh snatched up one of his scythes and ran. A moment later, he crashed through the window, glass, wood, and all. Jezit was already moving when she heard the thud of the Arbiter hitting the ground outside. She looked out the window to see the dead man running up the street, away from the whorehouse. Jez looked at her sword again, and she remembered Thankwell handing it to her and saying, You're going to need this. He would have told me if he had known. Jezit leaped out of the window and for a brief moment, she was falling. Then she hit the ground, rolled to a stop, and sent a silent prayer of thanks to the gods that the building wasn't any taller. Then she turned and started sprinting after the fleeing Arbiter. Not for the first time in her life, Jessit was glad of having small breasts. She'd seen big women try to run, and it looked a painful and dangerous affair. Fact was, she'd much prefer to be fully clothed, but she knew if she'd wasted the time, she'd have lost Kosh. The Arbiter was in front of her, but not by much, and she was quicker than him, and gaining. He turned a corner and was lost from sight. Two seconds later, Jezit turned the same corner and saw him again, still running. There weren't many people on the streets, but those that were stared and pointed and shouted. Jezit tried her best to ignore them. She wanted to cover herself, cover her scars. She was just a few paces behind Kosh when he slid to a halt and spun around, his scythe cutting through the air toward her. Jezit had no time to stop. She leapt to her left, trying to avoid the razor-sharp blade. The weapon's edge passed by her arm. She felt the air rush past, but the blade itself missed. Jez rolled again and came up in a half-crouch, facing the Arbiter. Kosh stood facing her naked as the day he was born, with only a single scythe as his protection. Jez crouched, just as naked, holding her glowing sword in one hand. All around them people stared. Who are you? Kosh asked again. Why are you trying to kill me? You're no arbiter. His eyes on her made Jez's skin crawl. You need to end this before reinforcements arrive, Jez. She sprang at him, slashing her sword at his face. The Arbiter raised his scythe, and the blades sang as they clashed together. He was already moving, trying to get on Jezit's left side, trying to get on her weak side. Jezit was already moving too, attacking. A high slash, a low jab, a leap to the left, feint further left, then slash at the right. Each attack was blocked by singing steel. Then the Arbiter attacked. He came on hard and fast, his scythe slashing first one way, then the other. Jezit dodged each time. Dangerous things, scythes. Even when blocked, the blade can hit you, and up close they're fucking deadly. Kosh was muttering something as he attacked, the same way Thankwell did. Blessings. Explains why he's so fast. And he was fast. Each attack flew at her, and each one was followed by another just as quick, just as deadly. Jezit danced and dodged, ducked and weaved, blocked and fell back. But what she needed to do was attack. She didn't know much about runes, yet she knew the magic affecting her sword wouldn't last forever. The blade of the scythe angled toward her head. She blocked with her sword, even as she leapt to her right. The scythe crushed through her defense and passed within an inch of her neck. Jezit found herself shaking. Again, Kosh was moving, trying to get on her left side. The Arbiter was still talking, still muttering, still saying something. But his wasn't the only voice. There were others. A lot of others. Jez risked a glance and found people all around her. Lots of them, all standing and staring, and talking and staring. Before she could stop herself, she found she was covering her scars with her left arm, even while trying to defend against the Arbiter with the sword in her right. Too many people, too many eyes. She couldn't cover the scars on her back, not even all the ones on her chest, let alone her arms and her legs, and they were all staring at her. 
Her movements became sluggish, slow. She blocked another attack from the scythe and staggered from the impact. The Arbiter pushed, and Jez found herself falling. She landed hard on the cold stone and grunted in pain, then rolled away just as the scythe cut through the air where her head had been a moment before. She scrambled to her bare feet and backed away. The Arbiter came on, smiling. He smiles like the Sword of the North. Like he knows he's already won. She still remembered everything that man had said. Whores fuck their way out of fights, not blade masters. We're not chosen, not trained. We're born. Some people are born to be blade masters, born to be the shades of death. And until you let go of that fear, you'll never be one of us. Jezet felt the heat rising in her. She dodged another slash from the scythe. She wasn't sure what made her more angry, that the Sword of the North had said that to her, that she hadn't done anything about it, that he was right, or that she was about to lose her life to the naked man she'd just fucked and murdered. Jez took her left hand away from her chest and gripped hold of her sword in both hands. The next attack came and she brushed it aside and answered with two lightning-fast slashes of her own. Kosh blocked one and stumbled away from the other, surprise showing in his eyes. Jezet gave him no time to recover. She pushed the attack, slashing here, jabbing there, dodging to the side, and cutting at the Arbiter, not giving him a moment to collect himself. Kosh started whispering under his breath again. He dodged away from Jez, then back in close with near inhuman speed. The scythe flew toward her face. Jezet caught the blade on her own, twisted it, and pushed. The shock on the Arbiter's face was a beautiful thing to see as he found the flats of both his scythe and Jezet's glowing sword pushed up against his naked chest. Jezet shifted the grip on her sword and spun away. There was a spray of blood and a scream, and Kosh's scythe bounced off the stone ground, his hand still attached. The Arbiter was clutching at the bloody stump of his right arm with his left. Jezet danced around and thrust her sword up underneath his left armpit. She knew the exact placement of her sword. Her old master had made her memorize all the vulnerable locations on a person's body. The blade slid through flesh, and for the second time that night, the Arbiter's heart was pierced. She gave the blade a twist and then pulled it out in a gush of wet, red blood. Kasha's body slumped to the floor and gave a final twitch. My name is Jezet Velern. Thankful Darkheart sent me to kill you, she told the corpse. But it was too late. No sense in talking to a dead man. Jez looked down at herself, naked and spattered with blood. She looked like a half-demon herself. Lots of blood. None of it mine, though. It's never mine. All around her, people were still watching, still whispering, still staring. She ignored them all. Let them look. Let them see what a shade of death looks like. Men clad in all white and armed with spears surrounded her. Ten of them. One of them said something, but Jessit didn't hear him. Couldn't hear him over the roaring in her ears, demanding for more blood. The ten men started to close in around her as one, edging their way forward with spears lowered. Jezet grinned. They think to take down a shade of death with just ten men? They should have brought an army. Chapter 57 The Blackthorn Betram staggered over to the body. He was dripping with sweat. It weren't a bad shot. He had to congratulate himself. Head pounding, arms shaking, and a moving target, and he still managed to hit it square. Fact was, it were a damn good shot. He put his foot on the Arbiter's back and reached down to pull his axe free. It had bitten deep, 
severed the spine by the looks of things, and Betram had to wrench to pull the thing out. Drops of blood came free with the axe, and the Blackthorn felt them spatter his face. Best make sure to finish you off, he said to the corpse as he rolled it over to get in a clean chop at the Arbiter's neck. Betram couldn't wait to see the look on Thankwell's face as the Blackthorn dropped Keswick's head at his feet. The face staring back at him was young, smooth-skinned, with a dusting of hair on the top lip. Almost reminded Betram of Green, if truth be told. One thing was for sure, though. The body was not Keswick. The Blackthorn had killed the wrong Arbiter. A hand grabbed Betram by the shoulder and wrenched him to his feet. A moment later, a fist connected with his face, turning his vision a bright, blinding white. He hit the floor still blind and scrambled away, moaning with the pain. He pushed himself to his feet just as the light began to dim and his vision returned. A man stood over the body of the dead boy, staring at Betram with cold, icy eyes. Kiss! Betram near screamed at the pain in his face. Didn't take much of a feel with his hand to realize his jaw was broken. Seemed Keswick had one hell of a punch to him. Still, the Blackthorn had suffered far worse and came out kicking. It wasn't like a broken jaw could make him any less pretty. Might be it even improved his looks. Keswick just stood there, watching Betram. No Arbiter Coat. Seemed he'd given it to the dead boy and had no intentions of taking it back. The Blackthorn tightened his grip on his axe and made ready to attack. Keswick held no weapons, but an Arbiter was never easy prey. He might have any number of magical tricks hidden away. I've had a feeling of late I was being followed. Never thought it would turn out to be the Blackthorn, Keswick said in a cool, emotionless voice. Betram might have grinned, but he already knew how much that would hurt with a broken jaw. Looking at I can't even... He managed with a lot of wincing. The Blackthorn was a good foot taller than Keswick. He had the reach and the weight advantage, and he was armed. He started forward. I don't think I'm a random target, Keswick said still standing over the body of the dead boy. Someone sent you. Was it Arbiter Darkheart? That made Betram pause. He might have asked a question himself, but his jaw didn't feel up to it. Yes, I think it was. I've heard he was back. He's the one that killed Host, wasn't he? And the woman, the one who told me Host was dead. Also one of his. The Blackthorn didn't like how much this Arbiter seemed to know. He loosened his grip on his axe a little and charged. Keswick didn't move. He waited while Betram charged him, waited as the axe fell toward his skull. At the last moment, the Arbiter moved with inhuman speed, grabbing hold of the Blackthorn's wrist and twisting with such force that Betram roared in pain despite the broken jaw. The axe clattered to the floor, and Betram received a heavy push in the back that sent him stumbling over the dead body on the floor. Oh, I wasn't finished, Blackthorn, Keswick said in a reproachful tone. So, you and the woman are working for Arbiter Darkheart. Are there any more of you, or is it just the three of you? Betram made no move, nor did he answer just stared at the Arbiter in mute anger. Yes, just the three of you. Not the most dangerous force ever assembled. So, if you're here to kill me, he sent the woman to kill Kosh, didn't he? You do know about Kosh? Yes, I think you do. It didn't make sense to Betram. He wasn't answering any of Keswick's questions, but the man seemed to know the truth anyway. His axe was on the floor at the Arbiter's feet. He drew the dagger, 
the blade Thankwell had given him as payment. Enchanted, he said. Might be that was just what he needed to kill the bastard. So, that would mean Arbiter Darkheart himself has gone to confront Inquisitor Heron, Kessick concluded. I wonder if she'll kill him, or if he'll join us. Betram whipped his left hand out, and a throwing knife flew at Kessick. The Arbiter made no move to dodge, and the knife buried itself in his leg. The Blackthorn was only a second behind the knife, his enchanted dagger whipped at Kessick three times. The first, Kessick ducked. The second cut a scratch into his arm, but the third, the Arbiter caught. Kessick had hold of Betram's right hand, the dagger tip just inches from the Arbiter's heart. The Blackthorn punched at the man's face with his three-fingered left hand, but Kessick didn't even flinch. Betram thrust his head toward the man's face. A hand shot up and grabbed the Blackthorn by the throat, squeezing, choking him. Arbiter Kessick twisted Betram's right hand around until the dagger was between them. The bastard was so damned strong, the Blackthorn couldn't move, couldn't breathe. That's a very nice dagger, Kessick said, his voice as flat and cold as his eyes. Then his hand was gone from Betram's throat, and the blade was gone from Betram's hand. The Blackthorn felt the dagger go in and out, in and out, in and out, in. Kessick let go, and Betram stumbled backward, tripped over the body at his feet, and hit the floor hard. His head cracked against the stone, and his vision went white again. It cleared into a fuzzy haze, and Thorn looked at his chest. Blood was seeping into his leathers. The dagger stood up, proud and silver. But it didn't hurt. Fact was, he didn't feel much, just numb. Thorn coughed and felt blood on his face. He was staring at the sky, at the stars, at the moon, at the endless black above him. Then Kessick was there, standing over him, looking down at him in the same way he had looked at the boy, the boy he'd killed. Or had Betram killed him? It was getting hard to remember. The Blackthorn coughed again and tried to move, tried to get away from the Arbiter, but his limbs were so heavy, they just twitched at his commands. Fuck, Betram tried to say, but all that came out was a cough and more blood. You are an impressive man, Blackthorn. To still be clinging to life after that, most would just die, give up, but not you. You like living, don't you? Yes. Yes, you do. Pity, really. I'm wondering, though, just how much pain it will take before the Blackthorn does give up. The last thing Betram saw was Kessick's fingers reaching into his eye socket. Chapter 58 The Arbiter on the ship, during the voyage to Sarth, Jezid had beaten the hell out of Thankwell every day with a blunted sword, and every day he had gone to bed wondering if it was an exercise in futility. Now, though, he was glad, and more than glad, that he'd gone through the ordeal. Thankwell was certain Inquisitor Heron would have cut him in two more than once already if Jez hadn't trained him. He blocked a savage downward cut, stepped back, and then stepped forward again, closing the distance between himself and the Inquisitor. Their blades met with a hiss of steel on steel and a shower of sparks. Two enchanted swords, each driven by the augmented strength of a blessing, seemed to make for an impressive display. Thankwell just wished he wasn't the one fighting, so he could have enjoyed the spectacle. The Inquisitor wrenched both swords to the side, then slapped Thankwell in the face. Something stuck to his cheek. A charm. 
Thankwell found he couldn't remember the words to any of the blessings. He tore the charm away with a stinging scrape, but too late, the words came back to him. Inquisitor Harren was already upon him, her speed inhuman, her strength overpowering. He blocked as best he could, but her blows sent him reeling first one way, then the other. He started whispering the blessings again, and they were back on level footing. Although Thankwell's actual footing appeared to be in a flower bed full of red and white roses, Inquisitor Heron whispered something to her sword and then drove the point into the earth below their feet. Thankwell readied himself for the effect. Magic could do many things. Thankwell had seen it make the earth shake. He had forced the sky to open up and rain. He'd seen apparitions and illusions. And he'd seen fire burst into an inferno from nothing. What he'd never seen was plants bending to a person's will. Something thin and wiry crawled up his ankle and held fast, sharp points poking into his skin. The flowers beneath him had coiled their way around his legs, holding him. He tried to free himself, but the plants seemed unusually strong, and then the Inquisitor was there, and her sword was flying toward him. Thankwell barely had time to think. He reversed his own sword and thrust it downward toward his right leg. Hot, wet pain sprang forth from his ankle, but he was free. He stepped into the Inquisitor's attack with his free leg, twisting his other ankle. Her sword skimmed his left side, opening a shallow wound near his ribs, and he was inside her guard. A crazy thought sprang into Thankwell's mind. What would the Blackthorn do? Would he butt the woman with his head? And so, that's what Thankwell did. Inquisitor Heron staggered backward with a scream of pain and put a hand to her face. Blood dripped between her fingers onto the earth below. Blood dripped from her blade as well, and that was Thankwell's. He put a hand to his side where her sword had scored him. It hurt like the hells, but it wasn't too serious. At least not for now. His ankle, however, was more serious. It screamed as he tried to put weight on it, and Thankwell found himself wishing he knew more about medical charms. He cut away the remaining plants restraining him and limped toward the Inquisitor. She was staring at the blood in her hand. As she looked up at Thankwell, he could see her nose was bent, broken. Her small mouth and delicate pointed chin were stained red. Her eyes held all the fury of a raging fire. If Thankwell hadn't been trying to kill her, he would have liked very much to run away from those eyes. The Inquisitor dug a hand into a pocket of her coat and pulled out a small chip of wood. She snapped it in between her thumb and fingers and threw the two pieces of wood at Thankwell. He crouched down, ready to spring into action and waited. Nothing happened. Slowly, he shifted his weight from his bad ankle to his good one, breathing heavily from the tension, sucking air into his lungs and out like a bellows. Inquisitor Heron pointed her black serrated sword at Thankwell, and he wheezed in a breath, waiting for the rune to take effect. The way the light caught her sword made it look as if the coloring on the surface of the metal was shifting, moving, a swirling darkness within the blade. She charged. Thankwell sucked in another breath, panicking. There was no air. He was suffocating out in the open. He dropped to one knee, gasping. His limbs felt so heavy, so slow, almost like the whole world was pressing in around him, on top of him, crushing him. The Inquisitor's first swing sent Thankwell's sword spinning out of his hand into the darkness of the night. Her second almost took off his left arm, but he managed to stumble backward just in time, not fast enough to stop a new cut from opening. Her third attack would have skewered him, yet Thankwell stepped around it and close to her again. He put both hands on her chest, and with his last breath, whispered a blessing of strength and pushed. The Inquisitor flew away from him into the unnatural darkness waiting behind. Thankwell stumbled backwards, looking for his sword. There in the distance, he saw a glint of light on metal and crawled toward it. When he'd fallen on his hands and knees, he wasn't sure. 
All of a sudden, he could breathe again. Cool, crisp air rushed into his lungs, making him cough and spatter, but he was glad of it. Life flooded back into his limbs. The world no longer closed in around him, crushing him. He looked back at the rune on the earth behind him. Powerful magic and far beyond his own capabilities. He had the sinking feeling he was overmatched in this fight. Still, he crawled over to his sword and stood, blade in hand, ready to face the Inquisitor's next attack. She was nowhere to be seen. Darkness closed in thick around the Arbiter, and he glanced first one way, then the other, yet there was no sign of the Inquisitor. He looked up to see thick, black-gray clouds had gathered, arraying themselves above to shut out all light. Even the hanging lanterns only seemed to illuminate small patches of the darkness. I'm disappointed, Thankful, the voice echoed from behind him. Thankful spun around and squinted into the darkness. He whispered a blessing of sight, and there she was, no more than twenty paces away, staring at him as if the darkness was as bright as summer's day. A sad smile graced her face, making her look like a ghoul, with the crimson mask of blood running from her nose. They told me you excelled with runes and charms and blessings, but here you are, falling for child's tricks and relying on brute force. Her voice floated out of the darkness at him. Thankwell might have laughed at her calling that rune a child's trick. He hadn't even known it was possible to do such a thing. He wasn't even sure what it had done, but he'd be damned if he was falling for it a second time. He was preparing for an attack of his own when he noticed the chip out of his sword. An enchanted blade with a charm should mean that the edge never dulled. The blade would never break. But there it was, a small chip of metal missing. What in Volmar's name is your sword made from? Thankwell called out. Inquisitor Heron laughed a warm, merry sound that might have made Thankwell smile had the two of them not been trying to kill each other. Ha 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 ha. You've noticed that, have you? A knife flew out of the darkness toward Thankwell. He raised his sword to deflect it away and broke the paper rune wrapped around the knife. Both his sword and his entire right arm burst into flame. With a yell, Thankwell dropped his sword and fell backward. He started rolling on the ground, trying to put out the flames, but succeeded only in lighting more of his coat on fire. He struggled out of the burning leather and scrambled away. His right hand was a mass of pain, red-black skin, and blood and blisters. So, Thankwell scooped up his sword in his left and stood, trying to find the Inquisitor in the darkness. He glanced back at his coat once, still burning away. All his carefully prepared charms and runes were in the pockets of that coat. All of his runes. He lurched into a sprint, not caring where he ran to, as long as it was away from the coat. Boom! The world turned upside down and inside out as the explosive runes inside the coat activated all at once. Thankwell found himself rolling to a stop on the grassy earth his eyes wet with tears from the pain in his hand. Smoke and dust filled the air. Bits of earth and mud rained down from above, and his ears were a cacophony of ringing. The Arbiter tried pushing himself to his feet, but his left leg collapsed under him, a small circle of metal embedded in the flesh of his calf. It took a moment to realize it was one of the buttons from his coat. He pushed himself to his feet again, this time putting most of his weight on his right leg, and looked around for the Inquisitor. Where he had run from was now a giant, burning crater in the earth, bright from the flames. Not ten paces away from the crater, Thankwell saw the Inquisitor. She was limping toward him, with eyes full of fury. The left side of her face was blackened and bloody. Her hair was all but gone burned away by the explosion. Her left ear was missing, nothing more than a bloody, burnt stump 
of flesh. Blood ran down her left arm and dripped onto the earth, soaking into the soil. She may have been caught in the blast, but Thankwell could tell she was far from finished, and the look in her eyes told him she was done playing with him. Thankwell raised his sword, ready to fight. The blade was spotted black from where the fire had engulfed it, and it looked near as battered as he did. His left leg still couldn't support his weight, but he couldn't risk ripping the button out. The Inquisitor's first attack seemed to jar Thankwell down to his very bones, and he fought to stay upright while blocking the next strike. Left to right, right to left, and over again. With every swing of the sword, the Inquisitor seemed to be getting stronger, despite her left arm hanging limp by her side. Thankwell stepped backward onto his bad leg and screamed in pain, just as the Inquisitor's sword shattered his own. He hit the ground, dropping the useless shard of metal that had been his sword, and started scrambling backward, still cradling his left arm against his chest. Inquisitor Heron advanced on him, her once beautiful face a charred, bloody ruin. Yet there was no pain in her eyes, only anger. It's over, Arbiter Darkheart! She slurred, the burnt side of her mouth twisting into a grimace. Thankwell had no choice. He snapped the chip of wood he had kept hidden, sewn into his trousers. The same rune he had stolen from the God Emperor of Sarth half a year ago. It was as likely to kill him as it was her, but at least neither of them would die alone. He could already feel the power building around him. Arbiter Darkheart looked at Inquisitor Heron and smiled. Mine is the judgment of the righteous, Inquisitor! Thangwell was rewarded with her eyes going wide with fear, just as the sky opened up and the light of judgment bathed him and everything around him in its cleansing fire. The light was so bright it blinded Thankwell even with his eyes closed. The fire so hot he could feel his flesh searing, burning, melting from his bones. Three voices screamed in pain out into the light. His, hers, and another, a voice with no traces of humanity. Thankwell could no longer tell if he was standing or lying down. Up and down no longer mattered. All was light and fire and pain as the judgment of the righteous burned away all the sins, all the heresy from his soul. Then it was over. The light was gone. The fire was gone. But the pain remained. His flesh was still burning. Thankwell pried his eyes open and let the bright spots of color clear. He was kneeling on the earth, his arms hanging limp by his sides, and his head slumped down against his chest. He could see the skin on his arms. His right hand was a blackened, bloody mess. But his left was fine. It wasn't burnt at all, despite the feeling still coursing through his flesh. He was so tired, he couldn't move. Truth was, Thankwell was certain he'd have passed out if it hadn't been for the sleepless charm still sealed to his left arm. He was so tired he couldn't even take pleasure in his survival. Part of him wanted to giggle. Part of him wanted to cry. All of him wanted to sleep. Someone laughed. A woman's voice, hoarse and raw and cackling. A horrible sound that sent a wave of despair through Thankwell. She shouldn't have been able to survive. He picked his head off his chest. Not two meters away, Inquisitor Heron knelt opposite him, her entire left side still a bloody burnt mess, her right arm raised into the sky, her sword held above her, black and smoking. She threw her head back, and laughed into the night sky. <laughs> the sword! She laughed. My sword! 
The merchant had said accurate up to ten paces, Thankwell remembered. How about point blank? He asked of no one, just as Inquisitor Heron's head rolled forward to look at him. Bang! Thankwell never saw the result of the shot. He saw Inquisitor Heron fall backward, or maybe it was just him falling backwards. He knew he hit the floor, and he knew he couldn't summon the energy to move anymore, and he knew he should be unconscious. But instead he just lay there, eyes closed, his mind awake but not aware. At some point he heard voices. He wasn't sure when. It might have been a few minutes, a few hours, days. He knew there were a lot of them, some hurried and some frantic, others slow and thoughtful. One sounded like it might belong to the Grand Inquisitor, but he couldn't be certain. What do we do with him? a voice asked. Is he still alive? I think so. Yes. Finish him off. It's what she'd have wanted. No. Sir? Take him back to the Inquisition. To the infirmary. He will be tried for his crimes. Sir. Thankwell thought he felt arms on him. He had this strange sense of moving, or being dragged or carried, but his mind refused to process any of it. There's something on his arm. What? I don't know. I'm not one of them. Take it off. But what if it... Chapter 59 The Arbiter Four guards escorted him from his cell to the council chambers. It would have seemed excessive, even had Thankwell been uninjured, unfettered, and armed. As it was, he had no doubt a single novice could take him down right now. Still, he supposed it helped them all to feel safer. He shuffled along, little more than a crawl with his hands and feet chained together, giving him a permanent stoop while standing. The guards around him were silent and unyielding, setting a slow pace, and he was glad of that. Any faster and they'd have to carry Thankwell to the council chambers. At least they were doing it discreetly. They could have just paraded him across the Inquisition compound for all to see. He had no doubt every Arbiter in Sarth would have come to see the traitor. Four days, they told him. Four days, he'd been unconscious. The medic, a grumpy old Arbiter with too much skin to his face and a permanent scowl, told Thankwell he was starting to doubt if he'd ever wake up. That hadn't stopped them chaining him to the bed, though. The old man had done his best to heal Thankwell's arm, but confided there was only so much could be done with a burn like that. It'll heal, most likely, given time. Assuming you have any. Doubt you'll ever have full movement again, though. Burns tend to scar. The old arbiter croaked at him. His right arm was swathed with bandages up to the elbow, and the bandages had been soaked in some sort of oil that made them feel greasy to the touch. Still, the hand hurt like every one of the hells, and Thankwell could feel the skin red and raw underneath whenever he tried to move a finger. It also didn't help that the guards insisted on chaining both his hands, despite the injury. The metal cuff rubbed against his wrist setting it on fire all over again. The guards would hear none of it, though. So he suffered in silence. Thankwell thought of Jezet and Thorn. Mainly of Jezet. No one had brought him any news on the status of Kessick or Kosh, so he had no idea whether the others had succeeded with their targets, no idea whether the others had even survived. He chose to believe they had, they would have met at the inn after the job was done, waited for Thankwell for a couple of days, realized he wasn't coming, and then they would have fled. Thorn would no doubt run back to the untamed wilds, and Jezet, Jezet would 
go with him. If they were lucky, they would already be on a ship sailing back to Chade. At least they wouldn't have to share in Thankwell's execution. The walk seemed longer than every time before. It might have been because of the crawling pace, or maybe because of the dread anticipation. Thankwell couldn't tell. When the doors to the council chambers loomed up in front of him, coming out of the darkness like the gates to a hell, he stumbled and very nearly fell. He would have if it weren't for one of the guards behind him, catching his arm and helping him upright. Thankwell turned to thank the Arbiter for the help, but the look on the man's face convinced him not to. There was hatred there, and he had little doubt as to why. Inquisitor Heron had been well-loved among the Inquisition, and Thankwell had left her an almost unidentifiable corpse. The fact that she was the heretic who was trying to bring down the entire Inquisition was not yet widely accepted, except by Thankwell himself. Two more arbiters stood guard this side of the door. They watched the prisoner and his escort with cold, hard eyes. Seems they were taking no chances of Thankwell escaping. No doubt, there would be more guards inside the chambers, along with the remaining eleven inquisitors. Rarely had anyone ever commanded such a powerful audience. The doors opened with an ominous boom, and the two guards stood aside to let Thankwell and his escort through. Both men were armed with short swords on their hips, and both men kept their hands on the hilts as he shuffled past. Do I really look so dangerous? Thankwell said. He rattled his chains for effect and winced as fresh searing pain shot through his burned arm. One of the guards, the taller one with the split lip, grinned at him. Inside, heretic. Your judgment awaits. Thankwell thought of a reply, but decided instead to keep silent. No sense in making matters any worse. Not that he was sure they could get any worse. Inside the council chambers, all was still and silent. None of the Inquisitors had gathered yet. No doubt they would make him wait a while. Any chance I could get these chains off? Thankwell asked his guard as they stopped him in the center of the chamber. Sorry, Thankwell, the flat-nosed guard said with a shake of his head. Don't talk to him, Gull. He's a dark heart. Thankwell chuckled. Don't worry. It's not contagious. The guard who had warned Gull looked about ready to backhand Thankwell, but the side door opened and the Inquisitors started to file in. Eleven of them, where there should have been twelve. Grand Inquisitor Vance strode in at the head of the column, his face as hard and stern as always. Even rock would yield before the Grand Inquisitor's stare. Then came Inquisitor Down, the last woman on the council for now. Her face was flat, and her eyes beady. Inquisitors Vert, Kanos, and Westrus entered, conversing with each other in quiet voices. None of the three even glanced toward Thankwell. Inquisitors Dale, Jane, Felon, and Aurelis took a different approach, each staring at him like it was going out of fashion. Last came Inquisitors Elswin and Marcus. They both glanced at Thankwell and dismissed his presence, as if the whole reason they were there was not to pass judgment on him. After all eleven Inquisitors had entered, Another man stepped through the door. Arbiter Heronis Vance seemed to glide through the portal, closing the door afterward. He stopped behind the twelfth chair, not sitting in it, but standing, waiting. He looked like a younger, softer version of his father, with a round face where the Grand Inquisitor's was all hard angles. It might have seemed strange once for an Arbiter to be included in this gathering. But Thankwell had no doubt Arbiter Heronis Vance would soon be Inquisitor Heronis Vance. There was a heavy silence once all the Inquisitors were seated. It was almost as if none of them wanted to be the first to speak, so they just stared at Thankwell, 
judging him with silent eyes. The way the lanterns in the room were angled meant Thankwell could barely see his betters, but they could see him clear as day. He rattled his chains a little. Could I get these taken off? They've been chafing the burn a bit. Silence. You can't be scared of me. Not all eleven of you. Thankwell bit his tongue to stop himself from saying more. Every time in this room, he had to find some way to mock those sat in judgment of him. Take them off, Arbiter Gull, boomed the Grand Inquisitor's voice. A few moments later and he was free. Thankwell stretched out his shoulders and marveled at the stiffness he felt. He looked down at his right hand to see blood showing through the bandage where the cuffs had been. The old arbiter in charge of the infirmary was not going to be pleased, assuming Thankwell walked out of this chamber alive. Only six months since you were last in front of us, Thankwell Darkheart. The voice was heavy and brutish. Inquisitor Aurelis. The fact that he missed off the title of Arbiter was not a good sign. A lot has happened in those six months, it would seem, Inquisitor, Thankwell responded. You killed Inquisitor Heron. She had it coming. Enough! The Grand Inquisitor didn't shout. His voice carried to all corners of the council chambers and could have silenced the ocean, such was the command of it. Arbiter Darkheart, you are here to account for your actions, which amount to heresy. You will tell us all that has happened, and you will be judged accordingly. Be warned, Arbiter, if you lie, it will mean your death. Thankwell nodded and launched into recounting everything that had happened. He started his tale in Chade, leaving out all mention of the Emperor or his orders. He told them of his interrogation of the woman in the jail, and that his tests to pertain what she was had been inconclusive. He told them of his freeing of Jesset Valern, and thus binding her to his service. He told them about how the woman in jail had escaped before the Chate Council allowed him to pass judgment, and how he went to Lord Sho's mansion in the hopes of obtaining more information from the council members, only to find two of them dead. He told them of his running into the Blackthorn, and how Thorn had given him a lead of the escaped woman being connected to Host. He told them of his journey through the wilds, and how he had enlisted the Blackthorn's help with a promise of pardon. He left out all mention of Thorn's crew, deeming that it could only serve to confuse matters. Thankwell told the Inquisitors of his arrival in Hostown, his meeting with Host, and everything the man had confessed. His involvement with an arbiter named Kessick, the fact that he was working for a female Inquisitor, that they were putting demons from the Void into the bodies of those with the potential. He also told the Inquisitors of Host's summoning of the Shades, and how they had set to the destruction of Hostown. Then Thankwell told them of his judging of Host and his execution. He left out the bit about killing the blooded lord with a spoon. He told the Inquisitors of his return to Sarth, how he kept Jezid in his service with the promise of gold. He left out the extent of their relationship. She was less likely to be hunted down for being paid to work for a heretic than if they knew she was sleeping with one. Thankwell told them how he had followed Kessick, and determined the Inquisitor was Selyse Heron, and that Arbiter Kosh had also been in league with her. He told them about how he had planned to ambush all three of them at once, of how he sent the Blackthorn after Kessick, Jezet after Kosh, and how he himself had gone after Inquisitor Heron. Then, he told them of what the Inquisitor had said to him, how she claimed the Inquisition was stagnant and her intent was to destroy it from the inside. Finally, when the Council of Inquisitors asked him if he had any proof, he told them what little he knew of Inquisitor Selyse Harron's contract with the Demons of the Void. 
The council members looked less than pleased to hear that the contract was hidden away where no one could ever get to it. By the end of his telling, Thankwell had lost count of how many lies he'd told. Most hadn't been blatant untruths, but more lies of omission, told to protect the others involved. But all were enough to see him killed, should the council have spotted them. He waited on fraying nerves, while the Inquisitors chewed over his story in their heads, some conversing with their fellows. His burnt arm hurt and itched at the same time, and Thankwell fought the urge to scratch at it. The cold scrutiny seemed to stretch on forever, and after a while, it was too much for Thankwell to bear. Could you tell me, what happened to Kosh and Keswick? What happened to those I sent after them? He asked the Inquisitors, and was ignored, save for a scathing glare from the Grand Inquisitor himself. More silence followed, complete with more itching and a slight shaking of his legs that convinced Thankwell he was far from recovered. It is convenient that this contract you speak of is unavailable for scrutiny, Inquisitor Jane said in a voice like silk dipped in honey. I'd call it inconvenient myself, Thankwell responded. But there is no proof one way or the other. Seeing as how you are likely to err on the side of judging me as a heretic, inconvenient. Ask me if I'm telling the truth. Use your compulsion, Inquisitor. The Grand Inquisitor leaned forward, piercing Thankwell with eyes as blue as the sea and twice as deep. I think we all know there are ways around the compulsion, Arbiter Darkheart. Thankwell found it hard to meet the Grand Inquisitor's gaze, but he held it all the same. I brought down and survived the judgment of the righteous. You stole a rune from the God Emperor's personal collection? Inquisitor Canos said in a dangerous tone. And by your own account, Inquisitor Heron also survived the judgment. Not conclusive proof either way. Thankwell opened his mouth to say more, but realized he was out of ideas. He had no way to prove his innocence, and they had no way to prove his guilt. On those grounds, they would judge him, and they would judge him harshly. You say this contract is held by the demons, in the void, Arbiter Vance said from behind the twelfth chair. Quiet, Arbiter Vance. You are here to observe only. Inquisitor Vert's voice rang with the accent of the Five Kingdoms. Let the Arbiter finish, Inquisitor Vert. This from Inquisitor Down. All eyes turned to the Grand Inquisitor. The man gave his son only the barest of nods. And so, Arbiter Vance continued. According to you, Inquisitor Harren ordered the demons not to release the contract to anyone save herself, and so the creatures cannot obey us without disobeying her. But there may be one who can overturn that order. The demons may be sworn to obey the Inquisition, but, more than us, they are sworn to obey Vulma. A murmur of voices echoed through the chambers. Arbiter Vance spoke over them all. The God Emperor can command the demons to release the contract. Assuming there is one, at least. It was so perfect. Thankwell almost laughed. The Inquisition had been the ones to find Emperor Francis, had been the ones to decree that he was Volmar reborn. If they chose not to go through with Arbiter Vance's suggestion here, they may as well admit that the Emperor was not who they claimed him to be. Then, if the demons did obey the God Emperor's order, it was proof he was Volmar. If they refused, it was proof he was not. 
Thankwell had asked the emperor whether he was Volmar reborn, and the man had avoided the question. But now... Now, Thankwell would find out for certain, just before he died. Grand Inquisitor Vance looked over to the two arbiters standing guard by the entrance, and spoke, his voice echoing around the room. Bring the Emperor here at once. It said something about Grand Inquisitor Vance's authority, that he could order the immediate presence of the Emperor of Sarth, and the man would obey. Thankwell found himself standing under the scrutiny of the Inquisitors for just less than an hour, before Emperor Francis strode through the doors in a white, silken suit, looking like a titan as he towered over everyone else around him. The man was close to eight feet tall and was as wide as a bear, yet handsome and resplendent as the sun. Thankwell felt short and drab and ugly in comparison as the emperor finished his entrance just a few strides away. Two servants attended the emperor, one Thankwell recognized, though the thin dusting of hair on his top lip had since bloomed into a small blonde ferret. Inquisitors, the god emperor said with a slight bow. Arbiter Vance, how may I be of service in this judgment? The man seemed to radiate power. Thankwell felt stronger just by being close to him. It was the Grand Inquisitor who answered. Arbiter Darkheart stands accused of heresy and of the murder of an Inquisitor. He claims there is proof that the Inquisitor Harren was the heretic, that he was protecting the Inquisition. That proof, however, is secreted away in the void, hidden by the demons that Volmar bound to our service. If this is true, only you can order the release of the contract, Emperor Francis. The God Emperor nodded along to the Grand Inquisitor's words, and then smiled. That may not be necessary, Inquisitors. Thankwell felt his heart lurch to a stop. He had lied to protect the Emperor. Even should the man reveal that Thankwell had been acting on his orders, it would still condemn him. The god emperor waved forward his servant with the bushy top lip, who laid the bundle he was carrying on the cold stone floor. I present to you all the sword of Inquisitor Harren. I had it taken from her estate on the night of her... death. Inquisitor Vance. I believe you may be the only one who can safely inspect the sword. The Grand Inquisitor's eyes narrowed to small slits in his face as he stood up and descended from the dais. He looked down at the bundle of cloth on the floor and then up toward the Emperor. I assure you, Inquisitor Vance, you alone can handle the sword unharmed. The Grand Inquisitor knelt and unwrapped the cloth to reveal the sword. It was Inquisitor Harren's for sure. Some of Thankwell's wounds began to ache at the mere sight of the serrated monstrosity. Slowly, Grand Inquisitor Vance reached out a hand and touched the hilt of the sword. His eyes went wide and his jaw clenched shut. Then he took his hand away and wrapped the blade back in the cloth. It is Miorso, the demon blade, he said. The council chambers erupted into formless noise, each inquisitor trying to be heard over the others, each demanding answers from the Grand Inquisitor and from the God Emperor. The story of the demon blade was well known. It dated from before the time of the Inquisition, from the time when Volmar had first walked in the world. As the tale went, Volmar had a brother, Arn. Arn was the first to seek to bind the demons of the void. He summoned a shade to attempt to study it, to learn its weaknesses, but the creature he summoned was too powerful to contain. So the younger brother went to the older, and Volmar, being the benevolent hero he was in all the stories of old, 
agreed to help. Volmar forged a blade of the blackest metal and enchanted it with old, powerful charms that were since lost to the world. The god and the demon from the void fought for one hundred days and one hundred nights before Volmar pierced the creature's heart with the blade. The demon's essence was sucked into the blade, and its body faded back into the void. Volmar named the sword Miorzo, the demon blade, and hid it somewhere it was said it could never be found. Some historians claimed that Volmar never had a brother, that it was the god himself who made the mistake of summoning a creature too powerful to control. To Thankwell's knowledge, such historians were usually tried for heresy soon after. Either way, it looked like Volmar's hiding place for the Demon Blade had not been as secure as he might have wished. The Grand Inquisitor looked a grim picture, standing tall and silent in the center of the maelstrom of noise. Some Inquisitors shouted, others looked almost panicked. The Grand Inquisitor himself was locked in a staring contest with the God Emperor of Sarth. Only one man in the world could win such a contest against a living god, and the Grand Inquisitor proved it was him. Emperor Francis was the first to look away. Enough! Grand Inquisitor Vance didn't shout to be heard over the cacophony. He didn't need to. As if the other Inquisitors had sensed his demand, they all fell silent. Gods, take Arbiter Darkheart back to his cell. Have his wounds looked at. It appears he is bleeding. Thankwell looked down at his hand. The bandage was beginning to look more red than white. The guards moved forward with cuffs and chains in hand. He won't be needing those anymore. This came from the God Emperor. The guards looked to the Grand Inquisitor, and the orders were confirmed with only the barest of nods. The silence held while Thankwell was escorted from the chambers. Once on the outside, he strained his ears to hear what was said, but the door boomed shut and blocked out all other noise. The guards led him back to his cell in silence. Chapter 60 The Blade Master Jezet woke, still huddled under the cloak that was little more than a large sheet of wool, still aching from sleeping sat upright in the cold, still surrounded by cold stone and cold iron bars. The jails in Sarth were little better than those in Chade. They supplied a bed for the prisoners, but Jez didn't trust it. Too easy to get comfortable on a bed, less likely to wake when they come for me. In the two weeks she had been prisoner here, others had come and gone. Some were little more than drunkards, sleeping off a belly fool in a bar fight. Others were true criminals on their way to the gallows. All of them were men, and all of them leered at her with hungry eyes. One had even tried to reach between the bars and steal her cloak to get a better look. She had broken his wrist with a practiced twist. Of course, after that, I had to put up with his crying and spitting insults for two days. The guards brought her food twice a day, though it wasn't up to much, sloppy, cold porridge in the mornings and hard, stale bread in the evenings, with a jug of water a day. Poor food was better than no food, though. They could just have let her starve to death. She'd had no visitors, no word of the outside world. No word of Thankwell or of Thorn. They had taken her sword from her, and with no clothing to speak of, she had nowhere to hide a knife. A blade master without a blade can still break a man's wrist. At first, she'd thought about trying to escape. If she could pick the lock, she could make a break for it. But security in Sarth was not near as lax as in Chade. There were guards outside the jail cells at all times. Even if she did make it out, without clothing she would draw attention to herself, and without a sword she couldn't fight her way free. Instead of thinking of escape, 
she filled her days with imagining why she was still languished in a cell, why they hadn't executed her yet. It must be because you killed an arbiter, Jez. The guards are waiting for the Inquisition to deal with you. Just, the bloody witch hunters seem to be taking their sweet time about it. Almost, she wished she had fought her way free back when she had killed Kosh. Ten men they had been, armed with spears. She could have taken them. She had known it then. They had known it then. Jezet had been on the verge of attacking when what she thought was better judgment had won out. She surrendered her sword and allowed them to take her prisoner. That was when she had gained her cloak. The guards decided it was better than marching a naked woman through the streets of Sarth. Still, they hadn't bothered to bring her any real clothing. So, naked she remained. Truth was, Jesset Velern was starting to wish she hadn't come to Sarth at all. In the wilds, she was free from the presence of Constance hunting her, and yet she chose to follow the Arbiter to Sarth on his foolish crusade to save the Inquisition. She heard the key in the door and the guard captain's voice. A fair man, that one, but not a nice man. Jezet had no wish to see the new prisoner. So, she huddled deeper into her corner, pulled the cloak around her, and closed her eyes, pretending to sleep. Her right hand inched toward where her sword should be. A blade master without a blade. Truth was, the lack of sword made her feel far more naked than the lack of clothing. In there, said the guard captain in his thick, brusque voice. You can go. I'll fetch you when I'm done. Jezet knew that voice. She heard the captain grumble and move away. Then she opened her eyes to find Arbiter Thankful Darkheart leaning on the bars to her cell with a faint smile on his face. This... Seems a familiar sight, the Arbiter teased. Jezet found herself grinning. Does it? She stood up and let her cloak fall to the floor, then approached the bars. You look... Thankwell started to say. Step inside. You can do more than just look. Thankwell gripped hold of the bars with his left hand, and his smile faded. Would that I could. Jezet noticed his right arm was bandaged and hung in a sling. His coat hung loose across his shoulders. A new coat, she noticed. It didn't have all the stains and tears of his old coat. Are you all right? She asked him. Me? Oh, the arm. I'm fine. Just the usual, really. Set myself on fire. Blew myself up. Jez couldn't tell if he was joking or not. What about... Uh, you're naked. Just noticed that, did you? Why... Because I fucked your friend the heretic before killing him. Jez shrugged. If Thankwell was here, he had heard the conditions of her capture from the guards. She would let him draw his own conclusions. The guards? They didn't... Rate me? Jezet laughed. Two of them tried. After I broke the ugly one's nose, the captain came in to see what all the noise was. He had both of them whipped for the attempt and even apologized to me. Mark of a civilized society, I reckon. Guards apologizing to the prisoners. Rape is treated severely here in Soth. Aye, so I hear. He didn't think giving me some clothing might help the matter, though. Jezet said with a grin. The Arbiter hadn't stopped staring at her body since he walked in. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. He shrugged out his coat and passed it through the bars with his left hand. Thank you, Jezet said as she slipped her arms through the coat and pulled it close. It was warm and more comfortable than she'd have guessed, and only a little bit on the large side. Did you deal with the Inquisitor? Thankwell nodded. Inquisitor Heron is dead, and I'm only a little worse for wear. The Inquisition kept me in a cell for two weeks, but the evidence they found against her was overwhelming. 
they were forced to let me go. Just like that? Thankwell smiled. Oh, no. They couldn't let me go without punishment. What I did was right, but apparently the way I did it was wrong. Though no one seems to be able to agree on how I should have done it. Punishment? Jezet was almost afraid to ask. The Council have decreed that I shall never be able to attain the rank of Inquisitor. The Arbiter laughed. Did you want to be one? An Inquisitor? He shook his head. My name precluded me from joining that select group long ago. They would never allow an Inquisitor Darkheart. Oh. Jezet didn't understand. What about Thorn? Thankwell shrugged. No sign of the Blackthorn or of Arbiter Kessick was found. I assume he went through with his promise to leave after killing the Arbiter. Jezet nodded. The Blackthorn would never have stuck around in Sarth. He was, no doubt, halfway back to the wilds by now. So, where are you going from here? She asked. The Dragon Empire. I've always wanted to see a dragon, and it seems the Emperor of Sarth still has further need of me. My ship sets sail tomorrow morning. The Screaming Gale. You should see the size of the cabin they've given me. The bed could easily sleep two people. Passage is expensive, though. Ten gold coins per person. Wouldn't mind seeing a dragon myself. Nor sleeping in a bed for two. So, how about you get me out of here? Thankwell winced, and the silence seemed to stretch on for hours. He couldn't meet her eyes. His gaze was locked on the bars. You are here to get me out, she asked without a smile. The Arbiter shook his head. I can't. You were seen committing murder on the streets of Sarth. Your case is a matter for the guard. The Inquisition has no authority. The man I murdered was an Arbiter! No, he wasn't. The Inquisition has claimed no knowledge of the man you murdered, because doing so would undermine their authority and their image. Just like that, Jez. Do a good deed, take the fall. She wasn't surprised, nor was she angry. A part of her had expected it, if she was honest. I'm sorry, Jez. She nodded and turned away from him. Last thing she wanted him to see was the disappointment on her face. So, why are you here, Arbiter? Because I owe you a debt. I couldn't get you the full amount, but fifty gold cods will have to do. The purse is in my coat, left inside pocket. You'll find it. Little good gold will do me in jail. I'll be damned if I'm giving the coat back until he asks. She heard him sigh. Ah, <sighs> funny thing about being an arbiter, he said. When you put on that coat, you become invisible. No one wants to look at you. No one wants to question you. It's like magic, in a way. Jezet waited. Waited for him to say more. Waited for him to ask for the coat back. Waited for him to... do something. After a few minutes of silence, she turned to find herself alone. The Arbiter had snuck out some time during the silence. Well? What the fuck did you expect, Jez? She sighed and leaned back against the bars, and stumbled as the door to the cell swung open. For a long moment, Jezet Velern stood there, frozen in shock and unsure of what to do. She fumbled at the buttons to the coat to make sure the thing stayed closed. Forty gold bits and only a few hours to spend them, Jez. First things first. A blade master without a blade. This has been The Heresy Within. 
The Ties That Bind Book 1 First Earth Saga Written by Rob J. Hayes Narrated by Jarrett Ross Copyright 2013-2017 by Rob J. Hayes Production Copyright by Rob J. Hayes